What's going on guys? It's your boy Scrub here back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day. I know I am and welcome back to day 12 of the 12 days of Scrubs. Hope you guys are all having a fantastic Christmas Eve. Happy holidays if you ain't a Christmaser. Either way, I just wanted to say thank you for taking time out of your day to watch this video. It is the longest video that I have ever uploaded to this channel. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. If you're hyped, I'd appreciate you taking a second to smack the like button let me know what you thought in the comment section down below but uh yeah on that note thank you guys all so much for the support on this series this year you guys are all absolute legends looking forward to telling stories in the new year as well but i will shut up and let you guys enjoy the videos now thank you a billion uh, i originally heard the beginning part of this story from my dad and ended up meeting franklin myself and all I can say about him is he's truthfully just one of those people that you can't believe really exists, like a real-life cartoon character. Maybe up on par with legendary status as, like, Bigfoot. Either way, I knew you guys would, uh, love the story time, so without further ado, let's get into it. One day when I was younger, I was in the car with my dad and I was like, hey, what's the weirdest person you've ever met? I didn't say like whether it had to be good, weird, bad, weird. I was just honestly really bored. Uh, so I figured I would talk to my dad. You know, you have to be bored if you want to start talking to your parents in the car. But sure enough, he thinks for a little bit and starts telling me the story about this dude he knew in school named Franklin. And Franklin was like the type of kid who was always in a little bit of trouble when he went to school with my dad. Not in a, you know, he made a flamethrower in the bathroom trouble type of way he wasn't destructive but like always in trouble because he just wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed and didn't think things through too well just you know you know when you have an idea and then you start thinking about the logistics of the idea and then you get to the end and you go I shouldn't do that it was almost as if he never really had that thought it never registered for him when he had a stupid idea instead of thinking it out and going hey that's a dumb idea I shouldn't do that he would just have the idea and immediately immediately start executing it, you know? Ah, I should go ahead and throw an enchilada at the lunch lady. He didn't think through, like, the lunch lady didn't do anything. He just threw the enchilada. Very little impulse control. Like, the last part of the equation never clicked. He was out here trying to do a complex algebra equation without PEMDAS. And I think one of the best examples of this is uh, one day in class, my dad is sitting there and it happened to be the class he has Franklin in. And Franklin was always known as a little bit of a weird kid. But regardless, it's the middle of the government class and Franklin just starts blurting out random things and interrupting the teacher. And the teacher is confused and asked him to repeat what he said because he had said it so like fast that nobody had understood it. It sounded like something about gonna get a gizzard. And so he slows down and Franklin asks the teacher if he wants to see a lizard. And the teacher is a little bit confused on what he's asking because it's not every day in the classroom. Someone's like, hey, do you want to see a lizard? And on top of it, it's a weird question. You always got to be careful if someone asks if you want to see a lizard out of nowhere. You got to be apprehensive. It could be a velociraptor or something. You don't want to have a, a bad direction. Jurassic Park situation where there's a raptor loose in the school. Anyways, Franklin asked again, this time a little bit slower, like, do you want to see a lizard? And reluctantly, the teacher says yes, because I don't think he really knew what to do in that situation. When somebody just stands up in the middle of the class and starts screaming about, do you want to see a lizard? And like, they're not going to drop it. It's probably easier to just let them do whatever they want to do than argue with them. Obviously, they're not in the most uh, logical state of mind to begin with. So he stands up and goes to the middle of the classroom and opens up his backpack and as soon as the backpack opens up they can tell that there's something in it you know you can't really tell but the noise kind of sounds like a, a rattling almost and he flips open the backpack and dumps it onto the ground and a whole rattlesnake drops out of this dude's backpack onto the floor I don't know how he had gotten it in the backpack, I don't know how it had stayed calm, but somehow he had kept this rattlesnake in his backpack until this government class and then had just decided to stand up and dump it onto the floor. And immediately as soon as it hits the ground it starts rattling because it's like, whoa, this morning I was trying to eat breakfast on a rock and now I'm in a classroom, this is weird. And half the class starts just freaking out. This is the late 70s, uh, early 80s in Vegas, so you know, half the people had never seen a snake before, they're freaking out, the other half of the kids like, 
like went out and hunted them on the weekends. So, you know, a lot of the kids weren't that afraid of it. Like my dad wasn't shaking in his boots. He had seen them before. But some kids are just absolutely losing it, acting like Medusa herself just dropped out of this backpack. Don't look in its eyes. You'll be frozen. And as the entire class is just freaking out, oh my God, it's a snake. Oh, what if it eats me? Just like losing their minds over the snake on the ground that's still confused and rattling. Franklin is just laughing at this situation, which listen, I'm sure it was funny, but I just don't really know what was possibly going through his head when he was doing this. Like, obviously, if he's laughing, he's enjoying the chaos. The teacher didn't seem to be freaking out too much either. It wasn't like he was Indiana Jones insanely afraid of snakes. But I just don't know what Franklin was thinking. Like, hey, okay, I've got a snake in my backpack. First of all, why you would ever want a snake in your backpack, I'm not sure. That's just one of those animals I don't want to be on my back. I'm really okay. But on top of that, to decide to just dump it out in the middle of the class, like, why? I just, I can't understand what he was thinking. My dad isn't really scared, and he looks at the teacher, who also isn't freaking out, and asks if he has a bucket. And it just so happened that their government teacher was the baseball coach, and so he had, like a bucket of baseballs in his classroom. So he dumps the baseballs out of this bucket onto the floor and he gives the bucket to my dad. And my dad goes over to like put the snake in the bucket. And I don't want anyone to think that my dad is some type of snake wrangler. He's not Steve Irwin. He wasn't out here charming the snake. I would love to pretend that he was some snake charmer controlling the snake like while playing the flute or something. My dad is, is not an insane nature guy. He wasn't shaking in his boots screaming because of the snake, but he also wasn't hyped about having to put a rattlesnake in the bucket but whatever he gets the snake into the bucket and that's what really matters cool points aside I, I know uh, it is my dad so I'm gonna be a little bit harder on him next time you got to do a whole snake charming routine either way he gets it in the bucket and the teacher of this entire time is still cool as a cucumber he was an older guy so I'm sure compared to like a snake in the classroom the stuff he's seen was uh, way worse gotta remember if he's like an old teacher in the 80s he probably grew up during the Great Depression back in my day we used to hunt rats for food because we didn't have any. He probably started, like, getting mouth-watering looking at the snake. That's mighty fine eating, boys! He tells my dad thanks, though, and then starts yelling at Franklin about how that was such a boneheaded move and somebody could have gotten hurt and da-da-da-da-da, the usual teacher speech that you've probably got to do when someone dumps a snake onto the ground. And not just any snake, but I feel like you've got to yell at them a little bit more when it's a poisonous snake. Like, a garden snake's pretty harmless. If they just release one of those in the class, Sure, it's scary. In theory, it could bite someone, but even if it did, it's more of just an ouchie go to the nurse. Dropping a whole poisonous snake in the middle of the classroom is pretty out there, so he's just getting screamed at. Probably should have gotten in a lot of trouble, but he basically only gets one day of detention the next day. Way back in the day, the school system was different, I guess. I'm pretty sure now you probably would be expelled if you ended up dumping a rattlesnake onto the ground. Like, probably would be considered a felony, but I guess better. Back then, it's just one day of detention. No wonder stories from way back then are so much crazier. Like, now you'd probably think twice before you sneak a snake into school because you don't want to get expelled, lose your college scholarship or whatever. Back then, one day of detention, eh, I'm gonna dump a rattlesnake on the ground to get out of this test. Seriously, imagine today if you snuck a rattlesnake in your backpack for a few hours at school, dumped it onto the floor, and then only got a day of detention. You would be flabbergasted. After that, though, he tells Franklin that he and my dad are going to have to release it after school, which doesn't seem insanely fair, even still, because here's my dad trying to help out by managing to get the rattlesnake in the bucket, and your thanks to him for putting the snake in the bucket is that he has to go help Franklin release the snake. It wasn't his idea to bring it to school. If anything, that's just, like, basically detention for my dad that he has to hang out with Franklin after class. And my dad was kind of pissed off about it, because obviously he had been trying trying to help with Operation Snake, and now he was uh, in charge of the operation that he never wanted to be in charge of in the first place. He didn't really want to go out in the desert with Franklin, but whatever, he was more afraid of pissing off the teacher than he was of Franklin, because it was just one of those teachers where he was fair, but if you pissed him off, it was basically World War III. So it was just a lot easier to go out in the desert, release the snake. Obviously, he wasn't too afraid of it. And Franklin didn't seem too bothered by it either. It wasn't like Franklin started freaking out, saying that he was 
was gonna bite my dad so if Franklin was okay with it it wasn't going to be that scary I think overall today it definitely would have been handled differently but it is what it is my dad was gonna have to release the snake with him and the rest of the day was fine all of my dad's friends if anything were a little bit excited because as I said Franklin had become a little bit of a meme-esque Bigfoot dude around the school legendary almost because nobody really understood what he was doing or why he acted the way he did it was just a, a mystery like the Bermuda Triangle of their school at the time so the fact that my dad was gonna spend some time hanging out with him and talk to him meant that they were probably gonna get some like pretty uh, unique information about it and so they were pretty excited to hang out with my dad a couple days later because they assumed they would get some funny stories out of it so after school comes and my dad goes back to his government class and he sees Franklin there and Franklin is holding the bucket, but he looks a little bit too excited to be holding the bucket with a snake in it. I don't really know if that makes sense. Like, I, I guess it would be cool to hold a bucket with a snake. But he's holding this thing with the enthusiasm of, like, a wall breaker from Clash of Clans. You know how they're holding that uh, bucket of explosives? And they just got the biggest smile, like, wow we I'm about to blow up some walls. And that's the way that he's holding on to this, uh, the bucket with the snake in it. Just envious. Like, this bucket has the greatest job ever because it gets to be the thing holding the snake so he'll take the second best option and be the guy holding the bucket holding the snake instead so whatever they're kind of talking for a little bit about where to drop off the snake and they agree to take it to the desert across from the school it was a pretty big expanse at the time it was actually government owned land across from the school so just a huge stretch of desert for miles and miles they assumed it'd be better to drop it off there it could go do whatever snakes do and stay out of the classroom if there's one thing we definitely don't want it's snakes becoming aware of the concept of education and being able to get smarter. You think we're uh, already going to have a hard enough time with aliens? Imagine if snakes started getting doctorates. That breakaway civilization would be horrifying. Come to find out, the rattlesnake has gained sentience while it's in the bucket. It listened to the history of government. I think that I can fix your problems. No, we don't want a snake government, all right? We already got enough lizard people in charge. One of these days, I'm gonna make too many jokes about crazy conspiracy theories and the CIA is gonna be like, he knows too much. I don't think lizard people are really in charge of the government, unless they are. They start walking out of the school, though, with the snake in the bucket, and Franklin asks my dad why he wasn't afraid of the snake when everybody else was. And so my dad kind of tells Franklin that he's caught snakes before, it's not really something that scares him because he's done it a couple times. And Franklin sighs and said, I didn't think about the fact that no one would be afraid of it and how it was pretty cool, I guess and didn't really expand anymore. My dad kind of picked up the vibe that he had been hoping to like really freak out the class and make everybody lose their minds, which he had kind of succeeded, but the only problem is when people live in a desert, they probably aren't that afraid of desert things, like some people will be, but especially at the time, it wasn't crazy uncommon to be able to just go out into the expanse of desert, find a snake, a rattlesnake, a, a scorpion, whatever it may be, and it just so happened that my dad was one of the people that would do that. And so they get across from the school into that large patch of desert that was perfect for dumping a snake and they start walking out into the desert and my dad starts to get a little nervous that uh maybe you know in his craziness Franklin was gonna disappear him I'm just saying if he's willing to sneak a snake into school he'd probably be willing to hide a body in the desert so he's kind of like watching his back not that he actually had anything to be worried about but at the time he's just kind of working himself up to be a little bit more scared because the vibe off Franklin was weird and they kind of start talking back and forth, and then out of nowhere, once they got a little further into the desert, Franklin just starts whispering everything. And my dad is kind of straining to listen to what he's saying, but he really can't hear anything, because he's literally whispering everything he says. Hey guys, it's Franklin. But you gotta remember, they're walking through the desert, so there's like the crunch of sand and rocks, and it's louder than his whisper. So finally, he says something to him, and he's like, hey man, why are you whispering? I can't hear you, what you're saying. And Franklin leans really, really close to my dad, like a little bit too close to my dad, and whispers something along the lines of like, don't you know that they're listening to us? And obviously, my dad doesn't know who they are that's listening to us. But he doesn't really want to fight with him, because who knows if this guy's starting to hear stuff. So, instead of calling him crazy off rip, he's just like, oh, who is they? Who's listening to us? And he's starting to get more nervous, because you don't want to be in the desert with a dude hearing voices that are telling him that people are spying on him. You know, it wouldn't be Franklin's fault. Like, obviously, no one wants to be in that situation. That being said, being out in the desert with someone starting to hear voices saying they're being spied on doesn't sound like a fun situation either. And so when my dad asks, well, who is they, Franklin starts to angrily rant, 
while whispering, which is just an interesting combination about how apparently the CIA had planted listening devices in the cactuses, except, like I said, angrily whispering. So, you know, the CIA has put whispering devices in the cactuses to make sure that they can hear our every move. And my dad is just kind of standing there absorbing this information, not really knowing how to react, what to say, what to do, as he's going off about how the CIA apparently puts microphones in every cactus to listen to the population. And trust me, I'm somebody that's aware of the fact the CIA's probably got some weird stuff going on. Maybe they have put a microphone in a cactus. It is the CIA. They do CIA things. But why? Why would they put microphones in every cactus? And even if they did put microphones in every cactus, why would they care about two random kids that are coming to release a rattlesnake? The CIA's on red alert, you know? <gasps> oh my gosh, these two kids have a rattlesnake in a bucket. Technically, we could consider this a chemical weapon. Should we take them out, sir? Obviously, I don't think the CIA has microphones in every cactus. And on top of that, even if they do, okay, I guess they can listen to me in the desert if they really want to. Franklin is still going off though about the government and he finally finishes and my dad doesn't know what to say so he just kind of says okay I didn't know that. All right, guys, we're about halfway through the video. If uh, you guys could do me a favor and press the like button if you're enjoying it so far, I'd appreciate it, and uh, I'll shut up. Enjoy. Keep in mind, this is the days before cell phones and everything, so he's way ahead of his time in terms of talking about the government spying on him. You know when Edward Snowden came out with the story about, like, the American government spying, Franklin was probably hyped. Yes, finally, I knew it. They've always been listening from the cactuses. He probably has a poster of him up on the wall. Oh, Edward, one day you'll be back. Everybody thinks he's a Twilight stan. No, 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 not uh, Edward and Bella, Edward, Snowden. It goes quiet for a little bit. They're both standing there awkwardly, and my dad finally suggests that this is the spot where they should release the snake, and Franklin says yes and takes the lid off the bucket and dumps the snake onto the ground. And they're kind of looking at the snake, and it's just kind of standing there, not moving, or not standing there. That would be terrifying, a snake just all the way standing up on its tail. No, thank you. You guys get what I'm saying. It's just doing what snakes do laying there and then Franklin starts hissing at the snake but in a pattern <laughs> almost like he's trying to talk to the snake and my dad asks him what are you doing because obviously it's a bizarre situation to see this dude hissing at a snake that's not moving but my dad asks why and Franklin looks at him and whispers that he's telling the snake to go away and at this point my dad's not even questioning him He's way ahead of his time. He was doing the Harry Potter talking to snake things before Harry Potter existed, but it's obvious that he's just so in his own world, there's no reason to question him, especially because he's still out in the desert with him. So after that, they end up going their separate ways. My dad goes home thoroughly confused about what had happened, but not really more afraid of Franklin. If anything, he just kind of respected him more. He was confused about what had happened, but had been kind of reassured that Franklin was a good dude, just was a little bit out there, had some weird ideas. And like I said, the best comparison would be Bigfoot, almost like a legend. You just can't believe the person is real, you can't believe the thing is real, and you gotta respect it even if it is a Bigfoot or a Franklin. Same vibe. After that, him and Franklin were pretty cool, but there were some other people in the school that, for whatever reason, decided that they were gonna mess with Franklin. Uh, it was one day in the lunchroom, my dad had just kind of witnessed this. He wasn't hanging out with Franklin directly, just watched it go down. Franklin had gotten his food and had been going over to sit down. And there was this huge wrestler dude that I guess had decided to mess with Franklin and he would come to regret it, but he had decided, oh, I'm gonna mess with this dude. What's he gonna do about it? He's way smaller than me. And so as Franklin's walking with his food to his lunch table, this huge dude just smacks the tray out of his hand onto the floor and it hits the ground like an artillery shell. And the wrestler guy starts laughing and asks him what he's gonna eat for lunch now which is just really messed up bro that's like the ultimate disrespect imagine you haven't eaten all day dude you finally get your lunch you're going to eat it someone smacks it out of your hand it would feel like someone just crushed your soul and then he says something along the lines of like look at this little Frankenstein freak what's he gonna do which I'm gonna give a zero out of ten his name's Franklin calling him Frankenstein isn't that good of an insult because it's just like really close to his name it's basically his name. 
oh, get it? Because Frankenstein's ugly. It's like, wow, bro, that's, that's sick. That's a really fly one. Anyways, he smacks his food out of his hand, calls him Frankenstein, and is like, what are you going to do about it? And I think the reason the guy was so confident that Franklin wasn't going to do anything about it is because this dude is like twice the size of Franklin. You know when, uh... In Super Smash Bros, Kirby can eat someone and then, like, absorb their powers. The dude is the size where it looks like he could possibly do that to a human. Eat them, absorb all their martial arts tactics. Maybe that's why he had become so good at being a bully. He's a very, very large dude. At least two Franklins. And, uh, obviously didn't think that Franklin was gonna do anything back. But after he calls him Frankenstein, Franklin decides to shove him. And he shoves him pretty hard, and the guy's a little bit in shock. Just due to his size, I'm sure he's not used to people standing up to him. But after he gets shoved, he decides he can't really let Franklin do that, so he goes to swing on him. And usually in these situations, I would love to say that he manages to dodge the punch, but Franklin doesn't get so lucky, and this huge dude just smacks the ever-living crap out of him. Like I said, double his size, the punch hits Franklin, and Franklin drops to the ground like a sack of potatoes. And everyone now that's watching this is like, man, Franklin just got knocked out, that sucks. But they were still gonna give him credit because he had stood up to a dude twice his size that was known for beating people up. Obviously, you gotta give credit where credit is due. But everyone just thinks it's over. Franklin got knocked out by the giant guy. And even if he had been knocked out, it's in a situation where you really can't be mad at him. He's basically fighting a brick wall. If you lose to a brick wall, it's because you can't win a fight against a wall. And as Franklin's on the ground, the wrestler guy turns around to start high-fiving his friends. Yo, dude, did you see the way I knocked out that dude that's way smaller than me? Wasn't that sick? But as he's turned around high-fiving his friends, Franklin pops back up like the Undertaker dude off the floor and starts going back over to the guy. And most people at this point would have backed down and you couldn't really blame him. He had already gotten knocked out to stand up for himself. There really was no need to go for round two. But sure enough, he goes back to the wrestler guy and starts attacking him. And I'm talking an attack straight out of an Animal Planet documentary narrator and all. Franklin channeled his inner honey badger to strike back with vengeance. The bully does his best to escape, but Franklin uses his claws to dig into him and prevent him from moving. And even though he's a lot smaller, the ferocity and anger with which he's fighting this dude, he is just straight up crushing this guy. But it makes sense. I mean, if Franklin is running around thinking the FBI is always listening, at some point you've got to start preparing for uh, karate or some type of martial art. If the CIA is listening from the cactuses, eventually they're going to kidnap you, so you just got to be ready to fight off a few secret agents. Either way, jokes aside, Franklin just puts the beat down on this dude who's twice his size. And the entire lunchroom is watching this go down. His friends aren't jumping in, probably because they're surprised at how, like, Franklin is fighting this dude. And finally, a group of teachers bursts through and pulls them apart. And they're pulling Franklin off of this guy because Franklin is still just, like, beating on him. And he starts screaming something to the effect of how he should have just let him eat. Which, hey, I mean, fair enough. Listen, obviously violence is never the answer. You should do everything to avoid a fight. But if you're in the lunchroom going to eat, someone smacks the tray, shoves you, and then hits you, yeah, you're allowed to get pissed off and go full honey badger mode on him. I can't really say that I blame Franklin for defending himself. And even then, it's funnier to be being pulled off the dude and being like, you should have just let me eat. I'm sure he's regretting it now. He just got not only beat up, but embarrassed by somebody half his size. If the dude was used to running around bullying the lunchroom, probably gonna see that that's a lot less effective when everyone knows you can be thwarted by a man that could, uh potentially be the size of an Oompa Loompa in the chocolate factory. And listen, like I said, violence isn't the answer. Sure, he really put the beat down on this guy, but he didn't swing first or start it. So Franklin's just trying to eat and do his thing. You start a fight with him. I'm gonna put that on you. Either way, the teachers drag everyone involved in the fight outside up to the office as the drill goes. We're gonna go have a serious talk in the office about how you guys behaved. If you can't do that in the real world, you shouldn't do it at school. 
Would you punch your boss in the face? It's like, I mean, listen, man, do you want the answer to can I punch my boss in the face or do I want to punch my boss in the face? Those are two different things. Either way, Franklin and the big dude get taken up to the principal's office to get their lecture about how immature and irresponsible they've been. And usually after a fight, the lunchroom would get a little bit chaotic. Oh, dude, did you see that? The way he went, bam, and then he went, boom, and then there was a punch in the face. Like, usually people would kind of talk about the fight in that way. But after this one, the entire lunchroom just had a silence kind of fall over it like a blanket. No one really knew what to say or what to do. They were basically just shocked. They had just watched the uh, school fight equivalent of like a possum fighting an alligator and somehow winning. Imagine you're just sitting out on the porch, you see a possum come out of nowhere and beat up a 10-foot alligator. You would be flabbergasted. You wouldn't know what to do or say. That's basically what they had just seen happen, but in human form. They both end up getting suspended, but by the time Franklin had gotten back to school from his suspension, his legend status had been elevated even more. It's not that they needed to exaggerate what had happened in the fight, but by the time Franklin comes back, people were saying that Franklin had basically done like a 720 no-scope ninja kick and knocked out the dude in, in a single shot and then had done like a, a cool break dance move on top of him, the original Fortnite dance. So his status as like a meme legend around the school is basically solidified. Being compared to Bigfoot, freshmen would be like, oh dude, that's the guy that took out the wrestler. And Franklin didn't really do a whole lot with it. He didn't care. He just wanted to do his thing. And for the most part, all he did with his newfound popularity and status was just be left alone. Before that, people like the wrestler dude would just kind of mess with him because they thought he was weird but after he had put the beat down on that guy they had just kind of decided to leave him alone which fair enough I would leave him alone too after someone goes full honey badger in the lunchroom there's only so much you can do to mess with them knowing full damn well that they're about to go honey badger on you and that was all the stories that my dad told me about Franklin and as you can tell I'm uh, a little bit of a big fan of it I think it's an entertaining story probably a cool dude but one day I'm at this department store with my dad I think we were shopping for something for my mom for like Mother's Day or something. It wasn't like I had really wanted to go to the store. One of those situations where you get dragged along. No, it'll just be a quick trip to the store. You're like, oh, sweet. This is going to be at least six and a half hours. Awesome. I, I'm just not feeling it. Outside's 120 degrees. My option is standing in a department store. Not a whole lot of uh, cool things going on. But I look up and I see this guy walk into the store who's just got an interesting outfit on. He's got like a full parka on. Like I said, it's the summertime, so it's 120 degrees outside. And he has a hat, but it's obvious that he has something under his hat that looks a little bit reflective. And so I'm looking, trying to figure out what it is. And I realize that this guy has like a skull cap of aluminum foil on under his hat. Like he had made an aluminum foil hat and then decided, no, I can't wear that out in public. People will think it's weird. And so he had put a regular hat over the top of the aluminum foil to try to camouflage it a bit. You know, make sure that nobody was aware of the fact that he was dodging the CIA mind reading rays. And so I'm kind of like, oh, that's funny. And so I tapped my dad on the shoulder and I pointed out being like, haha, look at this guy's wearing a tin foil hat. I had never really seen anyone do that before. And my dad eyes get all wide and he goes, huh, no way, do you know who that is? And I think he's messing with me. I'm like, oh, my dad's gonna pretend to know this dude because it's just some crazy conspiracy theorist guy, but whatever. I'm like, no, who is it? And he goes, that's Franklin. And immediately I'm like, oh, I gotta meet this guy, right? So I say Franklin and sure enough, tin foil guy looks over and he kind of stares at my dad for a second and then he says my dad's name and my dad says his name and they walk over to each other and they shake hands and he's like wow it's been so long when was the last time we talked high school and he said yeah and then Franklin said remember when we had to go take the rattlesnake in the bucket out into the desert and at this point, I'm literally like gobsmacked, jaw dropped, because I can't believe that this person is real. I had kind of thought my dad had kind of exaggerated the situation, just made it a good story. I wouldn't even be mad at him, because listen, a good story is a good story. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day as long as it's entertaining. But here I am, face to face with Franklin, confirming that the bucket rattlesnake story is A, true. And on top.
top of it, he's still wearing a tinfoil hat. So clearly still a very, very big fan of uh, cactus listening devices out in the desert. And they talk for a little bit and he starts mentioning how the government's listening to everything, blah, 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 which, hey, at this point, I, he was kind of right. We got cell phones. They don't need to put listening devices in the cactuses anymore. They've just got it in your pocket. But either way, they talked for a little bit, and then he said he had to get shopping and went on his way. But was, what was really surprising to me is the fact that, like, he's still just kind of being a perfectly normal human being who just also thinks the government is listening and wearing an aluminum foil hat. He was really eloquent, you know? He was in a department store shopping. He went about his business. He was very polite. Just had a tinfoil hat on and was rambling about how the government's always listening to everything. Very interesting dude. Uh, if anybody ever gets the chance, you see a guy wearing a tinfoil hat, just ask him, what's with the hat? They'll probably have a very entertaining, crazy reason. Either that or just avoid him. One of those two. I, I wouldn't pick a fight with them, though. They're probably crazy. Involves a Karen freaking out. Which is par for the course, but usually they're not freaking out 40,000 feet in the air. I feel like airplanes are by far the worst place to freak out. Because no one's really cool with someone freaking out on an airplane. It's just not the type of place you want to be goofing off and acting all crazy. The federal marshals are waiting for you on the ground. No, thank you, dude. You don't want to get Hannibal lectured and dragged through the airport with your arms all bundled up. Either way, the person who sent this to me saw someone go ballistic on a flight, so I thought it would be a fantastic video for y'all. And, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so the person who sent this to me was at the airport, and they noticed Karen even before they got on the plane, which is hard to do. I feel like when you're in an airport by a gate, it's just a bunch of people all looking at their phone. It's hard to stand out. But the reason that this Karen stood out so much is because she decided to, like, talk insanely loud in the airport, which is especially annoying. Look, if there's two places where it's kind of known, you kind of gotta, like, I don't know, not be insanely loud. It's an airport and a library. Those are the two places where it's just rude to take a phone call and start screaming into your phone. But for some reason, Karen decided that her phone call was more important than everyone else around her. And I'm not opposed to people taking calls in the airport. You have a business meeting or something, you have to take a call. I understand. I'm not going to fault anyone for taking the call. But what I will say is there's a certain way to talk into the phone when you're on the phone call, and it's not screaming out loud. But Karen apparently only had one voice, and it was loud because she takes this phone call and it was one of her friends and she starts telling her friend that she's at the airport and then she does something that lets everybody around her in the uh, boarding area know that she's a Karen. She starts talking about the other passengers that are going to be on the plane while on the phone. And let's just say she's not being very complimentary. She's not out here being like, oh my gosh, the family next to me is adorable. I hope they have a great vacation. She's not complimenting grandma's shoes. She's insulting people. For example, there was a lady sitting across from her who was wearing a uh, like a Hawaiian shirt and she said something along the lines of how she looked like a fat version of the guy from Magnum PI with his Hawaiian shirt on which is mad out of pocket to say period even if you're arguing with someone but she just said that completely unprompted while sitting across from the person out loud and somehow everybody at the gate manages to hold it together nobody interrupts her phone call and it only lasts a little bit longer but in that amount of time she probably insulted like five or six people sitting at the gate, but they're all being polite. Not thrilled, but also not trying to jump down her throat about the phone convo and start an argument in the airport. But after the call, I guess she wasn't done with being a Karen before the flight has even started, because her next move was to go over to, like, the gate attendant, the people in charge of seating and whatnot, and just start being rude to them about some flight information that they have no clue about. They're supposed to know most of it. I'm not gonna deny that. But she walks up to the person running the desk who's just trying to get people seated make moves check bags at the gate all that stuff and it's like when is the plane going to be here and they look at the board and they say well it's scheduled at this time so probably around then and instead of just being cool with that answer because that's the only answer i don't think the person at the gate is in control of the flight oh hold on ma'am let me call the pilot tell him to speed things up a little bit because someone's getting antsy at the gate they'll fly a little bit faster forget a safe landing they might as well just crash land it'll be a little bit quicker like I don't think they're in charge of that but they don't know but she starts yelling at him and is like and if it's not here at the time that it says on the board am I allowed to call corporate and complain about you lying to me 
And the person working the gate is just really confused and they're like, no, I mean, obviously it's subject to change. If there's a weather delay, if something happens on the flight, it's not guaranteed. That's just the closest estimate we can offer. And I don't understand what about that is complaint worthy. And she's just kind of like, well, whatever, it better be on time. Otherwise, I'm going to be filing a formal complaint about the way that you've handled this interaction. And now people are visibly rolling their eyes and whatnot because it's just like, oh, this is mad Karen mode. The person answered the question. It's not even like they didn't answer the question. It's not like they said, screw off, lady. I'm not going to tell you when the flight lands. They answered the question to their best of their ability. What you're asking them to do is impossible. Can you look into the future and guarantee that no delays happen at an airport? No, probably not. I don't know if you're aware of this, Karen, but airports tend to have delays from time to time. And it's not any of the workers' fault. Like, what would you like the guy at the gate to do? Run outside and start screaming at rain clouds if they appear? Stop raining! These people need to get home! And then the rain clouds are gonna be like, Oh, yet I didn't realize I was causing a delay at the airport. Uh, of, of course we'll go away. That's not how it works. Trust me, it would be way more convenient for everybody if that's how it works. But weather's gonna do what weathers are gonna do. And planes can only do what planes can do. Call me crazy, but I would rather be delayed at the airport than them strap me into a plane and send me into like a tornado. I don't want to be flying through a supercell category 5 storm because uh, somebody else just wanted to get home faster. Anyways, the Karen just returned to her seat and started texting furiously, probably texting someone about how unfair the people at the airport were being. And after about 20 more minutes of sitting there, the plane pulled up, they let everybody off, and then they announced that they had to clean the plane, which is something that they just have to do. Obviously, it's regulations out of their control. And you have to remember, getting mad at the workers doesn't do anything because even if they shouldn't clean the plane, which they probably just should in between groups of people, it's not their call. It's corporate's call. The Karen audibly lets out like a, Ugh, are you kidding me? You have to clean the plane too? And everyone kind of looks at her and she takes everybody's looks, not as like, uh, what are you yelling at them for? Please stop way, but as if everyone's supporting her. So she starts yelling at the gate attendant again. Look at all these people that are irritated with the processes here today. Like there's no reason we should have to wait while you clean the plane. And the attendant is still trying to be professional, which I don't understand why you would still be trying to be professional at this point, but they're trying. Well, we have to clean the plane. It's out of our hands. It's a federal aviation requirement. It's not something that we're just doing for fun. We're going to go as fast as we can, but there's no way for us to like shorten it. And after he explains it, a different older lady says something along the lines of like, it's okay. Thank you. We understand. Don't let her like give you a hard time for trying to do your job. Which was just the nice thing to do. It was obvious that the worker was getting a little bit flustered, as happens when someone's just yelling at you about things that are out of your control. I'm gonna try to get you fired because you have to clean the plane, even though you're not in charge of picking if you get to clean the planes or not. And why would you be mad that they're cleaning the plane? I just feel like that's a very weird thing to get angry at. Nah, I love to put my butt where another stranger's butt was for the last six hours. I love to get those fart gases up in there. Like, why would you want to not be on a clean plane. That's what I'm not getting. But whatever. Obviously, he's grateful to the lady that voices her support, but the Karen's not having any of it, and she just yells out, like, shut up, lady. And the lady doesn't reply, but everybody's like, hey, relax. And the Karen does relax, at least till everyone gets on board of the plane. But as you can tell, we're, what, eight minutes into this story time, and we still haven't even gotten on the plane yet? And before anyone's like, why did they let her fly? She's not being disruptive enough to be kicked out of the airport or arrested. She's just being annoying, and being annoying isn't illegal. Everybody starts getting on the plane, and that takes a little bit. If you've ever flown on a plane before, you know this is the worst part. You're just kind of herded like cattle down the little thing onto the plane. And everybody's sitting there waiting for the plane to start taxiing before they take off. And before they've even backed out of the gate, she's already hitting the, like, service button to get attention from the flight attendants. And she's pressing it, turning it off, pressing it, turning it off, pressing it, like, over and over again, just making it blink. And finally, a flight attendant sees and walks up and goes, Excuse me, ma'am, service hasn't started yet. We haven't even left the gate. We can't get anything out right now because everything's tucked away for takeoff. And instead of listening to that and thinking, Oh, okay, that makes sense. Obviously, they can't be pouring a drink while the plane's taking off because then they would be wearing the drink the Karen acts like this is the most inconvenient thing she's ever heard just oh 
Well, I want peanuts. Okay, let me get this straight. The flight attendant, the person that's flying all the time, says, I can't do that because there's a reason. It could be unsafe. I could spill something. We're about to take off. And your response is, oh, I want peanuts, as if that somehow overrates everything they just said. You, the person who wants peanuts, you have the priority over everything else. Forget safety, you know, forget logic. If she gets you peanuts, then she has to get everybody peanuts. You know, forget anything that makes sense. Just start complaining and getting angry about it. But the flight attendant isn't going to back down and they just say, no, not yet. Service hasn't started. But the Karen doubles down and screams something about like, well, I want peanuts now and the flight attendant says ma'am calm down if you're gonna keep yelling at me then you're not gonna be on the flight and that calms her down but because she calmed down I don't know if the flight attendant was like giving her a treat you know when a little kid is starting to behave better so their mom buys them Pokemon cards because she came back with peanuts and gave them to the lady and truthfully that was a mistake because that made Karen think that she could win on this plane she was like oh if I throw a fit they'll get me what I want but whatever she has her peanuts and she calms down for a little bit because the the flight attendant had threatened her a little. I don't know, getting kicked off the plane is a big threat, but you know, she wasn't being like mean about it, just saying if you keep yelling at me, you're getting off the flight. So she calmed down for a bit, the plane taxied off, and it takes off, and everything is all chill for the first hour or so of the flight. It was gonna be a long flight, basically across the country, a five, six hour flight. Pretty long time to be on a plane, and throughout the course of a five, six hour flight, there's going to be times where they turn on the fasten your seatbelt signs because there's gonna be turbulence or whatever and during that you can't go to the bathroom everybody kind of knows that rule if you really really have to go that's okay but for your safety it's probably best to keep it buckled when you're in insane turbulence because people are not made to be walking on airplanes being jostled around the air we're not even meant to be like in the air bro we got some human ingenuity to build these planes. We just strap 600 people in a big metal tube and throw it through the sky. I know there's a lot more to it and a lot of science, but I still am flabbergasted by the fact that like 30,000 years ago, human civilization is just getting started. And now we're flying. You want to talk about having good thumbs and good brain? That's it. That's the ticket to build plane. And as they're flying about an hour into the flight, the captain gets on the intercom and says, Hey, we're about to fly through a really, really rough patch of turbulence. It's going to be really bad. There's a, a cold pressure system and a hot pressure system, whatever causes turbulence. So please stay in your seat. This is not, you know, a suggestion. I would really recommend staying in your seat because it's going to be really bad. And I don't know if Karen heard that and it went in one ear out the other, not paying attention or maybe took it as a challenge how dare he say that I'm not going to be able to be running around this plane like spider-man while it's being insanely turbulent because as soon as the captain got off of the intercom, she decided right then would be a perfect time to go to the bathroom. And before she can get up to go to the bathroom, the turbulence starts, and it's really bad. The person who sent this to me apparently is flying all the time for work, and they said it was in the top three worst turbulences they've ever felt. The plane was just bumping up and down. So she knows that it's insanely turbulent, yet in Karen's mind, it's still a good idea to get up and go to the bathroom. And even if you're trying to prove something to the captain, screw you, I'll go to the bathroom when I want. The only issue with going to the bathroom when a plane is turbulent is it's bumping and jostling all around, and you're going to be on the toilet while being bumped and jostled around. And if you're jostled around at an unfortunate time, you're gonna be wearing a lot of what you were trying to put into the toilet, which is disgusting, but that's the reality. And she starts making her way to the bathroom, having to stop like every three rows of seats and hold on because it's so bumpy. And the flight attendants are in their chair and they say, ma'am, sit down. And she's like, I have to go to the bathroom. So she gets to the bathroom and goes in and the entire plane is sitting. And it's also pretty quiet because people are pretty scared of the turbulence. And that's how much it's rocking around. And the next thing that everybody hears is just thwomp, 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 after a big thing of turbulence and then screaming from the bathroom. What's going on? Which, I don't know if she's aware, but she's on an airplane, and from time to time, airplanes do the turbulence thing. But she is in the bathroom, and it sounds like she's being tossed around by the turbulence. That's the only thing that would ever make turbulence like this enjoyable. I don't really love flying. It, it kind of freaks me out, I'm not gonna lie. It's fascinating, and I'm proud of humans, but it does freak me out a little bit. Bad turbulence would scare me. I understand it's probably going to be okay. Planes do it all the time. I'm not gonna freak out. But what would 
definitely make it better is if the plane was in a bunch of turbulence and I just knew that some Karen was getting tossed around in the bathroom. Not because I hope that anything bad happens to the Karen, but how hilarious to just be sitting there and you hear someone going, What's happening? Around the toilet, dude. It'd be like watching somebody get tipped over in a porta potty. I'm not saying I'm glad somebody got tipped over in a porta potty, but I can enjoy the fact that that happened and it's kind of funny. If the porta potty is already tipped over and I didn't do it, what is not laughing going to do? They already got tipped over in the porta potty. Same type of vibe. If they choose to go into the bathroom and are getting tossed around, me not laughing isn't going to change the fact that it's still happening and I guess a lot of the plane had the same idea because the subscriber says a bunch of the planes started laughing and apparently the Karen heard them laughing from inside the bathroom because she starts yelling about how it was insanely rude for them to be laughing which I'm sure it didn't feel good to be being laughed at but you got to have a little bit of self-awareness like imagine if you were not in the situation and you were listening to the situation you would probably laugh it sucks because you're the one in the bathroom getting tossed around by the turbulence. No one wants to be in that position. I don't want to be in your shoes. But if you're not in that position, the situation itself is pretty funny. And the door opens and the Karen comes out and she's just got like wet spots on her shirt. And no one's really sure if it's water from the sink or if it's, you know... And she yells out something along the lines of like, I was washing my hands when the turbulence hit, which gives everybody a sigh of relief. It would not be fun to be trapped on a plane with somebody covered in whatever they were doing in the bathroom. That would definitely stink. It's an enclosed space. So I'm glad it was just water from washing her hands that had gotten all over her. But then she proceeds to start yelling at the plane that they were so inconsiderate and rude for laughing. And she had never seen such a lack of humanity from people before. And it was not funny. And they should all be ashamed of themselves. And obviously it's not nice to laugh at people in a bad situation. But it is funny. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not going to pretend that the situation of someone being stuck in an airplane bathroom while it's turbulent is not funny. If they were seriously hurt, I get it. It's not funny anymore. But if they're not hurt, they just got annoyed. Yeah, it is funny. And the plane is responding to the lecture by just booing. Like a couple people start booing and then more people join in. And eventually she realizes the booing isn't going to stop. And the flight attendants are saying, stop it. So everybody stops, she stops, she goes and sits down. But my goodness, you have to be pretty annoying for an entire plane to unite and start booing you. After all this turbulence, they were like, okay, we almost just died on this plane, but forget it, I'm still gonna boo you instead because you were more annoying than the turbulence ever could have been. You know how hard it is to get 600 strangers to agree on anything? Insanely difficult, and yet somehow you were that annoying. The Karen sits down and the flight attendant who she had kind of argued with earlier comes over and brings a ton of napkins and says, here, these are to help you dry off, which you can take as a petty side comment if you want to, but I don't know, it kind of seems like a jump to do that. I would much rather take it as a nice gesture of it would suck to be tossed around in a bathroom during turbulence, so I'm going to bring you napkins to help you dry off from how wet you got. I think it was nice. It was obvious the flight attendant was trying to be nice, but the Karen starts getting mad at the flight attendant being like, why are you bringing more attention to it? It's already embarrassing enough. I don't know why you would come over here and offer me that. And the flight attendant had gone over there and offered it pretty quietly. It wasn't like they came over the intercom. To the person sitting in 19D who just got tossed around in the bathroom of the plane. Would you like napkins? They just quietly walked over and handed it to him. If anything, screaming at the flight attendant for it was going to attract way more attention to it than just taking the napkins ever would have. But she starts screaming about how she doesn't understand why the flight attendant wants to bring attention to it or why they're trying to embarrass her. And the flight attendant is confused and is just like, all right, and walks away. And as they're walking away, the Karen stands up and starts yelling at them as they're walking away, which definitely is going to get everyone's attention because now you're just yelling down the length of the plane, saying that they were the most unprofessional flight attendant that they had ever experienced on an airline and they were so insanely disappointed with the service. 
And I guess the flight attendant had had enough because they turned around at that point and said that they had in all their years of flying and they had been doing it for 15 years, never seen someone have such a disregard for everyone else on the plane and also not listen to the basic rules. And then went off about how he had never seen anyone get tossed around a bathroom by turbulence because usually if the pilot warns them like that, they won't go to the bathroom. So it was all on her and that the flight attendant's so sorry for bringing napkins over to try to help them clean up that would never happen again. Obviously, they wanted to just sit for the rest of the five-hour flight soaking wet with apparently water from washing their hands. And the Karen finally is just gonna be quiet and sit down. She doesn't say anything back, nothing snarky, which is surprising. That's how you know you really defeated a Karen, is if they don't even reply, they just sit down. They're like, okay, I guess that was a fairly good point. And plus, by that point, she had been thoroughly embarrassed by everyone on the plane. Now everybody was aware of what was going on. Before, it was only the people really around her by the bathroom. But now that she had gotten into a screaming match with a flight attendant as they were walking down the plane, everyone was well aware of the fact that they had been tossed around the, ba around the bathroom. So she just kind of shut up and sat down for the rest of the plane ride, which is what most people should do on the plane. There's no reason to talk really loud on a plane, period. But especially after you get wrecked by a flight attendant, you might as well just sit down and enjoy the rest of the flight because nothing you say is going to look cool. Even if you start zinging the flight attendant back, everyone's going to be on their side because, you know, they're the flight attendant. And no one wants to hear you screaming at them. And if they're defending themselves, people are probably going to take their side. Maybe it's a little bit different. I think about it differently because I make videos like this. But I don't know. I would hope most people would not be on board with the person getting mad that someone brought them napkins after they got into an accident. Like, oh man, you're going to be mad at the person trying to help? That makes sense. And for the rest of the flight, everything was pretty peaceful. And the subscriber thought that it was done. There's no way she's going to do something else. She had made a fuss at the gate. She had made a fuss on the plane. Both times kind of been told to shut up. But then they landed. And I guess the Karen was sitting there plotting the entire time on how she thought she was going to get the last word. How dare this flight attendant try to help me and then get mad when I yelled at them for trying to help me. They should have just taken getting screamed at for trying to be a nice person. I can't stand when people try to help me with things. It's the absolute worst. Because they land and everybody starts getting all their luggage. And Karen stands up in her seat because they're waiting for like the door to open and says, Excuse me, can I have the plane's attention? And everybody looks, even the flight attendants, and the flight attendant doesn't interrupt her or anything. Probably a matter of, no, no, I, I want to see where this goes. Let's see where this goes. And starts ranting about how she's never had a worse flying experience, never had such unprofessional flight attendants. She would never fly with this airline again. She'd be voting with her wallet, and she hoped everyone else on this flight did the same. And someone from like two rows behind said, who are you and why would I care? Which is a fair question. Why? Why would I care that you're never gonna fly on this airline and you thought it was the worst flight ever? If I didn't think it was the worst flight ever, no offense, but I don't really care what you think. And she starts saying that it's rude to interrupt people and they shouldn't have said anything and the reason they should care is because she's a fellow customer like them. And someone from like 15 rows forward at that point goes, shut up! And people start laughing and she turns and says, who said that? And obviously the person's not going to jump up and be like, it was me. And now it's shifted from just the pilot and the crew suck to, oh my goodness, all of you are so selfish. I didn't realize that I got on a plane with people that would be okay with another customer having a bad experience. I don't know why they would care about your bad experience. If they were okay with the flight and you weren't, why would they just be like, you know what? I am pissed. I wasn't pissed, but now I am. This random person who I've never met is upset, so now I am too. And that's when the ultimate GG hammer drops. This is making a pretty loud commotion, and I don't know if a flight attendant had cued her in. Cued him in. Cued her in. Sorry. Because all that was heard was the sound of the intercom happening and the pilot saying, Excuse me, I'm aware that we have a disturbance at the back of the plane. I would like to remind everybody that no one cares. Please sit down until you can be bored. A lot of the plane laughed, and I think finally it clicked that Karen was not going to get the last word. It didn't 
ha matter how many times she stood up and said, Attention! Attention! People were not going to just sit there and listen to her rant about how much it sucked. Even the pilot. I don't know if he could hear it. I, I don't know how soundproof a cockpit is. I'm not a pilot. But the fact that one of the flight attendants would cue him in and tell him to come on the intercom and say something is pretty funny. I don't know. A lot of people are like, Wow, that's so unprofessional! Alright, whatever, man. You're lame. Look who has no fun. Look who has no fun. If you're not on board with pilots coming on the intercom and embarrassing Karens when they're acting out of control, you are a no fun person. I feel like uh, airline employees are getting a lot more power. I don't know if it's been fixed, but for a while they had a huge worker shortage. I'm sure with a worker shortage, you can kind of do a lot more of what you want to do when a customer's being a jerk, because what are they going to do? Fire you during a shortage? Uh, your employee told me that I was being ridiculous and my demand was undoable. Okay, ma'am, what was your demand? I wanted the giraffe on the plane. Well, that is ridiculous and undoable. I'm glad we're finally getting out of this idea that, like, the customer is always right. That's always been a stupid slogan. But finally, you're allowed to be like, nah, you're not allowed to scream at me because, I don't know, you just feel like yelling at me and had a bad day. You can finally say that. For a while, it was like, nope, you just have to sit there and get screamed at. It is what it is. Let everybody take their anger out on you, employee. Either way, as soon as this story time got sent into me, I knew I had to turn it into a video. I don't know how the Karen had the confidence to keep trying it. After, like, being shut down the third time, you think she would finally be like, ah, all right, I'm not winning this one. Nope, she thought she had the comeback skills of the Patriots versus the Atlanta Falcons. Never forget that they blew a 28-3 lead in the Super Bowl. Sorry if you're a Falcons fan, I just have to remind you every now and then. The person who sent this to me had just graduated college, and there was a town that they had spent a lot of time in when they were young on vacations and stuff and it happened to have a pretty popping industry for what they had majored in so they wanted to move down there try to get a job because it had always been a dream of theirs so they started looking for an apartment on Craigslist and listen I'm not saying that Craigslist is always gonna end up being a horrible roommate if that's where you look but I am saying that it's the year 2022 and anyone that is using Craigslist to still find roommates is gonna have themselves a bad time I feel like Craigslist at this point is known for like either buying stuff 10 minutes away from you or horrible things. Those are the two things that it's known for. I don't know why you would take the gamble and roll the dice on a Craigslist roommate, but whatever, this person decided to do it and they said they regret it now. That's all you gotta know about that. So they met the person who they were rooming in with once before they moved in and everything seemed normal enough so they decided to move in. And once they moved in for the first couple weeks, everything was normal. Their roommate was a little bit of a dorkier guy, didn't go out a whole lot, spent most of his time alone playing video games. I can't judge anyone for that, because that's kind of what I do. Imagine if I came out here and was like, oh, this dude played video games? Cringe. But for the most part, the roommate situation was pretty alright. But one night, a couple weeks after this guy had moved in, they were chilling, watching TV, and they were watching something that was like, I don't know, not controversial, like a football game. And out of nowhere, the roommate looks at the subscriber who sent this to me and goes, how do you feel about the fact that lizard people run the government? And obviously that catches the subscriber off guard because it's not every day you're just like watching sports and someone casually admits that they think lizard people run the government and what your opinion is on it. So he's just kind of like, I don't know, I don't really feel like lizard people run the government. And that was the first time he knew his roommate was a little bit out there, because he proceeded to talk for the next three hours about how all of the people in charge of the world are secretly lizards, and how, you know, obviously they're lizards because you can see them blink sideways sometimes on TV. Just like the weirdest, most out there conspiracy theories of all time. And the person who sent this to me is just sitting there smiling going yeah uh-huh because when someone reveals they're crazy the last thing you want to do is be the person to call them crazy so he's just like oh okay he ends up going to his room and he makes a note to himself in his head that uh my roommate's a little bit out there and i should probably just avoid having situations where i have to talk to him in the future and that i guess made the roommate feel like he was cool with the roommate having all these crazy conspiracy theories and stuff and maybe acting a little bit different because it was almost like like after that conversation
situation, his guard was let down and he just started letting the full force of his weirdness and full effect come out. He would come home and his roommate would be sitting in the middle of the living room with all the lights off, rocking back and forth in the fetal position, talking about how the lizards were listening. And, you know, whenever the roommate would come home, he would just look up at him and go, oh, hey, man, and get up like nothing was happening, which made it even weirder. Either way, it's creepy, right? Like, imagine you come home to your roommate in the fetal position, rocking back and forth. But the fact that he would be able to get up and act completely normal when he came home made him more uncomfortable because it was like, dude, what is happening? Are you just rocking back and forth for nine hours a day until I get back? One day, though, things were a little different. The subscriber comes home and his roommate is doing the thing where he's just sitting there in the dark. But this time when he looks at him, instead of being like, oh, hey, bro, what's up? Going back to normal, he looks at him and he says, I found all of the listening devices. And, uh, you know, there were no listening devices, so the roommate gets a little confused and he's like, all right, what do you mean you found listening devices? And the crazy conspiracy theorist guy goes, look on the ground. And at that point, the subscriber looks down and all on the ground around him, the entire living room floor is covered in forks, all the forks that they had had. When he had first moved in, he had uh, obviously asked the guy if it was cool if he used his silverware and whatnot, and the guy had said yeah, and he had had four drawers full of just forks, which is weird, but it's even more weird that he had had all these drawers full of the forks just to eventually find out that they're the listening devices. And so the subscriber trying to calm him down goes, hey, I don't think those are listening devices. Those are just forks. You have a lot of forks. If they're all listening devices, then how'd they get him in here? And he starts to get upset with him. And he's like, those are not forks. They're multi-pointed alien listening devices. Which, multi-pointed, technically the truth, alien listening device, I don't know about that. Even if it was an alien listening device, why would they put three drawers full of them in your house? Obviously, it's not a conspiracy theory. Like, we all know aliens don't use forks as listening devices. They probably don't use listening devices at all. They're just aliens. They're smarter than us. But let's roll with them here. They put 900 listening devices in your house, but they just put all of them in the kitchen. It doesn't seem like that much of an advanced smart species at that point. It seems like they have horrible ideas. But uh, either way, he's very insistent that all of these forks on the ground are indeed alien listening devices. And the subscriber is like, all right, dude, I get that you think they're alien listening devices, but I need forks to eat. It's not like I can eat everything with a spoon. And the roommate in his infinite wisdom had obviously already thought about that. Come on, you don't find a bunch of listening devices in your house and not come up with the backup plan. So what he said is that they were no longer allowed to use these forks. He had to throw them away because they're listening devices, but they could use plastic ones. And then he like tapped next to him and there was a box that the subscriber hadn't seen that was full of a bunch of plastic forks, which is horrible for the environment, might I add. But the roommate then goes around the room, grabs up all these forks, just a big handful of them, and he starts walking to the kitchen and there were so many forks on the floor that he had tried to pick up that as he's walking to the kitchen all you're hearing is like ching 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 forks falling hitting the tile but he goes over to the trash can and the next sound the subscriber hears is just all of the forks going into the trash and at that point he was too tired from work to actually have the argument there were plastic forks he was gonna eat later so he decided his best course of action would probably to go to his room just because here was this guy thinking that all the forks were listening devices. I probably wouldn't want to be around that very long either. So just go to your room and figure out what the next move was. So he gets to his room and he's a little bit confused because he's like, most people probably don't have to deal with this. It's not every day that you come home to your roommate throwing away most of the silverware in the house because he's convinced that it's a listening device. But I guess this is my problem. And so he starts texting one of his friends being like, man, I don't know what to do. Like, this is insane. I don't know how much longer I can live with this it's just too crazy and he hears a knock on his door and he goes who is it and his roommate opens the door and says hey i just wanted to let you know that um i think the aliens are going to come take me tonight 
And he's like, dude, what do you mean? Like, the aliens are not going to come take you. There's no way that's going to happen. But his roommate is pretty insistent. He says, the lizard people are mad at me, so the aliens are going to come save me from the lizard people. And then he, like, leaves. He closes the door. And so the subscriber is insanely confused. Imagine somebody just coming and knocking on your door. Hey, man, the aliens are going to kidnap me tonight. You're like, what aliens? You know, the sworn enemies of the lizard people that run the government. You'd be like, uh. Uh, yeah, okay, good luck with that. But whatever, he kind of brushes it off and forgets about it because his roommate is going to be there the next morning. All right, guys, I'm going to interrupt the video for one second. On screen now is a gift card code. I give one of these away in every video, so subscribe and turn on notifications. Otherwise, I will have to fight you. And uh, let's get back to the video. Well, he wakes up the next morning and he goes out and he's immediately shocked because all of his roommate's stuff is gone. The couch, the kitchen table, all of the silverware, everything from all the cabinets and left. Last night, it was all still there. So he kind of starts to freak out a little bit like, bro, did this guy get taken by aliens? This is insane. All of this stuff is gone. And he's kind of freaking out because even if the guy had moved out in the middle of the night, that would A, be weird. And B, how did he manage to get all the stuff out by himself in the middle of the night without waking anyone up or making noise? So he's freaking out, but he decides the best course of action would be to go to the apartment office and ask if they knew anything. Because if the guy's just gone missing, he doesn't know what to do, so he decides to go down there. And he had never been to the apartment office before. When he had met the dude on Craigslist, he had just sublet a room in the apartment. So he didn't really have to do a whole lot with the main office. That was that guy's job. So he goes in there and he says, hey, I'm subletting a room in apartment, da 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 All my roommate's stuff is gone. Did he move out or something? I'm not sure what's going on. And they like start looking it up at the computer and then they look at him really confused and they go, wait, 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 what unit was it? So he says the number and they go, well, that can't be right because that unit is vacant. And then he's like, no, it's not. Here's the key. So one of them goes with him. They open the door. They see it. They're like, holy crap, this one's supposed to have been empty. And that's when they realize the roommate he's been living with that's obsessed with like the lizard people and he's going to get kidnapped by aliens had just been squatting in this apartment. He was renting a room from a squatter. And if you don't know what a squatter is, it's someone that just goes into a building and starts living there. They're not a legal tenant. They're not actually supposed to be living there. He had just found an empty apartment and moved in and then posted on Craigslist that there was a room for rent. So the apartment staff is like, how long have you been living here? He's like, a, a month, weeks. And they start looking around and the staff is flabbergasted because when an apartment is vacant, it's not supposed to have like internet power, any of that stuff. Somehow, Lizard Conspiracy Man had like managed to get power into it. He had daisy chained and DIY'd the power box to work. He had gotten the water to work. Everything was working, which is also why the subscriber had never thought anything was weird. You know, if someone's squatting, you'd assume things would be obvious. Certain stuff wouldn't work. People would come knock on the door and whatnot. But the guy had been good at it, even to the point where he would talk to the neighbors and whatnot, and they thought that he was renting. They had no clue it was supposed to have been vacant either. So the apartment team is like, we have to figure this out. This is supposed to be vacant, so you can't stay here. So the subscriber has to, like, get a bag full of his stuff. He gets in a hotel room for a few days. And after a while, the apartment staff calls him and they're like, we have no clue who the guy who was living in that apartment was. He wasn't supposed to be in there. It was supposed to be empty. But since you say you were subletting from him off Craigslist, we'll rent you the apartment. And the subscriber who sent this to me responds and is like, listen, as flattering as that is for the offer, I'm not really down to do that because the last thing I want is the guy that apparently is getting kidnapped by aliens to show back up. The dude didn't have an issue breaking into places because he had been squatting there for a while, so I probably wouldn't want to stay either. Just some guy you know is borderline unstable talking about how the governments are colluding against him because they're all secretly lizards. He disappears one day, moved out in the middle of the night. You go talk to the office, you find out he was never supposed to be there in the first place. No thank you, I'm not gonna stay there. And he had had keys for the door and everything. Like, this guy was a professional apartment squatter. So they say that that's all right. That's fine. They understand. So he goes and gets the rest of his stuff. He hadn't been able to grab all of it. And he moves into a different apartment. And he thinks that's the end of it. He thinks that's all good. The guy has still been missing. Nobody knows where he is. 
It's not like they were exceptionally close. He didn't have his find my location or anything like that. But still, the guy straight up vanishes. Obviously not taken by aliens, but just decided to leave in the middle of the night with all of his stuff. Probably knew they were about to catch on to the squatting. Maybe the apartment was getting rented out soon or something like that. So he just knew that he had to get out of there. But he was gone. When one day the subscriber wakes up and he has a message on Facebook and he clicks it because who uses Facebook anymore and the request is from the guy. And the request just says, hey man, I left some stuff there. Do you happen to have it? So he replies to him and lets him know, look, I know you were squatting. You sublet the apartment. I had to move out like it was an entire thing that why did you do that? Like squatting's illegal. Just kind of letting him know that the guy had really screwed him over and affected him. And all the guy replied with was, yeah, that's what happens when the lizards are after you. He had just deluded himself into thinking squatting was something that he had to do because the secret government of the world was after him or something. And at that point, the subscriber just decided to give him the old block, which uh, was the best maneuver. If someone's crazy and saying all this stuff, it's probably best to just block them and not get involved. About this guy who uh, apparently just loved to act tough in his school, just being a little bit over the top when it comes to saying he could beat everybody up and he's smarter than everybody. I know you guys love this, but the real kicker is apparently his dad's in the CIA, so watch out, you know? We all might be on a watch list somewhere for making fun of this guy. Either way, I just thought it would be a uh, pretty funny story time, so yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so uh, first things first, this kid was just one of those people that loves to act tough, you know, like, oh, I can take on anyone in a fight, but he was delusional. He would actually try to convince people that if a team of Navy SEALs were to break into his house, he would be able to take them, which, listen, man, I'm not saying that Navy SEALs are real superheroes, but like, as far as what they do, they're as close to superhero as superhero gets. I think there's a reason that we can send a team of like six of them somewhere and they're like, yeah, no, we, we got everything done. We're the Navy SEALs. Keep in mind this dude's in school, so the odds of him taking on every Navy SEAL is slim to none. But one of the weirdest things that he would do is, like, try to spy on people in his class. And, uh, obviously that's already a little bit weird. I think if anyone, like, realized someone was trying to spy on them, they would be a little bit uncomfortable. But this guy would be really, really annoying about it. Like, for example, if you were talking to somebody at recess you didn't normally talk to, he would come up to you at lunch and, like, ask you why you were talking to them. Then if you didn't answer, he would be like, why are you getting so defensive? I don't know, probably because I didn't realize there was some dude watching everyone that I was talking to all the time. Maybe that's why I'm getting a little bit defensive. I'm just not too comfortable with the whole being watched thing. Either way, he would just try to spy on people, but he was really bad at it. Like, for example, if you were uh, in the library and you were trying to talk to somebody about something, he would get within, like, two feet of you, which is so close to the point you can just tell someone's overhearing what you're saying. And he would just, like, look at a book and flip through the pages, which, listen, might be some good cover if you're across the room, you're looking like you're reading the book, but it was almost like someone had told him, reading a book is a good way to make sure you're not not paying attention or make it look like you're not paying attention. But unless this dude was like an insane professional speed reader, there's no way he would be reading that fast. Because he would be trying to spy on somebody, flipping through the pages like he had, a, I don't know, something wrong with his wrist where it was just constantly doing that motion. Like seriously would fly through pages, which also made sound he was doing it so fast. So whoever he was trying to spy on would look over and just see this kid furiously speed reading and be like, hey man, can we help you? And whenever someone would ask him, what are you doing when he would do this weird thing? thing in the library, he would just immediately be like, I'm not spying on you. And you'd be like, all right, I just asked what you're doing. Kind of weird to bur blah, blurt that out. Sorry, dude. I don't know. My brain stopped working there. You know, like some guys sitting next to you. Hey man, what's up? I'm not spying on you. You're like, okay, uh, I didn't think you were, but now yeah, I know you're definitely spying on me. Just a weird reaction to do. And obviously he would be trying to overhear the conversation because why else would you go stand like two feet away from people and loudly flip through a book? And that wasn't the only time he would try to spy on people and just do it very, very poorly. They had this like thing for reading on their classroom computers that was this like a website that would have articles on it written for kids. And then like the kids could write articles. It was this thing that they had at their school, right? And uh, everybody had a password and everybody had like, you know, 
you know, their login for it. And so he would try to like get people to give over the login information, which listen, um, people do it all the time. You know, it's like phishing. I guess it's possible. But the guy just would do it in the dumbest way possible. For example, like one of the reset questions that you would have to reset your password. Everybody had the same one. And it was like, you know, what was the first street you lived on? And what was your first pet's name? Something along those lines. And he would walk up to somebody and ask like two questions to them. Oh, how is your day? Did you do your homework? What street do you live on? Which, if you've never had a conversation with someone before and they just start walking up and asking security questions, it's a little obvious. Hello, fellow stranger. I believe that we have never met. If you could please provide me with your mother's maiden name and your date of birth, I would greatly appreciate it. It is for a survey. For surveying. Like, I, it's pretty obvious when someone's doing that. And when they would not answer, he would sometimes just get so obvious about it that he would just try to convince them to give him the password. Hey man, what's your password? I want to see if mine is stronger than it. Which, listen, if anyone falls for that one, they just kind of deserve to have their account hacked into and be spied on. I'm not saying anyone would deserve it, but if somebody says, hey, can you tell me your password so I can make sure mine is as strong, and you give them your password, you might just be one of the stupidest people of all time. Oh yeah, no problem, man. Mine is I love socks 86 What's yours? Uh, my password is password. Like, I, I just feel like if someone answers that question, they're dumb. And everybody would get very annoyed with it because it wasn't like he was just always trying to spy on people, was bad at it, and would just shut up beyond that. He was always telling people that he was, like, very talented at getting information, you know. He was just a next-level spy. He was basically gonna get recruited by the CIA straight out of high school. You know, just real I'm-going-to-be-a-big-tough-James-Bond guy type of stuff. And considering how bad he was at spying, I think if he even tried to go to the CIA, they would be like, no, they would be doing the prerequisite questioning. I don't know how the CIA picks spies. I'm guessing they make you do a questionnaire before they just start training you. Are you good at espionage? He's like, yes, I'll have you know, I've asked 8,000 people what their passwords are and one person has told me. Just like something like that that just makes no sense. Whatever though, he just got really annoying with it and there was another kid in the class who uh, was never trying to spy on people but was just one of those kids that everybody knew was one of the smarter kids in the class. And one day, the spy kid tries to get this guy's password and he's not having any of it and he straight up asks the guy, do you really think that one day someone's gonna be stupid enough to give you that information? Which, listen, is that a little bit aggressive? Yeah, but at the same time, if someone's trying to get you to tell them your password, you're probably justified in being like, hey man, that's stupid. Do you ever think anyone's gonna fall for that? But whatever, the kid who's spying gets very upset and starts yelling at him saying he has no idea who he's messing with and he has no idea what training this kid has been through. And listen, dude, even if your dad is some secret CAI agent, CIA agent, whatever, I said that weird, I don't think that you just miraculously have training. Like, I don't think Agent Cody Banks is real life. The spy Spy Kids was not a documentary. This guy probably thinks that Spy Kids was based on a true story. You know that second one where they have like all the monsters on the island? He just thinks somewhere there's actually an evil scientist who has a bunch of people with magnets on their heads flying around. The thumb people are just at the bottom of the ocean in Atlantis. I don't think that's reality, but whatever. He starts telling this kid that he has all this training and he doesn't want to mess with him because he has no idea who he'd be messing with. And listen, bro, it just doesn't matter how, like, much you swear you have super cool training. If this guy was trained by the CIA and was still this bad at spying, then I'm losing all faith in our government. No wonder they can't do a coup right. Every time they try to overthrow a government, they get caught. It's probably because they're trying to recruit, like, 8th graders to the spy network. All right, sir, we're gonna go try to destabilize Peru. You guys go for it. Take the crack team of ninth graders. Like, I mean, come on. The CIA is good at destabilizing countries. I don't want to insult them. I'm so sorry, CIA agent outside my house. Sorry, I had to save myself. I wasn't trying to wake up with a bag over my head being told I'm being taken somewhere for insulting the CIA. Either way, the kid who had started arguing with him about how he's not a very good spy and he doesn't know what he's doing got fed up with it and said something along the lines of like, if your training is so good, then you should have no problem beating me up after school then, which is just a good way of saying like, we're gonna fight after school. And I'm not saying that that was the smartest decision that he would ever make, but I think it was a little bit of him like calling his bluff. I don't know. I'm not that guy. I can't know what he's thinking. But I mean, if you think about it from a strategic perspective, 
the guy can't really back down because apparently he's a secret CIA agent who's got all this training. And on top of it, if he doesn't instantly like 720 no scope karate kick you and pinch your shoulder where you pass out instantly, it's going to be really obvious he's not an agent. And listen, it's obvious he's not an agent. Spoiler alert, the CIA doesn't recruit children that I know of, but it's a pretty good way to A, make him look dumb because he either has to back down, at which point what spy would be backing down from this situation, or B, he makes himself look stupid. Either way, it's kind of a W. And the spy kid, being the spy kid, is like, you know, I'm not going to fight you because my hands are registered as lethal weapons, so if I fight you, I could get in trouble. But you should stop threatening me and don't you dare try to fight me because if you try to fight me, then I'll tell the CIA and they'll arrest your entire family. Which, once again, don't know if that's how it works. Like, hey man, um, this guy threatened to fight me. Can we just kidnap his whole family? I think that's more of a North Korea thing where they put people in prison for like the next three generations. Yeah, your great uncle insulted Kim Jong-un once, so uh, your grandkid's going to be in prison. I don't think that's how it works here. Once again, not in the CIA, I wouldn't really know. But I'm just saying that like, oh, don't threaten me because I will call the CIA and they'll arrest you. Also, I can't fight you because my hands are lethal weapons. Very convenient, but the smart kids have none of it. He's like, no, bro, I'm just saying, if you're some tough spy, you should be able to show me up no problem. But the kid is just not letting it go. He's like, I'm going to tell the CIA, and you're going to get in trouble. And now, the kid that started this argument with him changes his tactic. Instead of trying to fight the CIA guy, he just starts calling his bluff that he can tell the CIA. Go ahead, tell them. Like, what are they going to do? Show up at my house? And the kid's like, yeah, they will show up at your house, actually. And so, uh, whatever. Finally, they drop it, and he says, I'm fighting you after school. Like, we're fighting. Everyone's had enough of this CIA agent crap. It's going down. And immediately, people start talking about it. They're like, finally, we're gonna see this kid after getting into a fight. He's been trying to spy on everybody. Everyone had kind of wanted to punch the dude in the face at some point. It was just now somebody was actually being like, nope, it's going down. Well, apparently, when the spy kid said that he was going to tell the CIA, what he really meant was that he was going in to uh, tell the teacher. Basically, just snitch. I don't know if in his mind it was codenamed Kids Next Door and all the teachers were like secretly CIA agents or something. But he snitches, and everybody knows he snitches, because when they get back to class, the teacher is like, All right, guys, no fighting. Calls out the kid who wanted to fight him by name and says, I don't know who you want to fight, but it's not acceptable. And everybody is like, Bro, you told the teacher? Are you serious? Mr. CIA agent was so afraid that he told? And he's like, I didn't tell the teacher. The CIA told the teacher. I just told the CIA. Yeah, that's definitely how it works. The CIA has a main line into every class classroom. Uh, you can't let our agent's cover be blown. Uh, make sure that this fight doesn't happen. I don't know. If the CIA was going to get involved, I don't think they would just tell the teacher not to make it happen. But whatever. He was kind of like implying that the CIA had gotten involved because this guy wanted to fight him. And the guy's not backing down. He says, I don't care that the teacher told me not to do it. I don't care that you told the CIA. I'm fighting you after school. And the CIA kid is freaking out. He's like, oh my goodness, dude, I don't know what to do. And after school that day, they see him sprinting across the parking lot to his mom's car to avoid having to walk past them. So that's the length of what he's willing to go to to avoid the fight, right? And after that, the smart kid kind of had proved his point. Obviously, he's not a CIA agent. Everybody would make fun of him for backing out of the fight. So whatever, it had kind of gone away. Everyone had just kind of known it was bullcrap after that day because he literally ran away. I don't know if that's what the CIA teaches people. They're like, all right, CIA agents run as fast as you can. Everyone was disappointed the fight didn't happen, but it did serve the purpose of like, okay, the guy clearly is not a CIA agent and he's going to tell the teacher on anything you do. But then came the day where he actually ended up getting into a lot of trouble because he wouldn't drop the CIA thing. And up to this point, he had just kept it between like him and the students, really, which, whatever, annoying, but there's nothing they can really do. However, the time it went too far was when he decided to use the whole my dad is in the CIA thing for his teacher as well. Anyways, one day, he just decides that he's going to sneak out of class. And uh, I don't know if sneaking out of a classroom is even something a real spy could do. Because, I mean, think Think about it. Like, the teacher is standing at the front of the room looking at everyone, and you have to get up and walk out of the door 
while the teacher is looking your direction. I mean, maybe it's possible if you got like some Halo active cloak or whatever. I don't know what secret gadgets they're handing out to the spies these days. But I'm just saying, the odds of being able to like sneak out of a classroom seem pretty low. Unless your teacher is got the worst nearsighted vision of all time and everything's just kind of a blob from 10 feet out. I don't know how you're going to just stand up and walk out without getting noticed. But sure enough, he gets out of his chair and starts doing like this tiptoe slow movement thing. I don't know if he thought teachers were like T-Rexes where their sight was based on movement. Maybe he had watched a little bit too much Jurassic Park, got that mixed up with his James Bond. But he's moving really slowly and obviously the teacher is like, what are you doing? Because it's obvious that he's walking towards the door. And the kid just stops in his tracks. He just stops moving and freezes. And I don't know if he thought that the teacher was just going to be so confused by why he stood still, he would just drop the entire subject. I don't know if he thought that standing still would make him seem less guilty, but he's standing there just not replying. So the teacher asks him again, what are you doing? And he goes, me? And points at himself. And the teacher is like, yeah, you. Who else should they be talking to, man? What are you doing? Do you see anyone else out of their chair doing anything else? No. Me? What, what, what am I doing? Goodness gracious, I'm only standing still in the middle of class for some reason. Why would you think I'm up to anything? But the teacher is like, yes, you. And he says that he has a very important mission that he has to take care of. And he has to go gather intel on the office for such and such for blah, blah, blah. And the teacher is kind of like, what in the world are you talking about? Because I don't think if he was a spy, which we all know he's not, why would they assign you to go spy on the principal? Like, I, I feel like the CIA probably knows everything about anyone that they want to know. I don't think they would be like, wow, I sure am glad we trained this child to be a agent. Now he can go spy on his principal for us. But all right, whatever. And the teacher is like, no, you can't leave. You don't have a mission. What are you talking about? And you would think maybe it would register in this kid's mind that, oh, this is a teacher and I can't really commit to the whole my dad's a CIA agent and so am I thing, but he starts yelling at the teacher saying that she is uh, obstructing a national security investigation and if she does this, she's responsible for whatever the bad guys do next. And the teacher is just looking at him like he's crazy. Because imagine you're a teacher in this situation. You've got like, uh, I don't know, 900 students in a day. Well, how many ever students teachers have? And all of a sudden, one of them is yelling at you that he's a CIA agent. And if you don't let him leave the class and go spy on the principal, you're responsible for whatever the bad guys do. Like, <laughs> what? You would just be thinking that this kid has to be on something, right? Like, okay, little Timmy, how much rat poison did you accidentally eat last night? Something's going on that doesn't make sense. And the teacher is kind of telling him that I don't really care what national security, and she does air quotes, is on the line. You don't get to just get up and leave class whenever you feel like it. I have to run my classroom like a classroom. And if everyone's just getting up and leaving all willy nilly, that kind of defeats the purpose. I would have no control over the class. Which is fair. I don't think she should have even tried to reason with them. She should have just been like, dude, you're not a CIA agent. And even if you were, it doesn't mean you can just get out of everything. Sit down. But she's trying to reason with him. And uh, you'd think he would respect that a little bit. Like, okay, thank you for at least not telling me I'm insanely delusional. You can pretend that anything he's saying about being a CIA agent makes sense. And then he's like, if you don't let me go, the CIA is going to kidnap you and take you to a black site. Which, if you don't know where those are, they, uh, is basically a location where the CIA takes you when they want to do a little bit of interrogation that maybe might not be legal uh, on U.S. soil. Maybe a little bit of waterboarding and we're not talking surfing. So the teacher is like, what? Did you just threaten me? And the kid says, yeah, my dad's a CIA agent. I have to help him. You need to let me go now. And the teacher's having none of that. And she's like, you're not going to threaten me. I don't care what your dad is. You're not an agent, even if your dad is, and I don't believe you. And the kid's like, what do you mean you don't believe me? My dad's a CIA agent. I can do whatever you want. And she says, I would stop saying your dad's a CIA agent or I'm going to have to embarrass you. And at this point, if I was the kid, I would just shut up. Because I feel like when an adult says, don't say anything or I'm going to embarrass you, like, it's just going to happen. I wouldn't really want to take those chances. But whatever, he says something about how, like, you would have no clue what my dad can do, so you don't know anything, shut up. And the teacher just looks at him and says, I know your dad is a mailman, shut up. 
and everybody is like, oh my god, losing their mind, you know? Everybody had wanted to tell this kid to shut up, and here was the teacher confirming that not only is dad not a CIA agent, but he's a mailman. No disrespect to mailmans. I love getting the mail. Thank you so much for bringing it to my house. I appreciate it. But it's definitely not a CIA agent, and it's definitely not any job that gives you permission to just start running around the school willy-nilly spying on people. No, you don't understand. I have to wiretap the principal. My dad works for the post office. Doesn't really have the same ring to it. Well, the kid tries to double down on the story, which, all right, maybe he's in too deep at this point. He's like, look, I just have to commit. There's nothing else I can do. That's a possibility. But he starts trying to argue with the teacher, being like, no, that's just his cover. That's the job that he says he has. He's actually a CIA agent, but he can't tell you that because he's undercover. And the teacher looks at him and she's like, okay, so you're telling me that your dad is actually a CIA agent, but he's using mailman as his cover because he's on a secret assignment. And the kid very confidently is like, yeah, 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 that's it. He thinks this one's gonna work, all right? Now everyone's gonna think he's a CIA agent. The teacher's gonna back off. This was the greatest thing that he's ever come up with. And the teacher goes, are you sure that's the story you wanna go with? And the kid says, yes. And so the teacher points out, well, if he's on a secret assignment and he's supposed to be undercover, why did you just tell the entire class about your dad's secret identity? And the kid is standing there stammering. And obviously neither him or his dad is a CIA agent. Not that his dad said he was, but he's just kind of like, uh, 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 because that's kind of a good point. I'm pretty sure when they assign, like, secret missions, one of the things that they make sure to tell you is, keep it a secret. The CIA likes to do secret things. I don't think you get through training without being able to keep a secret. And he's stammering, and he's like, well, um, um, and everybody's just kind of laughing at this point, because, uh, if you are a spy, you're a horrible one. No, my dad's a secret agent, we're on a secret mission, and this is secret, it's classified, no one knows about it. Turns around, realize he's been sitting on the intercom button, like, almost comical levels of exposing yourself here. And he doesn't know what to say, so he just doubles down and yells at the teacher, well, I have a mission to do, and it's of the the utmost importance to national security so you can't stop me I have to get out of this classroom you got me my dad's not in the CIA but that's my cover is that he's using the mailman cover for the CIA which at this point we've got covers on top of covers on top of covers with secret stories and there's still a CIA kid for some reason and everybody is starting to laugh even more and he's getting pissed because it's obvious that no one's believing it and the teacher says it doesn't matter how many Many times you try to change your story, you're not allowed to just leave the class. And he's getting very angry, and finally he just looks at everyone in the class laughing at him, he looks at the teacher, and he says, screw you, opens the door and just runs out. And now everybody is just laughing out loud because the way he said screw you, his voice just happened to crack when he did it. Unfortunate timing, dude. We've all been there every time my voice cracks in a video. Oh, nice voice crack. Every time, every time in the comments. But if you're gonna be like, screw you, it's just definitely not gonna go over well, dude. Everyone's gonna be laughing at you. But he runs out and the teacher goes to look out the door just to kind of see where he's running. I don't know, like uh, just see what's happening. And when they open the door, a few of the kids look out and they start laughing even harder. Listen, if you are some type of secret agent, one of the things I'm sure they make you do a lot of is like endurance training, you know, conditioning. If you're gonna be spying and saving the world, you gotta be able to run for a bit. I don't think uh, lazy agents is something they got on deck. Well, apparently the CIA school of teaching kids how to run had really messed with this dude's because he's doing like, I don't even know how to explain it. Imagine somebody had taken a backpack, put it way too low on their back, and then tried to run while it's like bouncing on them, but he's just not wearing a backpack. He's just kind of running really weird, like he's uncomfortable, and everyone's laughing. And he turns around and sees the door open and sees a few kids. And he yells something about how, like, he's off to save the country and they can thank him when they watch the news later or whatever, and storms off. And the teacher has to call the office at that point and it explains the situation. And listening to the teacher explain it to the office was hilarious because she's like, yeah, I have a kid who apparently thinks he's in the CIA. Uh, apparently his dad is too. When I told him he couldn't leave class to go do his mission, he got very angry 
angry at me, started screaming at me, and then ran out of the class. But when he was running, it looked like he had something wrong with his leg. So I'm not quite sure what's going on, but just so you know, there is a crazy kid running around the campus. And of course, they start looking for him. They find him. He does not come back to the class that day. He gets taken to the office. They call in his dad, who is a mailman. uh, And obviously, no one really knows what went down in the meeting. But what we do know is that when he comes back to school after a little suspension, he did not get rid of the CIA story. So apparently, whatever they told him in the office didn't have enough going on for him to not pretend to be a spy anymore. But everybody in class started calling him James, like, you know, James Bond, which, listen, it's kind of... Kind of funny. Like, listen, sure, would I love to be uh, nicknamed after something as embarrassing as this? No. But if you're gonna stick to the CIA story, you ran out of the class to go save the country or whatever, people are gonna call you James Bond, you just gotta deal with it. As for the news later that day, there was nothing about some super spy saving the world and then running back to 8th grade geometry or whatever, so uh, I'm not quite sure what he meant by that, not sure what his mission was, but he ended up changing schools the year after that because his family moved states. Probably another CIA reassignment, all right? You know, there's no way that he was uh, moving for any other reason. Realistically, his dad probably just wanted to go be a mailman in a different town. And I don't want anyone to get it twisted and think I'm dunking on mailmen. It's like a very respectable job. Someone's got to do it. You get paid well, good benefits. It's just not a CIA agent. They're a little bit different. Who would have thunk it? And today I have a story time that's definitely uh, different than anything I've ever had sent in to me before. Apparently this guy's neighborhood was being terrorized by a group of kids on bicycles who would act like pirates and rob everybody else. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know how you get that idea. Watching a little bit too much Pirates of the Caribbean or something. Oh, if we just pretend to be Jack Sparrow, we can rob everyone. And he always gets away with it, so we will too. Either way, I just thought it was a uh, pretty crazy story time that you guys would enjoy. So without further ado, let's hop right into it, grab some popcorn, and let's go. All right, so the person who sent this in to me is uh, a lot older now, but at the time was probably around like 10 years old. And he had just moved into this new neighborhood that he thought was really cool because... It was one of those neighborhoods where people's yards are like kind of big, like an acre or two acre lots. So you still have like friends in the neighborhood you can play with, but you can also still have a tree house and some woods in your backyard. And he thought it was sick, but what he didn't know is that there was a group of kids in the neighborhood who really sucked. And he found out about it while riding his bike one day. He had like a cheap MP3 player his parents had bought him with like just some cheap headphones. You know, one that can hold like 15 songs. And he was riding around on his bike and he comes around the corner and he sees like four kids on bikes with some wooden swords and like a few of them are wearing eye patches and bandanas and he just thinks to himself, oh, these kids are playing pirate. And so he goes to ride past them, but he rides past them and he instantly gets this weird feeling and he turns around and he sees them following him. And so he turns down his music, but like doesn't let them know that. He doesn't take his uh, headphones out, which was pretty quick thinking, I'll be honest. And he kind of hears them talking about how they're going to take his iPod, they're going to take it from him, blah, 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 blah. So he starts riding his bike even faster, and they start riding faster and start yelling at him to stop. So he starts trying to get back to his house, but they had been here a lot longer than he was. So they take a little shortcut through the woods, cut him off, and one of them walks right up to him and smacks him with this wooden pirate sword right on the back. And it hurts, man. Like, listen, even if someone hits you with a Nerf sword really, really hard, it's not a very pleasant feeling. I'm not saying it's gonna, like, permanently injure you, but you can bruise someone with one of those very easy. Getting smacked with a piece of wood definitely doesn't feel good, and so it kind of knocks him off his bike, and they're all standing over him, and they're like, give us your iPod, give us your iPod. And he's like, it's not an iPod, it's not an iPod, it's an MP3 player. And they're like, oh, that's garbage, give it to us. So he hands it over, because he doesn't want to get smacked again. And instead of taking it, they just put it on the ground and use a different one of their wooden swords to smash it. And he's like, what is wrong with you guys? And they're like, we know you're new here, but anything that you have of value, like, we're probably going to take it, you know, we're the pirates of the cul-de-sac, like, don't mess with us, blah, 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 blah. And the kid is like, what? Fine. Like, what is your guys' issue i won't mess with you guys but like what in the world and they're like yeah we've been doing this forever and if you tell your parents we're gonna have even bigger problems like we'll make your whole family's life suck and he's like dude you guys are nuts 
but clearly they're committed to being nuts considering they're just roaming around smacking people they don't know with wooden swords just to take things from them and break them. So whatever, he goes home and he just doesn't really tell his parents, which is dumb. I'm letting everyone know right now, uh, if someone smacks you with a wooden sword, you should tell someone. Because, like, I don't know why you would keep that a secret, man. Someone's got to nip that in the bud. That just seems like a pretty dangerous situation. Just a roaming gang of pirates on bikes smacking people with wooden swords. Like, it, someone needs to call someone to make sure that this doesn't keep happening. Because this is psychotic. All the kids just live in fear. They're, like, so afraid to take their new skateboard out. You know, their parents. Why aren't you using your new skateboard, son? Uh, well, uh, uh, is something going on? No, no. But whatever, he doesn't tell his parents and he goes up to his room and he's like dude what should I do and he had an older brother who was like 14 at the time so like four years older than him and so he goes to him and he kind of tells him the situation and is like what should I do and his brother says well you got to do something about it which you know you should tell someone I don't think you should necessarily go all Batman vigilante mode but his brother goes I'm gonna give you something to help you like do something about it and he says okay and his brother was a little bit older, so his parents had decided he was mature enough to have an airsoft gun. And so it was just like a, a little, little like, a, a, I don't know, AR looking airsoft gun with a battery in it that could like shoot. And airsoft guns hurt, but you can't really do damage unless you like hit someone in the eye with it or something. And he goes, if they give you any trouble, just shoot them with this. And he's like, oh yeah, your airsoft gun's so awesome. Because his brother, being his older brother, had like shot him with it before, so he knew how much it hurts. And he's like, yeah, they won't be able to rob me now. And one of the best parts about this house that they had moved into is that the family that had lived there before them had raised a bunch of kids. So there was like tree houses and zip lines and all this stuff. And one of them kind of overlooked the road. And so his plan was to go up there and yell at them that they needed to give him money for a new MP3 player. And like, he wasn't even going to tell them that he had the airsoft gun. And if they tried to like rush him or attack him or anything then he would use it because he didn't want to have to do it he was like maybe if i just stand up for myself they'll respect me you know like he had seen enough movies about it so whatever he climbs up in the tree house and sure enough about 15 minutes later he hears some yelling and pedaling and he thinks it's the pirate gang coming to like uh, ride their bikes by but what he sees is a kid way smaller than him like gotta be you know six seven years old pedaling as fast as he can away from the pirate gang and they're gaining on him pretty easily because they're just a lot older than him. And eventually they come and they kind of run him off the road, like right underneath this guy's treehouse. The stars just align. And they walk up to this kid that they're at least twice as old as. And they start like hitting him with the wooden swords. And the kid's like, ow, stop, stop. And at that point, the kid is like, well, I can't go down there and do anything about it because there's so many of them, but I can just uh, open up the airsoft gun, I guess. So he like sticks it out and yells at them to stop. And they're like, no. So he starts shooting the airsoft gun and they're all like, ow, ow, ow. And they're running. And uh, he didn't really check to see how many pellets were in the little like magazine thing for the airsoft gun before he started. And there was only about like 20 pellets in there, so it runs out pretty quick. And obviously at that point, they're like, we're gonna come get you for that. If you're gonna shoot someone with an airsoft gun, they're not gonna be thrilled about it. Like, let's be honest, chances are if you do something like this guy did, the pirates are going to come and try to like raid your treehouse. But at least they're not like focused on the, the little kid anymore, so they start walking over to the treehouse and starting to climb up the ladder. And so he starts looking around the treehouse and all he has is like some water bottles up there. So he just starts like trying to drop the water bottles down the ladder and they're not very far up the ladder yet. So they stop and they're like, we're just going to wait until you come down. We know you have to come down soon. And uh, he's in the treehouse and he starts realizing that this was not the best well thought out plan. Like, I don't really think you should do this. I'm not saying you should uh, do what he did. Obviously, you should like yell at them to stop if they're trying to rob another guy. But you get what I'm saying. I don't think this was the most well thought out plan. I don't think this was the best way to handle the situation. But here he is stuck in the treehouse with them down there saying that they're just going to wait. And he doesn't really know what to do. And they had some like walkie talkies in the treehouse, but he didn't know if his brother was home or not. So he just starts kind of going on the walkie talkie and he's whispering because he doesn't want them to hear him like calling for help and he's like bro listen i was really dumb i'm stuck in the treehouse the gang of pirates is standing underneath me they're just gonna wait till i have to come down like can you come help me 
And somehow, by the grace of Gray Skull, his brother is in his room, and so he picks it up, and he's like, yeah, I'll come out. And so he opens and closes the back door really loud, and uh, the gang of pirates kind of hears that, and they are like, we got to get out of here, you know, it's his parents, we got to go. And they go get on their bikes, and they get out of there, and his brother comes over, and he sees them riding their bikes away, and he yells at them to stop, but obviously they don't stop. If they're willing to be roaming around, like, stealing people's stuff and smacking them with wooden swords, I don't really know how uh, telling them to stop is gonna work. But whatever, they leave, his brother's like, what happened? He tells him what happened, they decide to go figure out where that kid lives, so they go over, knock on the door, ask if they can talk to him. His parents are like, yeah, sure, so they go get him, and the little kid comes out, and they're like, alright, what happened? And he says it's the fourth time that they've tried to rob him, but he never has anything on him, so they just get angry and tell him to bring something nice. Which is absolutely bonkers, I mean, think about that. You try to rob someone, and they have nothing on them, and you're like, hey, next time you come, you better make sure that you have a wallet full of Benjamins, okay? I I'm over trying to rob you for four pennies. Like, I would just never have anything valuable on me after that point. If someone's repeatedly robbing you and keeps telling you to bring nicer things, just, just don't bring anything nice like why would you do that but whatever they're realizing that this problem is really out of control and even though they had threatened them with like if anyone told their parents they decide that it's gone too far and they have to tell them so because they were new in the neighborhood they decide that they're gonna tell their parents and they go and they do and their parents decide to go around and talk to the other parents about it just to make sure that this wasn't just some rumor that they were telling the new kids to scare them and all the parents ask their kids, and as soon as the parents start pressuring their kids about it, a bunch of them break, you know? Like, when their parents just weren't pressing them and asking questions, it was just no big deal. But the second they're like, is this going on? Like, please tell me, because we gotta take care of this if it's happening. They are like, yes, it happened, you know, they would steal our stuff and whatnot. And all the parents decide that they're gonna have to have a neighborhood meeting. A bunch of the dads wanted to, like, go over there and, like, yell at them. And they were like, no, no, you can't handle it that way. So they're gonna have a neighborhood meeting. And so all the parents go to the neighborhood meeting. So this is just what he heard from his parents who were at the neighborhood meeting, like, back when they came back and told him what had happened. Well, they started talking to the parents of the kids who were in the pirate gang. And they were kind of, like, split in their reactions. There was four or five kids. And uh, a few of them were, like, immediately outraged, went home to punish their kid because they were, like, so shocked that they would even think that that was okay. They didn't know it was happening. They just thought they were playing pirates outside. I mean, let's be honest. If your kid was like, hey, I'm gonna go play pirates and walked out with an eye patch and a wooden sword, you probably wouldn't think he was going to be roaming around actually robbing people like a pirate. You would probably just think they're, like, I don't know, doing what kids do and, like, playing pirate. I just wouldn't assume that my kid's going on a robbed armory, like an armed robbery spree. I would just assume they're playing pirate. Why would you assume that they're going to be going around stealing from people? But a few of them were almost mad that anything was said. They were like, yeah, well, my kid's playing pirate. What do you expect them to do? As if that makes any sense. Like, I don't know. Um, build a pretend uh, ship fort out of sticks in the woods and, like, pretend that you found buried treasure. You don't run around, run like ramming people off the road, hitting them with wooden swords. You don't do that. There are many ways you can play pirate without actually having to steal anything. You know, or like maybe ask, ask some of the other neighborhood kids, like, okay, we're gonna give you guys some fake gold and we're gonna come pillage your ship. I feel like it's way messed up to just go around uh, smacking people with wooden sticks and then like taking their mp3 players and smashing it just to teach them a lesson and those parents immediately start getting uh, drowned out and just screaming from the other parents who are like you're not actually gonna try to defend this right now like what's wrong with you and the parents kind of double down for a bit and they're like well i just don't think it's that big of a deal no wonder kids these days are so soft do I think kids these days are as tough as they were, like, in the in the 30s when the Great Depression was going on? No, of course not. A lot of those kids were working in factories at 8. And that being said, I don't think even tough people would really love being robbed and beaten with sticks. Oh, kids are so soft these days. Would you like to be robbed every day, good sir? If on your way to work, there was just some dude way bigger than you in the office, and he walked up to you and just smacked you in the face with a log, and said, give me your money, would you be like, ah, oh, yeah, of course, man, you're bigger than me, that's the way the world works. 
Would you be soft if you didn't like that? I don't think so. I don't think that makes you a soft person to not like being robbed. And at that point, a bunch of the parents decide that uh, they are going to threaten to do something that they didn't want to do. And they're like, well, if you're not going to tell your kids to stop it, the next time it happens, we're going to call the police. And at that point, I think the parents of the kids who were still like, oh, whatever, it's not that big of a deal, realized that they were going to get themselves in a lot more trouble and their kids in a lot more trouble and that these parents weren't messing around if they didn't shut it down and they should have shut it down. It's ridiculous that they had to be like blackmailed to go tell their kids to stop robbing people. No wonder some kids end up so weird. If your parents are just like, nah, robbery's not that big of a deal. Like, dude, no wonder you're roaming around smacking people with wooden swords. You have horrible role models at home. His dad just comes home every day. He's like, son, you will not believe what I got at the store today. I didn't pay for any of it. He walks outside. It's just like a semi-trailer full of stuff. But once they threatened to call the cops, they were like, okay, okay we'll shut it down we'll shut it down so uh after that no one went outside for a while a bunch of the parents were afraid they're like until this gets handled we're gonna give it a little bit for them to have the conversation and know that we're serious about it we just don't want you guys like riding around and the neighborhood was actually very united about not liking this obviously they had kept it a secret for a while but as soon as the parents find out that like the stuff that they're giving their kids is being robbed and their kids are being threatened and hit with wooden sticks they're pretty unified in stopping that i feel like that's something that definitely gets people on the same page as like anything like this where the neighborhood begins to get unsafe and especially if it's people's kids being robbed like they'll do anything to make sure that their kids are safe but what I don't think anyone expected was that, you know, some of the kids in the pirate gang coming door to door to all the kids that they had robbed and like giving them the stuff back if they still had it and reading a letter. And there was one kid who had actually definitely written his letter and was like actually sorry. He was sobbing as he read it. I'm so sorry. Which, uh, I, I guess that kid, whatever, lesson learned, I don't know. I don't know how much you can really, like, apologize for beating someone with a stick and taking their things. That just kind of seems out there. But whatever, at least he seems sorry. A couple of them definitely were just reading something that their mom wrote. Like, you know, you have to write an apology letter. Mom, I don't want to. This is stupid. You have to. Well, what should I write? You know, they're just standing there straight faced, like no emotion, acting like they don't want to be there. I'm really sorry for breaking your MP3 player. It probably was not very cool of me. But a lot of the people like came and apologized. The kids whose parents were like, no, we're not going to make our kids stop it. Your kids just need to toughen up. Their kids didn't come and apologize, but honestly, considering that they didn't even really care until they threatened to get the cops called, I can't find that surprising. But what was really hilarious is that, like, the subscriber who sent this to me, because his older brother was a little bit older, was just trolling the kids whenever they would come to apologize. Like, they'd be reading the letter, you know? I'm really sorry. Sorry for what? <laughs> Trying to be a pirate. And stealing all the stuff. And running you off the road and making you crash your bike and then hitting you with a wooden stick. And, and just like making them go on and on. But whatever, the two kids that hadn't apologized were obviously pissed off that their little ruse had been shut down. And for some reason, they were really mad at the subscriber's older brother. The one who had like come out and saw them and then decided to tell everyone blah, 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 blah. So those two decided that they were going to get revenge by robbing his older brother. Their plan was to kind of do their usual pirate tactic of like running someone's bike off the road, making them crash, just kind of like hitting them, kicking them, whatever it may be, just doing anything you can to uh, make them give you the stuff. But his older brother was a little bit older than these two and a bit bigger too, so whatever. He's riding his bike and he sees those two following him and he's not an idiot. He figures out pretty pretty quickly that if these two guys are going to be following him, they're probably up to no good. Considering all of the other pirate guys had like apologized and really had left it alone and these two guys were uh, looking pissed off and clearly kind of like communicating to each other, his brother decides to just kind of start going faster, they start going faster, and at that point it's on, it's a high speed bike chase, you know, it's uh, the, the scene from 21 Jump Street when they're chasing everybody on the bikes, just going around just chasing each other, however, his brother had been uh, 
I don't know if it had been like inspired by maybe it was just convenient that it happened like this had been like watching Star Wars I guess and you know when they're flying the fighters and they'll like do a maneuver to make two enemy fighters crash into each other he just kind of starts weaving making super tight turns and it's forcing them to like get closer and closer to each other on the bikes to like keep up with each other and so he realizes that they keep kind of lining up one in front of the other so he goes down this really thin alleyway where it's basically enough for you to like ride your bike down it but not much else and right at the end he just decides to make them crash into each other and he slams on the brake you know full star wars fighter pilot er, the two enemy fighters except uh what happened was it was like all three of them in a line there was probably about 15 feet between the guy's older brother and like the first guy trying to rob him in like two feet between him and the other guy so when he slammed on his brake, the first guy slammed on his brake and the second guy did, but obviously that didn't really work in time because he only had like two feet to react, so they just crashed into each other. And because it was a thin alleyway and they were going so fast, the guy in the back kind of flips over the guy in the front, his bike goes up and slams down, and the older brother is just laughing because obviously these guys have been like up to no good trying to rob him, and he had literally made them crash into each other, had to have felt pretty 500 IQ big brain. So uh, he's laughing at them and they get up. They're like, it's not funny. Except like one of them has pretty messed up his shoulder area. Come to find out he had broke his collarbone, but whatever. They're all pissed off. They're like, you should give us what you have in your pockets since you made us crash. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. You guys were trying to rob me. Why would I give you something because you guys crashed? And they're like, well, you made us crash. And he said, yes, because you guys were chasing me trying to rob me. And they're like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that you have to make us crash our bikes. I don't know, man, but I also think it means that he's allowed to make you crash your bikes. Like, if someone's chasing you and you make them run into a wall, you're not suddenly responsible for them running into the wall. Because if they wouldn't have been trying to rob you, you wouldn't have had to been taking evasive maneuvers, now would you? But whatever, the older brother just bikes away at that point, and they only knew that the kid had broken his collarbone because a couple days later they saw him, like, going to the mailbox, you know, his parents had told him to go check the mail. And he had the little cast thing on that people get when they uh, break their collarbone. And I love that they were trying to get revenge on who they blamed for it all, only to end up getting themselves even more hurt. And the older brother hadn't decided to tell his parents or anything. He told his little brother, but didn't want to get them in more trouble. He figured them being hurt was enough. And uh, thankfully after this one, they did learn their lesson. First time around, they really could have just walked away, just got to apologize. No, we've got to go for the ultimate crime. That's like going to jail for like bank robbery, getting out. And the first thing you do is go rob a bank. Oh, were all those years sitting in jail thinking about robbing the bank? Were you inspired to do it even better? I can break my record time. You know, they did give up pirating after that, probably because it became a self-hazard. Clearly, they didn't care about stealing from people or anything. But I'm sure when he broke his bone and they were trying to explain to his parents what happened and it involved chasing someone on a bike and crashing, it was like, all right, you guys got to really leave that alone now. I'm saying they should have stopped. Everyone else stopped. But if these kids' parents didn't even want to make them apologize, can we really say we're surprised that it took them getting hurt to stop? Oh no, now that I'm robbing people and they're not going to let me and they're going to make me crash on my bike, I no longer want to rob anyone. Like, that's what's going to make you do it, not the fact that it's just not your property and it's messed up to take things that don't belong to you. No, no, no hang-ups on that. You're perfectly fine breaking someone's MP3 player to take them a lesson. But the second they make you crash on your bike, it's too much, guys. I simply cannot continue to take these risks. My health matters too, okay? Robber safety is very important. Everyone has since grown up. The two kids that had tried to rob him again, the one who broke his collarbone and the one whose like, parents didn't want to make him apologize, they ended up moving about like six, seven months after that and they didn't really keep touch, so they don't really know what happened to them. As for every other pirate, they've now reformed from their ways of piracy and have decided to live in a more civilized era. You know, they, they went full privateer. They're just robbing people with permission of the HOA now. That's a joke. That's a joke. But seriously, like, they just became semi-normal. I mean, obviously, if you do stupid things when you're a kid, you can grow up and change. I don't think that's impossible. I think even if, like, there's enough time, if you do something dumb and you're an adult, you can probably change too. That being said, uh, it is really funny that they're, like, still walking around with the shame knowing that they used to be pirates. Someone starts talking about Pirates of the Caribbean. They're like, in my personal pirating experience, I would say da-da-da-da-da. They're like, personal pirating experience? Yes, yes, I used to be the captain of a pirate crew. 
I would love to know where the two that decided to go for the follow-up robbery are now, though. Probably, like, I, I don't know, out in the woods somewhere, just like... You know that guy who lived in that town in California and would just break into cabins when people weren't there and steal their food for like 25 years? They're probably living like that, just still have an eye patch on and go, arg. That's like the only thing they can say now. It's been so long since they've had contact with other humans. They've just gone semi-feral. Anyways, uh, moral of the story, don't rob people or you will break your collarbone. I know most of you probably didn't need to be told that anyways, but just in case you're out there and like, I want to be a pirate, don't do it. Basically, this dude's stepdad ended up destroying his PC and it's just a wild story time that I uh, knew that you guys would enjoy listening to and he sent it in so why not tell it. Pretty nuts story so before we get into it if you don't mind pressing the like button I'd really appreciate it and uh, yeah without further ado let's go. Alright, so uh, I think anyone who's got a PC, like, would say that it's one of their prized possessions, not in a weird, like, no, my PC's gone away, but they're not exactly cheap, you know? And on top of that, they're pretty fragile, so I feel like most people who have a PC are, like, don't want people messing around with it or throwing it around or anything like that. And they especially don't want someone, like, throwing it down the stairs. But I guess this guy just got really bad luck when it came to the stepdad department. This guy's mom remarried, uh, to this dude. And right away, there were some issues because he was the type of guy who was like, You need to be up at 5 a.m. out there with six jobs, otherwise you're a lazy turd. And listen, I'm not saying there's something to be said for, like, having a job or having good work ethic. I think that's a big part of being successful, right? Is, like, being able to do work even when you don't necessarily want to do it, but it needs to be done. That's important. But I think it's also nuts to, like, have this idea that you should never have anything you enjoy. There should never be any fun ever. You should only work all the time and anything other than work is a waste of time. Because if anything, the whole reason you want to get, like, really good at work and get faster at it is so you can do more work in a shorter period so you can enjoy life even more, you know? Either way, they just instantly butted heads. And one of the things that they really butted heads about was this guy's PC. Now, this guy wanted to be a computer programmer, computer scientist, engineer, whatever you call it. I don't know the proper term, but that was his goal when he got older. So he was already into computers and he would use his computer to like study that type of stuff. He was already teaching himself how to code. He was doing like some networking classes on his computer. And so he's on it a lot. And yeah, sometimes he would play video games on it because it was a gaming PC. It's not like that was the only thing he was doing. But his stepdad just couldn't understand that you can use a computer for something other than just goofing off and playing video games. And he would just nag him constantly about like, you're spending way too much time on that computer and it's gonna rot your brain and no wonder you're falling behind in school, blah, 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 blah. And what was annoying is he would like make stuff up. The guy wasn't falling behind in school, but this guy would just be like, your computer's making you do all these things that he just wasn't doing. Which has to be mad annoying, man. Like, someone's just like, oh, you smoking those cigarettes is, is making your teeth fall out. And you're like, I don't smoke cigarettes and none of my teeth have fallen out, but okay. And he would try to explain to his stepdad that, like, I'm not always goofing off on my computer. I'm learning what to do for my future job. I'm teaching myself how to do useful skills. Like, not everything on the computer is goofing off. And his stepdad would just tell them that, you know, no amount of hard work at the computer compares to real-life hard work experience. But listen, Mr. Stepdad, I'm not trying to say you're dumb or anything, but even if he was gonna go get quote-unquote super real-world experience coding, he would just be sitting in front of a computer in a different location, man. Like, it's not like it would change anything about how much he's using the computer. You need to get real-life work experience. Well, my real-life work, I hope, has to do with computers, so uh, I'd rather do it in my room with the computer I already own. I don't know, man. I'm just not really understanding where he was going with that. Like, I feel like teaching yourself how to code is better and then go get real work experience. But it'd be really annoying to go convince someone to give you a job and, like, get real world experience when you don't know what they're doing. I don't think they'd take too kindly to that. Maybe tell your stepdad that. Oh, you want me to go get a job and immediately piss them off because I can't do anything that I was supposed to be able to do when I got the job? I don't think they're gonna go, we appreciate the follow through and you wanting to work here. They're just gonna fire you and probably be pissed at you for wasting their time and tell everybody else that you're just gonna waste their time. I don't think that's a good thing. 
But whatever, they would get into these huge arguments about it, and his stepdad also had the bad ability of never being able to admit he was wrong. And those people suck, because, you know, like, everyone's wrong sometimes. I'm sure there's stuff I've done that's wrong, a lot of stuff I've done that's stupid. Like, everybody's got mistakes. It doesn't mean that you're always wrong. It doesn't mean that you're instantly some, like, irredeemable idiot. But everyone's made mistakes, everyone's done stupid things, everyone's been wrong before. And if you say that you've never been wrong, then, like, you're just delusional. But he would just get into these screaming matches with this kid about how he knows enough about computers to know that he's only wasting his time on there and there's no way he's wrong about it. Keep in mind, this guy's like pretty technologically illiterate. Like the fact that this dude was able to turn on his laptop by himself was a miracle. That's how bad he was with technology. So the idea that he's somehow some computer expert who can just instantly tell what you're doing the second he looks at your computer and he knows that you're just gaming all the time when you're just not doing it all the time would get really annoying. So it would obviously escalate and turn into a screaming match and then his mom would have to get involved, which would make it even worse. Because then his stepdad's like, you know, oh, you need your mom to come save you. Like, it was just a really crappy, bad situation. But whatever, he finally told his mom to, like, just let him handle the arguments about technology because he could handle it himself. And his mom was like, all right, all right, I know he's stubborn and I'm sorry about it. Like, even his mom felt bad about everything that had been going down and how it had been going down. And listen, I don't really know the dynamic here, but I feel like she should have probably done a little bit more to rein him in. Because what happens next is just absolutely bonkers. His stepdad decides to make this rule for the house, which is basically that, like, you can't spend more than an hour a day on any type of screen, including your cell phone, including your computer, any of that. And obviously, every kid in the house is like, that's just not gonna work, because they're going to school online, so there's no way it's gonna be possible. And the stepdad's like, well, you're just gonna have to figure it out or go to the library or something, but I need to limit screen time in my house was just, just a nuts level of control. You hate them being on technology, but you're gonna make them, like, go to the library to finish their schoolwork? Oh yeah, man, you're definitely gonna make them learn their lesson about over-reliance on technology. It's not gonna backfire and make them, like, hate you for making life way more difficult for no reason. They have computers, but they're not allowed to do their schoolwork or anything else on them at home. Nope, not for more than an hour. Then they have to go figure it out. That real-world experience sure is gonna toughen them up, you know? Just don't be surprised when you're, like, an old man and you get put in the crappiest nursing home because none of them care enough to take good care of you. Why do my grandkids never call? Because their parents told them that grandpa sucked, that's why. Anyways, when he announces this rule, immediately a huge fight breaks out between everyone and the stepdad. Like, all the kids, his kids, his mom's kids, like, everyone's just pissed, right? And his mom's not home when he announces this rule, which probably was something he thought through a little bit, because obviously she wouldn't have been cool with it. And they're kind of trying to reason with him about how it would be ridiculous for them to not be able to do schoolwork and, like, it's just a reality in the modern age that for them to work from home, do school from home, all that stuff, they need more than an hour a day. And he just keeps telling them that they're over-reliant on this and they need to go out in the real world and get some real-world experience instead. And listen, I get it. I think if your kid is doing literally nothing but playing Fortnite for like 18 hours a day, yeah, you should probably limit how much they're allowed to do that. I know that like that might be an unpopular opinion, but if you're literally doing nothing but playing War Thunder 18 hours a day every single day for months, that's just not very healthy. Like you gotta have a little bit more well-rounded things. But that's not what's going on here, and limiting people to an hour a day isn't preparing them for the real world because, believe it or not, in the real world, people use technology now. Like, listen, when our parents were kids, yeah, it was reality that not everyone was using the computer all the time, not everybody needed to learn how to do a bunch of stuff with technology, video games were probably like a ginormous waste of time, there was no redeeming qualities about it, other than just being fun. Wastes of time are okay to me, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be able to play video games, I'm just saying like I can get why boomers might not like it. But now, in the real world, everyone uses technology. Like, it's just a fact of life that you need to use a computer, you need to be able to use the internet. I think most places don't even hand out paper applications for jobs anymore. They just all tell you to apply online. 
So the idea that like if you just ban your kids from technology, they're magically going to become millionaires because of all this real world experience is just dumb because in the real world, you got to be able to use it too. We're not going to go back to the 1980s again. You know, I, I'm sure it was cool. I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't born, but like it's just not. And uh, the idea that all technology is going to magically disappear is just crazy because, yeah, there's a lot of downsides, but it does make things a little bit more efficient. You know, there's no denying that. But whatever, they're arguing back and forth with him and he's just doing his uh, usual maneuver of not backing down at all or saying that there's anything wrong with what he's doing. Just saying that they're gonna understand when they're older and trust me, one day they'll get it. And I don't think they're gonna get it. This isn't limiting them to like playing an hour of video games a day. This is literally making their lives substantially harder for no reason. And when they keep arguing with them, his response isn't to like keep arguing with them. It's to just say that everyone needs to go to their room. And he says it like screaming at the top of his lungs. And you know when someone's screaming and you're starting to sit in like the splash zone at SeaWorld, Shamu is gonna come out, do a double backflip, give you a little splash. Well, he's so pissed that he's spitting and basically everyone in front of him is getting the splash zone treatment. Just uh, should have worn a poncho to dinner when dad was going to announce the rules. And so they get the vibe and they decide to go up to their room. And everyone's going up the stairs kind of being like, this is so stupid, blah, 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 blah. And the stepdad yells out as they're going upstairs that no one better go get on any technology and like this serious, no technology tonight, blah, blah, blah. And listen, up to this point, the stepdad hadn't really like been barging into anyone's rooms when the doors were closed or anything and uh, everybody was like going to go upstairs and get on their phone or do whatever so the subscriber goes upstairs closes his door locks it which was not unusual like he did this all the time it's not the first time that he's done any of this right so it's not like he had any inkling that this was gonna piss off his stepdad any more than it normally did which was not at all and because his door was closed and it was locked he went over got on his computer which was in the corner and he wasn't going to get on Discord or anything, but he was just going to watch some YouTube videos. So he put on one earphone, like on the left side, just so that way he could hear the video, but he could also hear if someone was coming upstairs. And he just kind of starts watching YouTube. And he hears his stepdad coming upstairs, and he knows his stepdad's coming upstairs because he's just kind of like loudly complaining about the kid's reaction. Can't believe how ungrateful they are. They have all this technology, and you know, they just want to use it all the time. Well, yeah. I, I think that's kind of what happens when you buy people technology. Like, if you buy all your kids an Xbox and you don't like Xbox, don't be surprised that they want to play Xbox. Like, you bought them an Xbox. What did you What did you think was going to happen? This guy just, just seems like he does not understand cause and effect at all. Like, if you explained anything to him, like you did X and Y happened, he just could not understand how they're related. What do you mean I bought my kids an Xbox and now they want to play video games? How is this my fault? It's like, well, if they didn't have a game console, they, they couldn't be addicted to playing video games, you know? And this guy's dad and mom had bought him this PC, not his stepdad. Like his dad and his mom had agreed to get him a computer so that way he could learn to code and all this stuff. So obviously uh, he had nothing to do with this kid having his computer, but he had bought all the other kids game consoles and stuff and whatever. He starts kind of like going from room to room and knocking on the door and being like, what are you doing? And so this kid, obviously knowing that he's going to come knock on the door and ask what he's doing, puts his computer on sleep really quick, goes and gets in his bed and opens a book and pretends like he's reading it. And so his stepdad comes, knocks on the door, and then tries the handle, and it's locked. And instead of being like, hey, come unlock the door, his stepdad, who's already raging for no reason, instantly starts freaking out and starts banging on the door, just like a, an angry man trying to kick in the door, the Kool-Aid man himself coming in, and is like, open this door right now, I know you're on your computer, da 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 And the subscriber had just forgotten he locked the door. He did it all the time, it's not like it's something he thought of when he heard his stepdad coming he just went to cover himself real quick he just wasn't really thinking about the door and so he says sorry I'm reading a book and he gets up and he runs over and he unlocks the door and he opens it and his stepdad like flings open the door and when he flings it open it hits the subscriber in the chest and he's like relax and the stepdad gets even more pissed about that and is like you don't tell me to relax in my own home what I do in my home is my business 
I don't know who you think you are trying to tell me to relax when I know you're up here on your computer after I just explicitly told you not to be on your computer. You're way out of line, young man. You need to respect me, blah, blah, blah. And the subscriber just says, I wasn't on my computer. And so the stepdad goes over to his computer and unfortunately, it's just the reality of PCs. It's a little warm. He was watching a video on like 4K and he doesn't have the, the sickest setup. So it's a little warm. And the dad's like, well, why is your computer warm? And he says, oh, it must have been from earlier before dinner. I was playing a game. At that point, though, his stepdad's like, well, then uh, turn it on. Like, take it off sleep. And at that point, the subscriber's like, ah, crap, I'm probably screwed. Because the second he takes it off sleep, he knows it's going to pop up with a YouTube video. It's just going to be, like, really obvious he was on the computer. But his stepdad's insistent. He's like, you need to take it off sleep now. So he does. And sure enough, the YouTube video pops up and his stepdad starts screaming. You are such a rule breaker. I can't believe that you have no respect for the rules that I set in this household. Do you have any idea how disrespectful that is? I have half the mind to take away your computer. And at that point, he just tells his stepdad to get out of his room. He's like, you're not going to take my computer. You didn't pay for it. You have nothing to do with it. So you need to get out of my room. And that sets his stepdad off even more. And he's like, I'll get out of your room. But if I'm going to get out of your room, then I'm going to take what I think you don't deserve anymore. And he grabs his computer. And so the, so the subscriber starts like trying to put himself between his stepdad and the door. And the stepdad kind of uses the computer to push the kid out into the hallway. And uh, the way the house is positioned, they have like just this long thing of stairs. And at the end of the stairs is the front door. And his stepdad just starts yelling that he doesn't deserve this anymore and blah, 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 blah. And the subscriber is screaming, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he's like, something I should have done a long time ago and just throws the PC down the stairs. And on the first bounce, it hits about like halfway down the stairs and it hits and the tempered glass just shatters. And it bounces like after that because it didn't hit on the tempered glass. It hit like on the front where those uh, front fans would go. And it hits there, tempered glass shatters. It bounces, hits on the like top corner. And that hits with enough force where the GPU breaks off the motherboard and it comes flying out. So now you know the PC's just donezo. Like the tempered glass, you'd have to get a new one of those, but you can get a new one of those. Your GPU breaks off the motherboard. Uh, probably a new GPU and definitely a new motherboard. At that point, you just gotta hope that the CPU's okay, but considering the state of the motherboard, you know, you just, you just never know, bro. A very expensive fix, though. And as it bounces the third time and gets to the bottom of the stairs, like perfect timing, his mom opens the door and so the first thing that his mom sees when she opens the door is just this glass flying towards her and the computer bouncing and it hits on the ground and falls over and it's very obvious to like anyone with eyes at that point that uh this computer's broken even without eyes man if you heard this thing falling down the stairs you would 100 percent know that it's broken just the sound of it and his mom is just kind of staring at this like broken computer at the bottom of the stairs that very evidently just got thrown down the stairs and then she looks up to be like where did this just come from because i'm guessing that was not on her bingo card of what she was going to see when she came home from work today. I don't know. She's probably thinking, oh, they've probably eaten dinner already. I'm a little uh, late to get home. Maybe we can still watch the Muppets movie. You know, the one where they sing the song, am I a Muppet or am I a man? Like that one. That's probably what she was thinking she was going to do tonight. Nope. She opens the door to a computer flying down the stairs instead. She probably sitting there like, what in the Nanny McPhee is going on? Objects are flying. We got some witchcraft and wizardry going on. The new Harry Potter movie that hasn't been announced yet they're shooting on location but uh when she looks up she sees her son who's like at this point in tears pissed off and her husband his stepdad kind of standing there and the stepdad now has his jaw just dropped open I don't know if he expected her to just never found out that he broke the computer if he just did it not kind of thinking about what he was doing and now he realized the consequences of his actions 
But either way, now his jaws dropped open like, oh, I can't believe what just happened. Yep, like I said, didn't seem like he understood the whole cause and effect thing. Believe it or not, when you throw computer downstairs, computer break. I know, I know, very, very complicated, all right. I, I tried to dumb it down, took out as many words as I could. I'll, I'll even simplify it more. Computer, no downstairs. All right, like th that's really all you needed to figure out to prevent this from happening. After you throw down the, the computer down the stairs, not, and I guess throw down with the computer too, whatever, that both would've worked. You kinda gotta uh, understand that it's just going to break. After you've thrown it is a little bit too late. You know, if this was an episode of Mythbusters, Buster would have exploded. This myth would 100% be plausible. If you throw a computer down the stairs, it will break. Who would have thought that the stepdad is a scientist? He's just out here trying to figure out the questions we all have, such as how durable is a gaming PC? Like, you know Demolition Ranch, how he's just always blowing random stuff up? This is something on his channel. Like, we shot a gaming computer with a 50 cal. What happened? Well, it probably broke. That's that's what I would guess happened. His mom's standing there though, taking in this scene and she's just pissed. And she starts screaming immediately that like, he just threw a $1,500 computer that he didn't pay for down the stairs and what's wrong with him? Why would he ever think that's okay? It's not even his, it's her son's. He uses it for work and he uses it for school. Why would you ever break it? Like, are you kidding me? This is psychotic. Which listen, at least she was pissed about it. I feel like I've had enough crazy step parent stories submitted to me and like here on the channel where the parents just don't care. At least she's pissed, but it is also a little bit too little too late when it's already been thrown down the stairs and destroyed. But the stepdad is still stammering, but like trying to somehow maintain that what he did was somehow justified. And he's like, well, he was on it too much. Yeah, well, uh, you know what's possible if he's on it too much? You could have just taken it away or I don't know, like put some parental control on it. I don't, I don't know what you can do. I don't have a kid. That being said, I feel like throwing it down the stairs is not on the list of things I would feel like I had to do. Like hypothetically, if I had a kid uh, and he was playing too much Xbox, I'd put the controls on. And if that didn't work, then I would just take away the Xbox. Last on my list would be pick it up, throw it down the stairs. Like that would just never be on my list of things to do. Cause I don't know, I paid for the Xbox. Like, aren't you messing up yourself? Maybe that's why he didn't. He didn't pay for the computer. So he's like, ah, oh, whatever, I'll throw it down the stairs. Anyways, his mom's response to that like pathetic attempt at justifying it is to just go off on him saying that he's a moron and she doesn't understand why he has this like weird beef with technology, but it's here to stay. So we might as well just accept it instead of pretending that the world's gonna go back to the way it was, which listen is very true. That's what I was saying earlier, man. Like even if you don't like technology, it's just a little bit too late to be on this train of I'm just never going to use it. Like it or not, it's just a reality that that like some stuff requires technology in the modern age, especially just to exist in society. You know, oh, we live in a society, but like, yeah, bro, life's just way easier if you have a computer. I'm sure technically, if you really wanted to do it completely off grid, completely offline, I'm sure there's ways to do it, but like, if you just wanna make life easier on yourself, just embrace it, you know? Especially if this guy's got like a normal job, imagine trying to be this guy's boss. Hey man, will you write up the report for me? Sure thing, I'll write it up with my pen. You're like, can you just type it please? You have bad handwriting. Nope, I don't do laptops. I refuse to use any technology. If you're gonna do that, just like go be Amish, you know? I feel like you're just being Amish with a bunch of extra steps and like, oh, I'm gonna have my cell phone, but like, I, I hate gaming computers and I'm gonna throw them down the stairs. Either way, the stepdad and the mom go into their room and they're having an insane argument. And about an hour later, the stepmom comes and is like, hey, can I talk to you? And he's like, yeah, of course, cause you know, it's his mom. He's gonna talk to his mom. And she says that she really wants to apologize. She knows that computer meant to a lot to him and he had no right to destroy it. And she doesn't know what's gotten into him and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, I get it, but I still don't have a computer. Like, it's still destroyed, and I appreciate the apology, but, like, what is this guy's issue? He can't be doing that. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. You can't just throw my stuff down the stairs all the time. Like, that's ridiculous, you know? And she says, yeah, they talked about it, and he's never going to do it again, and he agreed to get you a new computer. 
And the kid's like, yeah, but you know, like a lot of the parts that were on that computer are old now. Like, I don't know how much it'll be to get them and da 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 da. It doesn't seem fair that he destroys my computer and then just like has to get me in a replacement. I feel like he like owes me an apology as well. And she says that he is going to apologize. And she said that he will also get him any computer he wants. And at that point, you know, he's like, all right, well, my stepdad destroyed my computer. If he says he's going to get me any computer he wants, I know what I want. So he's like, all right, well, I'll pick out the parts then because I need to get it ordered so I can work on my stuff. And he goes online and he builds an absolute beast of a PC, bro. I'm talking like an i9, whatever, a blah, blah, blah. 3090 Ti, just like the most overkill computer, 128 gigabytes of RAM. And he goes in and he shows his stepdad and his stepdad's like, this is so expensive. And he's like, yeah, and you could have prevented yourself having to buy this if you wouldn't have destroyed my computer. Which, listen, I think asking for a 3090 Ti, da, 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 was he probably taking advantage of the situation a little bit? Yeah. But at the same time, bro, you wouldn't have had to buy him a new computer if you didn't throw his old one down the stairs. This all could have been very easily prevented. You could have stopped yourself from being forced to buy all this stuff, but nope, for some reason you threw it down the stairs, man. This one's kind of on you. Overkill 100%, but at the same time, throwing it down the stairs was also overkill. So whatever, they order all this parts, it gets there, he builds it, and his stepdad gives him this long apology about how, like, he needs to have more respect for him, and he's really sorry for it, and da-da-da-da-da. And it was a lot of really good words, but he could tell his stepdad didn't really mean it, and it was more of a, like, my, uh, his mom, sorry, not my mom. You know, the kid's mom was, like, telling him what to say to him, if that makes sense. Like, oh, yeah, you need to say this, and this is why this is important. Like, he could just tell that none of it was actually any of his original thoughts. But whatever, he just accepted it to make his mom's life easier and had his computer. And after that, his stepdad just kind of stayed out of his way, so it worked out. He realized that, like, oh, I can fight him on this all the time, but it's just going to end up with me having to get, buy him another computer, so no thanks. Either way, though, horrible that the kid had to get his stuff thrown down the stairs. Like, at least this one kind of had an okay ending because he got a better computer out of it. But, like, what is up with step-parents being nutter butters, man? Like, I don't have any. But that being said, bro, is it normal for them to just be, like, breaking stuff? I feel like so often I get stories sent to me where people throwing stuff down the stairs and whatnot. Like, this just seems, like, exhausting to try to live with. I know uh, you guys probably don't have much control over it if you got them, though. That being said, hopefully your guys' step-parents are a lot cooler than this. And, you know, if you, like, kind of don't like your step-parent, uh, at least they're not throwing your computer down the stairs. You, there, there's always that. You got to look on the bright side. All right, so this first one that was sent in to me is from a guy who skates in front of his house with his friends on the weekend and, like, sometimes after school. He has a grind box and a rail, so every now and then they'll set it up out there and skate for a few hours. And they've never had any issue with any of the neighbors before just because they were pretty nice. They would stop if cars were coming. They weren't like, you know, screaming at every other kid outside. It wasn't like they were getting in anyone's way. They were just skating. Well, the house across the street from them goes up for sale and a new guy moves in. And he's just an older gentleman. And I don't mean this to disparage him at all, but he's just not in the greatest shape. He's old. It's hard to stay in, like, Dwayne The Rock Johnson shape if you're 84. He wasn't actually 84. He was, like, that weird in-between stage where they're old, but they're not, like, old, old yet, you know? Like, late 50s, early 60s, where you're like, eh, kinda. And this guy was one of those people that apparently subscribed to the school of thought that, like, skateboarding was just the worst thing to ever exist. If there was a movie made about it, bro, like Footloose, where they try to ban dancing, this guy's town would ban skateboarding. Every time they would go out there and try to skate, he would come out and just yell at them that they were being too loud, which I love. For some reason, I feel like bad neighbors always do that. They say you're being too loud, so their way to solve it is to just be really, really loud. Like, you know what makes this more loud? You screaming at them. That definitely adds to the volume. And it got to the point where he got a bullhorn, and whenever they would try to skate, he would just be like, Get out of here! Get out of here! Way louder than the skateboarding would be. And a bunch of the other neighbors started being mad at him, and he would be like, well, I wouldn't have to do it if it wasn't for the skaters, da-da-da-da-da. And the other neighbors told the kids that the next time he does it, just keep skating, it doesn't matter how loud he gets, we don't care, just, like, put him in his place. So, they had the blessing of the rest of the neighborhood, because this grumpy old man was just pissing on everyone's toes. And so, the uh, next time they go skating, they head out there, they set up the rail, they set up the box, and they start skating. And within probably 15-20 minutes, 
Old Man McGee Zach has made his way outside to his uh, like lawn chair with his bullhorn and just starts yelling at them. And they're just ignoring it. They're acting like they can't hear it. They just keep skating. Nah, bro, I don't care that you're yelling as loud as humanly possible. It does not matter to me. I'm just going to keep on trucking. And he starts to get annoyed that they're not reacting to him or responding or even looking at him or leaving. So he just starts like turning it up and he maxes it out and they're still not listening or paying attention. So he just starts getting like more and more angry with what he's saying. And he was always mad, but you know, he's starting to be like spit flying out of his mouth into the bullhorn, probably going to cause an electric shock moment here in a bit. And they just are ignoring him. And finally, he gets up and he starts walking over to them. And they're like, okay, we can't ignore him anymore because he's coming over. And as he's walking over, he's screaming that, like, he's going to fight them. And he's tired of only using his words. They're going to speak with their fists like real men. And listen, I don't think fighting is ever the answer to a problem like this. Like, there's just no reason to fight the person that lives across the street from you. It's just not a good idea. Unless you absolutely have to. Like, if an old man is about to attack, you like what are you gonna do you just kind of got to defend yourself but he's walking over saying that you know oh I'm gonna fight you I'm gonna use my fists not just my words like real men and the group is like dude we don't want to fight you like stop like stop man and the guy is kind of not in good shape to the point that by the time he even gets across the road to them he's like starting to be out of breath and he's like I'm gonna beat you up man and then when I'm done with beating him up I'm gonna pick up his skateboard and I'm gonna fight you two next and maybe in his head, he's got this really intimidating, like, whoa, this old man is some uh, secret CIA agent thing going on. But in reality, it's just this, like, out-of-shape old dude who still thinks he's 21 trying to fight all these kids. And so they're like, bro, stop. But he keeps coming at them and he won't stop being like, I'm going to do something about this situation. And so the person who sent this in to me says, look, we're going to go inside. But even if you wanted to fight us, that wouldn't end bad for you, bro. Like, or that wouldn't end good for you, bro. You know what I'm saying. Like, it's just, listen, like, you're not in any condition to fight us. We're going to leave because we don't want to fight you. But, like, you're lucky that we are not going to fight you type of vibe. Which I don't know if I 1,000% agree with. But at the same time, some dude's just screaming that he's going to beat you up. And it's very obvious that he would not be able to beat you up. It'd be hard not to say something. And so they start backing up to go into their house and he keeps chasing them. And now he speeds up and they turn around and he has like his fist balled and he tries to hit them. And, you know, he's once again very slow. So the punch doesn't really do anything. It just kind of like goes a foot away from them because they just took another step back. And he starts screaming that like they need to stop running away from him and they need to settle this now. And they're like, man, we're not going to fight you. This is not going to end well. Stop. Like if you keep coming at me, bro, we're going to have to do something. We're trying to go in the house. Stop. And he just keeps walking at them, swinging at them. But it's like those swings where it's just somebody that clearly got their idea of fighting from like action movies. Just throwing haymakers, dude. He could basically start a tornado with how just out there and the wide his punches are going. And as he's doing it, he's so mad at them that spit's flying out of his mouth. And he's like, stop running. And they're not running. They're just backing up. And they keep being like, dude, stop. And they're getting close to their garage door. So they're running out of room to back up. And when they get to the garage door... They all kind of get into the stance of like, okay, man, you've literally backed us against the wall and it becomes obvious that they might actually have to fight back now. And all of a sudden, the guy who's very out of breath, like still, stops in his tracks. Oh, before this, oh, I'm going to beat you guys up throwing punches. But once he sees that, like, they're turning around and getting ready to have to defend themselves, he stops. And he's like, you guys should have fought me like men. I don't know why you don't want to fight me. And they are just telling him that they don't want to fight an old man. And he's like, I'm not old. I'm only your dad's age. And the subscriber snapped back at him and said he was probably so old he sat behind Julius Caesar in the third grade. Which is a solid one, bro. I mean, you definitely were a little bit older than these kids' dad. He wasn't insanely old. Like, this isn't some 95-year-old man with his oxygen tank running up on them like, I'm gonna beat you up. No, this is like a 58-year-old man just trying to fight this group of kids and then being like, I'm not old. So they're saying just whatever, man, whatever, man. And at that point, a bunch of the other neighbors start coming out and being like, what's going on? And the old man tries to be like, nothing, nothing's going on. But the kids start saying that he's trying to fight them and he's attacking them and all the neighbors start yelling at him to leave them alone. 
And now that he realizes he either has to fight them or, you know, leave, and the neighbors are now yelling at him, I think the embarrassment finally hits and he just kind of realizes it'd be best to go back to his house. Because he's like, I don't have time for this, and walks back across the street. And so they go inside to his house and they're telling his mom and his mom's pissed, but she just says, just ignore him. I've tried to talk to him. He's unreasonable, you know, but if it happens again, you didn't do anything wrong. And uh, I think the embarrassment of all the neighbors coming outside and seeing him trying to fight these kids after he had backed them into the corner actually made him realize that he should stop because he was just almost afraid of seeing them outside. Not in like a like, oh, I'm afraid they're going to beat me up way. But like if they came outside and he was getting his mail, he would just put his head down and just not look at them, get the mail and go inside. Like almost a bit of, uh, oh yeah, I definitely overreacted and it's really hard to look someone in the face after you've done something that stupid. The rest of the neighborhood was grateful though that his uh, bullhorning finally stopped. He kind of left them alone and uh, they still skate sometimes. They don't do it as much at his house just because his friends were like, yeah, I'm not trying to get attacked by an angry guy again, which I I get. But I thought that was a crazy story. Hope you guys did too. Uh, if you liked that one, press the like button. But we got more in the video, so don't don't leave. All right, so this next person who sent this in to me said that, like, there was this lady who had lived on their street for a couple years. She had moved in when another family had moved out. And she was known for being a super sweet lady. Like, if you saw her going to the mailbox, she would say hi and talk to you. She remembered things about people. And she was basically the grandma of the neighborhood. Like, on the 4th of July, she would make cookies and give them out to the neighborhood and whatnot. Uh, and everybody thought she was just the sweetest lady ever. And she was a very, very sweet lady, for sure. I'm not saying she wasn't nice, but one day she starts telling everyone in the neighborhood that she's going to be moving to Florida. No one really questions it because she said that's where her children lived and she was like around retirement aged. So if you retire, moving to Florida is one of the most stereotypical old person things you can really do. So it's not really causing alarm bells for anybody. And two days later, she had moved out. Like it was quick. She said, I'm moving to Florida and then was gone. 48 hour window. And people thought it was weird that she had moved out really quickly, but things start to get weirder when one day the kids are playing outside and they realize that she had left all of her cats in the backyard. And they were mostly like outdoor cats anyways, so they were okay, but the neighborhood kind of each like took one in and gave it a water bowl and whatnot because she had just left. And you're a really crappy person if you do that to your pet. Thank goodness they were okay, but you just move to a different state and leave your cats? That's nuts. And so everybody started being like, wow, maybe she wasn't that nice, da 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 like, thanks for the cookies, but you just left your cats when you moved? That's bizarre. And then the situation gets even weirder. Uh, a truck pulls up to the house one day, and they see, like, this company going in and whatnot, and they come back out, and they start knocking on doors asking what happened to that house. And they're really confused about it, and they explain that, like, for the past two years, that house has been a part of a trust or something, and, like, the guy who owns it through the trust wants to do something or other with it, and they knew it had been sitting for two years, so they were just coming to see what the situation was. But when they had gone in, it had been obvious someone was living there. And the neighborhood's confused, because they're like, yeah, an old lady lived there, but she owned the house. A family moved out, and she moved in. And they're like, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're telling me someone's been living there for two years? They confirm it, and they explain that, yeah, it was like some dude's trust had bought this house as an investment or something, and no one was supposed to have been living in there because he was trying to decide whether or not like he wanted to use it for a rental or a Airbnb. Two years is a long time to be deciding that, but still... Like, I, I don't know, I don't have a bunch of houses and a trust, so whatever. But you know what I'm saying, like, it was not supposed to be lived in. And they're s telling them that, no, the lady's been living there for years. And they say, it was just one lady? And they're like, yeah, why? And they say the house is destroyed. And obviously a couple people get curious, so like the neighborhood dads get together and they go over to look. And a couple of them come running out, and uh, the old lady who had been super sweet, friendly to everyone, baking cookies... You've already found out she's essentially a squatter. Well, she was also a hoarder too. And I know that like, that's a condition people need psychiatric help for. But imagine finding out that the person whose cookies you have been eating had like a kitchen full of
full of cat poop, bro. This house was next level TLC hoarding, like to the point where it, you couldn't even see the walls when you walked in. It was just bags of trash all the way up to the ceiling. And listen, you know what? It's not good for you. It's not healthy. If you are a hoarder, you should probably get help. But at the end of the day, we do live in America. If you want to fill your house with trash, I until it starts to be a health hazard for other people, I don't know if there's a legal thing they can do. But what's nuts is she was just doing this in a house she didn't even own. She just pulled up to this house and said, ah, this will make a great home and started hoarding immediately. Like, okay, letting a house sit empty for two years is stupid. I'm not saying that guy was a genius. But imagine finding out that a house you bought, someone had been living in for two years. You're already pissed. Wait, what? Someone's been living in my house for two years? And then you go to it and and there's just like cat poop in the kitchen, bags of garbage everywhere. Anyways, the entire neighborhood is shocked though, because this lady was just like basically grandma of the neighborhood. Turns out she was hoarding, feeding them her disgusting cookies baked on a whole layer of cat poop. And she wasn't even supposed to be there, dude. I guess never judge a book by its cover or something, you know. The cover is grandma of the neighborhood behind the scenes squatting. It was very Florida woman of her though, like if you think about it, the fact that she said she's gonna move to Florida because that's where her family is, she's gonna fit right in. Yeah, my last house I wasn't supposed to live in, so I trashed it, and uh, now I fled the state, and they're like, no way, me too. I know most people from Florida are normal, I just feel like if you are crazy, you go there. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? It's just one of those things. Las Vegas kinda has that too, a lot of crazy people here, it's nothing personal, I'm just saying she is a Florida woman, it makes sense she would go there. All right, this next one was really funny. Um, so the person who sent this in to me, they have a bunch of fruit trees in their backyard, and it just so happens that they have, like, two apple trees that produce a substantial amount of apples. That's pretty sweet. You can get some fresh apple juice, take it to your teacher, whatever you want to do with it. I your apple, your choice. But, uh, obviously, if the apple is in your backyard, then it's your apple, and it would be really weird if anyone was just, like, in your backyard taking things off your tree. That's, that's really weird. But one day, right when the apples started coming in, uh, the subscriber who sent this in to me looks in the backyard and he sees the neighbor who lived like three houses down in the backyard just casually with like a canvas tote bag picking apples off the tree and putting them in the bag. And uh, he had never talked to him before so he didn't want to go out there and confront him and he also didn't want to confront him because the dude's crazy enough to just walk into somebody's backyard and start taking their stuff. It doesn't seem like the type of situation you would really love to go yell at them for. Alone, alone, you know, obviously get out of my backyard, but like he was to get his dad, woes goes, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to talk here. So he goes and gets his dad and he's like, the neighbor is in the backyard right now stealing our apples. And the dad looks out into the backyard and sure enough, the guy is leisurely just taking his time. He was looking at them and if he didn't like them, like he's not taking them. It's not even like he just came over and said, look, I'm going to pick the ones that fell onto the floor. No, he's just trying to take the best apples. So the dad opens the window where they're looking out of and says, hey, you can't take those. Get out of here. And I don't know if the guy has headphones in or what, but he's like either pretending not to hear them, which is probably what's going on, or he can't hear them. So the dad yells louder like, hey, stop it. And this time the guy turns around and looks at them and then just turns back around and goes right back to it. And so now the dad's starting to get pissed. And so he's like, I'm going to count to 10. And if you're not leaving my backyard, I'm coming out there. And he starts counting down, which is such a dad thing to do. Like, okay, Mr. Man, I'm going to count to 10. And the guy's just still out there leisurely taking the apples. And so the dad gets to 10 and he goes into the backyard and he picks up the hose that they have. And it just so happens to have like one of those nozzles on it, not a pressure washer nozzle, but one where like the water definitely doesn't feel good full blast. And he cranks the hose and he just starts spraying the dude that's stealing the uh, apples off of his tree. Cause that's what you do if someone's trying to steal your apples and you've told them to leave, leave, leave. And they're like, no, get out of my backyard. And the guy turns around and starts freaking out and is like, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Why would you do that? And he's like, why are you in my backyard taking my fruit? And he's like, dude, you can't own fruit trees. That's illegal. If you own a fruit tree, then it's community property. And the guy looks at him and is like, are you an idiot? What? 
And he says, yeah, you know, Mother Nature is everyone, so I'm allowed to come into your backyard and take fruit from this tree. It's wrong for you to say that it's yours. And he's like, all right, I don't know what argument you're trying to make or what you're talking about, but that's not how it works. It's just my tree. Even if you are a whole like, oh, dude, if, if the tree bears fruit, it's everyone's, you're still trespassing on private property. You, like, he could get you for that, even if the cops agreed. No, man, nature's everyone. Ones. Well, still, uh, I want him trespassed then. Like, get him out of my yard. And what's really funny is the subscriber even says, like, when they sent it in, that the dad probably would have let him take some apples. It's not like they ever ate all of them. They would give a lot away to their neighbors and stuff, but now he wasn't getting any. Like, they had given apples away before, but if someone just goes into your backyard and starts taking stuff, your kindness is probably on 0%. But the guy's still trying to argue that, like, you can't own a fruit tree. And the dad, after spraying him with the hose, says, well, then we can call the cops and find out what they think about that. And as soon as he says that, the guy's like, no, dude, there's no reason to get the police involved. I'll leave, I'll leave. But you really suck for trying to think that you own nature. And starts going off about something about the Lorax. And I don't know if that dude read the same book or saw the same movie that I did. But the Lorax is about not chopping down all trees and exploiting nature to the point of destruction. I don't think there was any point in the Lorax where he was like, Remember kids, if you break and enter to steal fruit, it's okay. Maybe I missed that part, but I don't think Dr. Seuss's point in the Lorax was like, Okay, you should just go to orchards and steal all the fruit. I, I don't know, man. Like, call me crazy. Someone out there is right now typing a comment about how that guy was right. Nature is everyone's. Yeah, but my house isn't yours and neither is my backyard, so get out. I just could never have imagine having the cojones to do that, dude. Just walk into someone's backyard and start taking things. Imagine if it wasn't fruit. Like, imagine you just walked into somebody's backyard, you start picking up pieces of their lawn furniture and just carrying it back to your house. What is nice, though, is after that, the dad uh, installed a padlock on the gate, so he doesn't know if he ever tried to steal any more apples, but they never saw him in the backyard stealing them. Maybe he went to the gate and was like, dang it, nature is everyone's, but this gate and its lock is belonging to that man. Either way, don't go into people's backyard and just start taking things. I especially love the irony, where they're like, yeah, we would have just let him take some apples, but after you break in and start trying to take apples, it's a completely different story. You could have just knocked on the door, excuse me, sir, I'm a great fan of some Granny Smith apples. May I have some, please? Yeah, sure, go for it. Instead, you just went for the approach of taking it off the tree. And I don't understand why he ignored him for so long either. Like, okay, yeah, dude, he kind of had to spray you with the hose because you're just not listening. He didn't have have to spray him with the hose. Don't get it twisted. That being said, if someone's in your backyard stealing your stuff, spraying them with the hose is the nice thing to do. Like, at that point, he would have been justified to go, like, push the guy out of his yard, I feel. So if all he did was just psh, for a second, then, like, that's not that bad. It's like training a cat, you know? A little squirt bottle. Squirt, squirt. All right, this last one was, like, really nuts to me. So this guy and his family had been uh, driving the same car for a very long time, like, probably 15, 16 years years and uh, the dad had gotten a new job so they decided to get a new car and the deal was his mom had a car too so his dad was getting uh, another car so they were going to have three cars now was that he was going to buy it back from his parents they worked out a deal where he was working a job and he had a payment plan and he was very grateful to his parents for the situation like he obviously realized that he was lucky so the car sat in the driveway and uh, until he could afford it and register it and all that stuff it was just going to sit which was probably going to take him about a month to get all that done so it's sitting there for a month and uh, over that course of time a few of the neighbors had been like oh is that for sale and his parents had explained no da -da 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 -da, the situation but there was one family like six seven houses down that was uh, always known for being a little bit entitled like they were all just kind of cringe and they had a son who was about the same age as this guy and uh, for whatever reason he decided that he deserved the car so he comes over one day and knocks on the door and is like, hey, is that car available? And the dad starts explaining that, no, it's not really available. Like, he's going to give it to his son, but thank you for the interest, da-da-da-da-da. And he goes, well, how much for it? And now the dad is listening, not because his son doesn't deserve the car, but if this guy's going to be insanely entitled and spoiled and be dumb and offer like $10,000 more than the car is worth, then you sell it and everyone wins. So he's like, well, what do you mean? Well, how much is it worth? So he tells him it's probably worth about da 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 da. And the guy goes, oh, okay. So is that why you're not going to sell it? And he goes, well, my son's going to buy it from me. 
And he's like, well, why are you going to give it to your son? And he's kind of confused by that question. Like, what do you mean? Why would the dad give his son first dibs on buying the car? Uh, because it's his son? And he's, like, explaining that to the spoiled kid. And the spoiled kid goes, well, listen, I don't think he really deserves it as much as I do. I think you should give it to me. And the dad's like, you mean sell it to you? And he goes, no, I think that I deserve the car. I've been working really hard in school this year, and I just feel like I should get the car, not your son. And the dad is taken aback, and he goes, I'm not giving the son my car. He's buying it. And he goes, yeah, you should give it to me. And he's saying this with all seriousness in his voice. Like, he's not messing around. He's not pulling his leg or anything. He is saying that instead of selling it to his son and, like, making money on the car or whatever, breaking even, whatever it may be, he should give it to a kid he doesn't know from, like, seven houses down. And obviously the dad's not going for that. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And you would think maybe it was just a desperate Hail Mary attempt for a car and he would go, okay, and walk away. Way. But he starts arguing with this guy's dad, being like, well, why do you think I don't deserve the car? And the dad doesn't really know this dude. It's not like they had ever had conversations or anything. So he looks at him and is like, I don't know that you don't deserve the car. I wouldn't give a car to anyone, but I don't know you. Like, I don't know you. How do you deserve the car? And he starts to answer the question. And it was obviously asked in a way where, like, it was supposed to be a rhetorical question. Don't actually answer. Well, like I said, da 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 I've been working very hard in school this year, blah, 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 blah. My parents just got a promotion. And his dad's like, well, if your parents just got a promotion, then why do you need my car for free? Why can't they get you a car? And he scoffs at this and is like, well, then they couldn't spend money on stuff that they like. Yeah, man, that's kind of how it works. So you just expect this dude to give you a car so that way your parents can spend money on stuff that they like instead of getting you a car. That seems like your problem. And even then, your parents aren't obligated to get you a car. Like saying that an adult in the neighborhood has to give you anything for free is really weird. No, you don't understand. I've worked very hard in school. Well, I'm not your dad, man. Like, what do you want him to do about it? And the dad at this point is getting frustrated and tells him to get off his lawn. He's like, get out of here. You're not getting the car and you need to leave. And the spoiled kid starts threatening to call the cops. He's like, well, I bet if we call the cops, they would see my side of things. And the dad starts laughing at that point because he can't believe that that's the threat he came up with. I'm going to call the cops and tell them that you won't give me your car for free and they're going to be pissed. Yeah, man, they're probably gonna pull up, slap him in cuffs. Oh, my goodness. Can you believe that this guy doesn't want to give a car away to a rude stranger? And so he's laughing and the spoiled kid's like, I'll actually do it. And so the dad tells him to knock himself out and closes the door. And uh, everyone had been sitting in the living room kind of listening to the conversation. So they're all laughing. But then they hear some like noises from outside. And so they go and look out the window and the spoiled kid hadn't called the cops, but he's over by the car just kicking the crap out of the tires which listen i don't know if he was like i'm not gonna cause damage to it i'm just mad or or what but that's the weirdest place to kick a car like you're just gonna kick the tire okay your foot's just going to bounce and it's gonna do absolutely nothing but the dad's pissed off and opens the door and is like hey stop kicking the car get out of here and the spoiled kid just looks at him and says i'm not gonna get out of here until you tell me that this car is mine and the dad says well then i guess we're gonna stand here all day because i'm not giving you the car and he says he's gonna keep Keep kicking it then and so he keeps kicking the tire and now the dad starts walking to the end of the driveway to like get the kid out of the driveway which is their property and the kid is like no i'm not going anywhere mom mom he's just screaming mom and his mom is like several houses down there's no way she's going to hear it so finally after he realizes he's gonna have to leave he leaves and they think that's the end of it they go back inside sit on the couch doing their thing and probably about five minutes later, the doorbell rings and the dad goes and just expecting it to be that kid again, opens the door with a little bit of anger, you know, which I, probably not the best idea. You never know who's knocking on the door. But when he opens it up, he gives it a little bit of a what? Because he just doesn't want to deal with this. And he's there with his mom and he says, oh, I'm sorry. And he thinks that they're here to apologize. He probably went, told his mom. His mom said, you did what? You went and demanded someone gave you a free car. You're an idiot. Why would you do that? That made me look really bad but no apparently his mom had heard about this entire situation and thought oh my poor baby has been so dramatically wronged in life 
No wonder the kid was acting like this, bro, because his mom was on his side, as if her son just deserved a free car. But she starts going off on the dad, saying how dare he not hear out his son's reasoning as to why he deserved the car, and the dad cuts her off and says, I don't care about your reasoning. I'm not giving him a car. It doesn't matter what his reasoning is. And she's like, as a human, you have to hear him out, and he's just arguing with her, saying, I don't have to hear her out, or hear him out, sorry. He doesn't have to hear either of you out really but she starts to say that he had just been working so hard at school and I don't know why both of them are harping on that point so hard as if that just magically makes this all understandable. Little Timmy made the AB honor roll. You're right I have to get out of my car and hand over the keys. He just owns everything now. Like what? Under that logic can you use that to, to steal a house as well? Listen I know this is your mansion you paid the millions for it. However I got really really good grades. It's like Nathan for you. I graduated business school with really good grades, so you just have to give me your billion dollar company. That's not how it works. And the dad literally tells her that nobody cares what grades he got, it doesn't matter. And she gets all mad at him and is like, I care what grades he got. And he just reminds her that that's because she's his mom and she's obligated to care. And she's like, everyone should care about everyone. And so he asks her this question. And you would think after you say something like everyone would care about everyone, you might be smart enough to think about like, okay, if he asks me something that would make me look like an idiot, be careful. And so he asks her, he says, all right, well, would you care if my son got good grades? And she was like, no, why would I care about what your kid got in school? And he's like, exactly. That's why I'm not going to give your kid a free car. Congratulations on getting on the honor roll. That's all you're going to get out of me. And she's like stomping her feet all mad and says something along the lines of how they weren't being very good neighbors in this moment and they could use this as a teaching experience for their kids. And the dad, thinking quick on his feet, goes, you're right, we will turn it into a thinking experience for our kids, a learning experience. I can live with being a bad neighbor if my neighbor is an idiot and just close the door, which is an absolute just like Fortnite take the L dance, man. Oh yeah, this is a teaching moment. Teach your kid to suck less, doors slam just like oh bro that had to have been brutal after that they didn't really bug them too much about the car i think they got the hint that if they did it would just end up in a very similar situation people don't take too kindly to people demanding things for free too often i don't know why people just think that like all right you can steal fruit you can steal a car if the person lives near you if anything you think that would be like even more of a reason not to do this type of stuff is because you're going to have to see and deal with them pretty consistently you live close together Thankfully, in this situation, they lived far enough away where they could just avoid each other, and it really worked out for the most part. But dang, dude, moral of the story, don't think you deserve a car for free from someone that's not your family because you got good grades because they don't care. All right, so the first story that got sent in to me was this guy who was trying to scare all of his friends in school back in the day. So him and his group of friends decided to make up like a horror story about something in the area that had escaped and was going to attack people. And they were going to have one of their friends kind of dress up as this like escaped crazy person, this escaped convict and scare everyone. And so him and this really tight group of friends start planning it. And one of them happened to have a gray jumpsuit. That'll be important later. And he says, perfect, you know, we can take all of our friends out in the woods, do a little bonfire, start telling this story. And when we get to the climax of the story where everyone's going to be freaking out, thinking there's this escaped maniac on the loose. You run through in your gray jumpsuit and everyone will lose it. And they think it's a great idea, so it comes to that Friday night. They all go out in the woods. They're building this bonfire. They get it going. And then one of them suggests the idea to tell a scary story. And the person that sent this in to me is like, oh, I have one. Have you guys heard of that guy that just escaped prison a couple days ago? And they're like, no, what happened? And he starts to tell this story of a guy that had been kidnapping all these people and keeping them in a shipping container in his backyard and the police caught him. And apparently he wasn't sorry at all. Like if anything, he missed locking people in shipping containers and he escaped jail and he always said he was going to avenge being locked up. And, you know, he's telling it a lot more intensely. I don't know the exact story time, but everybody's slowly getting more scared. A couple people are like, dude, come on. Like, this isn't real, bro. Come on. And somebody asks, like, well, what is he wearing? And he says, oh, he's probably wearing the jumpsuit he escaped from the prison in. And when he says that, or says that, sorry, 
he hears rustling behind him and he assumes it's his friend in the gray jumpsuit rushing out to scare everyone. But everyone starts freaking out, even the friends that are in on it, and it's coming from behind him. So he gets scared and he turns around and what he sees sends chills down his spine because it is someone in a jumpsuit, but it's not his friend. It's like a 55 year old man with a terrible hairline in an orange jumpsuit sprinting towards him. And when he gets to the guy telling the story, he like shoulder checks him. You know when you're walking through the hallway and you bump into somebody's shoulders, he does that to him. He knocks him down and then just sprints through the group off through the woods. And everyone's freaking out, especially the people that are in on the story, because that's not a part of the plan. And they're like, what was that? What was that? And as they're trying to figure it out, the guy in the gray jumpsuit runs up to them and is like, did you guys see the guy in the jumpsuit? I have no clue who that was. I have nothing to do with that. And when they see the guy in the gray jumpsuit is scared too, and he has nothing to do with it, they're all freaking out. And the entire group like puts out the bonfire as fast as possible and they start sprinting out of the woods to their car. They just want to get out of there as fast as humanly possible. They have no clue who the guy is in the jumpsuit running through the woods or why he shoulder checked them or anything like that, but they're all shaking, scared. So they get back to the cars and they're driving home and in one car is the group of everyone that was in on the story. And of course, they start pressing the guy in the gray jumpsuit they're like, come on, man, you definitely hired that guy to come scare us. Like, just be honest with us. It was hilarious, but like, come on, just be honest with us. We know you must have hired that guy. And he is as white as a ghost, just pure fear. And he's like, guys, I would tell you if I hired that dude. I have no clue who that is. And to this day, they have never figured out who the old man in the prison jumpsuit was running through the woods, like bumping into people. They looked it up on the internet and like they didn't find any escaped convicts in the area. So it's not like it was a real one, but no one has any clue who it is or why they were there. If anything, that makes it even scarier that there's just potentially some old guy running around the woods in a jumpsuit LARPing as an escaped con. That's a very bizarre thing to get up to on a Friday night. But needless to say, they never went back there and had another bonfire. I would just be on the lookout, okay? I, I would not be vibing in the woods alone if I lived in this area. All right, so this next one a guy sent in to me, and he had just moved into a new house in a new state where he wasn't really familiar with the area. He had, like, done a little bit of research into the house itself. It looked really nice. It looked like it wasn't one of those that they just kind of let fall apart and kept renting. And more importantly, it was a pretty good deal, so he had decided to rent it. He only had to sign, like, a six-month lease. So he gets there, and the rest of the neighborhood isn't as nice as this house, but it doesn't feel like it's a bad neighborhood or anything. There's nothing that gives him the impression that it's sketchy or he should be worried at all. And uh, he goes about moving his stuff in, and he's setting it all up, and for some reason, he just has this weird vibe, almost like he's being watched. And so he goes around the house looking for everything, like just seeing if there's maybe something someone left behind, a camera or something. It's really sending chills down his spine. He just feels like he's being watched, but he can't find anything. So he just goes back to setting everything up. And after the first day of moving in, if you've ever moved before, you know there's like that awkward first day where your bed's kind of set up on the floor. Everything's half set up. Nothing feels comfortable yet. That's kind of where he's at. But he's laying there and he can't sleep. Normally, this dude has the ability to pass out anywhere, new spot or not, but he is just really feeling paranoid, like he's scared almost. And as he's laying there tossing and turning, he's pretty sure he hears the side gate open to the backyard. You know where, like, if you walked up from the street up that side of the house, you could get to that, like, back gate? It almost sounds like someone just opened it and pushed it open. And it was grass up to the gate, and then after that was, like, a bunch of rocks. And he immediately knows that it definitely was the side gate because after the side gate opens, he starts to hear like the crunching of rocks. And it sounds like someone's in his backyard now walking along the back of the house into the backyard. And so that freaks him out. He gets up, he grabs like a baseball bat that he has next to his bed and he runs over to the back door, which is a slider. In the backyard had a light that he had turned off because he just assumed no one was going to be in his backyard in the middle of the night. It's not like that's something you usually prepare for. So he flicks on the light so that way there's light in the backyard and he's listening for the footsteps and the footsteps stop. And this sliding door's there but it has blinds on it so you can't see. 
And so he's just kind of sitting there waiting, listening to see if the person's going to keep coming, what they do. And he hears the footsteps starting to go back towards the gate, like the rocks are crunching away. And so he turns around and he starts running to the front door to try to, like, see who's coming out the side of his house. He doesn't want to really confront them, but he just wants to know, like, is it a group of people? Is it a bunch of people? What's going on? Who's on the side of my house? So he runs to the front door, opens it, and yells, who's there? And looks to, like, the left, which is the side of the house they're on. And all he sees is somebody in, like, a black hoodie with the hood up. So he has no clue what they look like, anything about them. They could have long hair, bro. They could be bald as Mr. Clean. All he sees is just a black hoodie running away as fast as humanly possible into the night. And so he goes back inside and closes the door. It's not like he's going to chase them. Who knows what they're up to? They were obviously willing to, like, go sneaking into his backyard. He doesn't want to chase them and find out what they're up to. And he calls the cops just because he doesn't know what's going on. And they come over and they're like, oh, yeah, we get calls like this all the time in this area. You know, it's not that uncommon. It's not the greatest area. And he's kind of confused because they're acting nonchalant. And he didn't know a ton about the area. But it becomes apparent as to why he got such a good deal on the rent on this place. Because apparently it's so common for people to just be, like, trying to break into your backyard that the people come out there and they're like, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. You live here. So whatever. They leave. They don't really do anything to reassure him or whatever. And he goes back inside and has to try to go to sleep. And he's still there just because he signed the lease. There's not much he can do now. But he's just kind of uh, been a little paranoid ever since. Like, any noise late at night or anything he hears, he just assumes someone's coming into his house. Which has to suck. I'm not saying it's great. But that's literally the worst luck ever. The first night in your new neighborhood, someone tries to break in and then you call the cops and they're like, yeah, it is what it is. Probably do a little bit more research before you sign a lease next time. At least you learned that lesson, but it's only for six months. It would suck way more if you were like, oh, this is such a great deal. I'm going to sign a two-year lease, you know? At least you can leave after a bit. And the person hasn't come back. I don't know. Maybe they knew the person who used to live there, you know? Like, I I don't know the situation. All I know is that uh, it would freak me out if I, like, felt someone on the side of my house, heard them, went to go look. And all I see somebody is in a hoodie just running away into the night, and I don't know who it is. That'd probably freak me out, too. All right, so this next one was a person who didn't believe in ghosts. It's not like they hated the idea. It's not like they, like, ridiculed people who did. They just personally had never had any supernatural experience, so they didn't believe in it. Which I get, I guess, like, that's kind of where I'm at, you know? I've never had a ghost come tap me on the shoulder. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm not challenging them. Please don't come haunt me or anything. I'm just not 100%. But they ended up moving into this really old apartment. And when I say really old, I don't mean from like the 50s, 60s. I'm talking about this building was a few hundred years old. Possibly there'd been like a witch trial out in front of it. That's how old this building was. And when they went in to rent a unit, the owner had told them that like some people had had some supernatural experiences. So if that was something that they were really afraid of, you know, they couldn't get out of the lease for it. Which goes to imply that they have had people come in, rent a unit, and get so freaked out that they try to get out of their contract before. But as I said, this person didn't really believe in them in the first place, so like, they just thought it must have been a quirky little thing that had happened before. They didn't think too much of it. And they still signed for it because they really liked the apartment and they thought it was really cool that the building had all this history to it. And for the first few weeks, they have no weird experiences, but they end up having a friend over from work and they're talking about the building and he mentions that the owner had like talked about how some people have had weird experiences and they couldn't use it to get out of the lease. And their friend starts really making fun of the concept. They're like, oh, what, the ghost is going to come and try to convince you to break your lease? I can't believe people would be that dumb, you know? There's no way that would ever happen. Like, that's so silly. And for whatever reason, when they started doing that, like, chills started going down the person that lived their spine, and uh, they changed the subject pretty quickly. But whatever, their friend's hanging out for a bit, inevitably goes home. And that night, they're laying in bed, and for whatever reason, they're, like, afraid to fall asleep. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling, but every now and then, I'll be like, I don't want to have a bad dream. That sounds dumb, but that's kind of like the feeling that they were having. It was almost like they knew something weird was going to go down. But inevitably, you can only fight sleep for so long, so they go to sleep. And they have a really, really bad, weird dream. Basically, they dream that they're in the perspective of someone else in their apartment. 
and they're kind of like going through their apartment at night and then they walk in and they watched themselves sleep and it was like a dream where they wanted to wake up but they couldn't they were just watching themselves sleep and of course that's insanely freaky imagine knowing you're dreaming but you're not in control of it and you're like watching the perspective of someone watching you so of course they're just kind of sitting there in this dream terrified it was almost like a sleep paralysis type of vibe and the next morning when they like wake up and snap out of it they are freaking out right they're laying in bed not knowing what was going on what any of it was and they finally work up the courage to go out and explore the rest of the house and just be like what happened and when they go out and start looking around they're even more scared because when they go into the kitchen all of the cabinet doors are open all of the drawers are pulled out and it's freezing they go over to the thermostat the thermostat says it's like 75 but there's no way like in the kitchen it literally felt like they needed a parka or something because it was just so frigid in there that really freaks them out and they're starting to get paranoid that there might be a ghost in the house but whatever they put on a brave face they get ready for work and they go to work and they like go to their friend and they say listen i gotta tell you something and they start explaining to them the dream and what happened and how they're really freaked out and their friend's face doesn't look like it's about to make fun of them it looks like their friend is starting to get really scared and the friend cuts them off before they finish and they like say listen i don't want you to tell me anymore because i don't want to think about it anymore but i'm just gonna let you know that i had a very very similar dream like the exact same dream and uh yeah that is absolutely insane to me bro imagine everything is like telling you that there might be ghosts in this apartment nothing's going on your friend comes over makes fun of them that night you have a terrible dream that someone's watching you sleep all your drawers and cabinets are open you go to work and the same person that was making fun of ghosts like oh that's so stupid tells you that they don't want to hear anymore because the dream freaked them out too much and after that they went home and like sat on the couch they didn't know what to do so they just kind of talked out loud and were like hey i'm really sorry for my friend you know if it offended you but i, I don't want any issues like i believe in you we're all good and as weird as it sounds since then they haven't had any more weird dreams or anything there hasn't been any more mornings like with the cabinets opening up and the drawers opening up maybe he just had issue with uh you making fun of him you know he's like listen i'm in this weird in between realm for a bit i don't know how to get out of here the least you could do is be a little bit supportive I can't scare you out of this apartment. All right, so this next one was sent in to me by a guy that was at the park playing basketball. He just like liked to go do that when he needed to clear his head, think a little bit. So he had just decided to go play some basketball and it was later in the day on like a weekday, like 8 p.m. on a Wednesday. And it just so happened that he was the only guy there. And at this particular park, the basketball courts were, were right by the road. And there was a fence to stop the balls from like going out into traffic and being hit by a car or whatever but it was pretty easy for somebody to go around the fence from the road if they wanted and he's alone just shooting the ball and he hears behind him like a car slamming on the brakes you know when the brakes screech the tires squeal it just sounds like a car is slamming on its brakes so hard that it might break itself he hears that noise and that's not something you're used to hearing if you're just like at the park playing basketball so he turns and he sees that there's a car in the middle of the road just stop there and whoever's in it is like looking his direction he can just tell that all three heads are looking at him and he's not sure what's going on but he just gets a weird feeling and out of the car jumps two dudes with ski masks on and they don't say anything they just start sprinting towards him and they start coming around the fence and if you're just at the park minding your own business playing basketball and all of a sudden two dudes with ski masks start running at you you're probably going to do the smart thing and take off running you're not going to sit there and be like hey guys what's up can i help you what's going on are you guys lost do you need directions obviously they're not up to anything good and if they are up to something good then that's a stupid way to go about being uh, up to something good so they start getting close to him and he takes off running and it's evident that they're chasing him because he's running and he leaves his stuff and keeps running away thinking that they were just going to come like steal his stuff but instead of running over to his stuff grabbing it and running back to the car when he looks back over his shoulder they're still chasing them so he thinks that they're there to steal his stuff but it becomes evident that they're not there for the stuff that's there they're there for him so he's sprinting and the two guys in the ski mask are chasing him 
and he's probably running for like a good half mile with them just on his back and he's zigging and zagging through a neighborhood at this point and he finally loses them and he's literally hopped the fence into like some random person's backyard and he's sitting there trying to catch his breath because he's like adrenaline is pumping he felt like he was literally just running for his life and he finally is like, okay, I'm just going to go like get in my car and go home because he had his keys with him. That was the only thing that he did grab when he was running. So he gets back and he like slowly walks back to the park, making sure there's no car waiting or anything. And he gets back to the basketball court and what he sees makes him even more scared about the situation. And it already freaks him out. Imagine being chased for like half a mile by two guys in ski masks. That's an insanely scary thing. But when he gets back to the basketball court, he looks and all of his stuff is still there. It doesn't even look like anyone walked up to it and like rifled through it to see what was going on, if there was anything worth taking. All of his stuff is there. And you might be thinking like, oh, isn't that a good thing, you know, that nothing got taken? And yeah, it's good that nothing got stolen. But then it's like, why were they coming after me? Obviously, you don't ever want to get robbed, but you know, they charge you with a ski mask, you run away, they take your stuff, they get back in the car, they leave. Like that, that makes sense. But if they didn't take anything, then what were they possibly planning for you, you know? Like, that makes him even more scared. So he grabs his stuff as fast as he can, runs to his car, gets in the car, and gets out of there. Doesn't really want to think about why they were chasing him or what was going on, but he has avoided that park ever since, which is probably for the best. I feel like if you have a chance of being kidnapped at the park, you should just avoid that park. Just a general rule of thumb. Those guys were definitely up to no good, though. Like, there's no way they were bringing him a birthday cake, you know? Like, that, that's not what was going on. They weren't trying to give him a, a prize. Sir, sir, you're the 8,000th visitor to this website. We're here to deliver you your iPad. That was definitely not what was going on, and I think he made the right choice by literally sprinting as fast as humanly possible in the other direction. All right, so this last one is more like Final destination esques, but this guy was at the skate park one day, and this skate park happened to be located on a road, but it was built up on a concrete platform. So, you know, in order to have the ramps be above the rest of the skate park, the road came up to the curb, the curb went up to like this dirt, the dirt went up like a foot kind of in a dirt ramp thing, like with grass, and then there was about three feet of concrete. And the three feet of concrete at the top was a small pad where you would use to like drop into the ramp and get to the rest of the skate park. And because that concrete pad was there, there wasn't a fence or anything because the road that was leading up to it was not a road people were supposed to be going fast on. And it was very apparent you weren't supposed to go up there because there's a giant concrete wall. Whatever, the person that sent this to me is standing up on that, like, pad thing, and they hear a car coming. And so they look back, and they see a car coming a little bit too quickly, like, straight at the wall. And it pops up over the curb, keeps going, and smacks into this concrete wall at probably 15 miles per hour. Not enough to decimate the car, it's not like the person would have been very seriously injured, but it's enough to make the car get damaged and set the airbags off. It's definitely not something you want to happen to your car. And so the airbags go off, the windshield breaks, and of course the entire skate park is like, what happened? And they run over there and they start looking for the person to make sure they're okay. And this old man, not like crazy old, not like he shouldn't have been driving old, but retired old, gets out and he's like, it's fine, it's fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he explains that he had just got these new, like, floor mat things off the internet, you know, and they didn't fit right. And so when he pushed the gas pedal down, the floor mat slid and made his gas pedal stick down. And thank goodness it only got up to, like, 15 miles per hour because that could have gotten a lot worse. But they look and sure enough, the gas pedal is, like, stuck, depressed down. And so he calls the, the fire department or, like, the police, 911, whatever, like, the accident management people. And uh, they're kind of waiting there for a bit and they pull up and they start asking everyone what happened and they ask the subscriber where he was standing and he's like right there. And they have a weird look and they're like, dude, you were probably a good like two feet away from being uh, hit by that car. If that concrete little pad wasn't there, that would have ended very badly. And he hadn't really thought about it until that moment, but when they pointed it out to him, he was like, oh yeah, yeah, I definitely came a little bit closer than I ever wanted to to being a uh, sandwich right there.
Hopefully this doesn't activate some like uh, final destination voodoo or anything. So we all know the weather's been changing, at least hopefully you've noticed that. If not, it's probably time for you to go outside, bro. And with the seasons changing, leaves fall off the trees and it makes a little bit of a mess in people's yards. And you gotta pick it up somehow. Like if you live in certain places, there's rules about, oh, there's only a certain amount of leaves you can have in your yard. And if you live in those places, that sucks. But regardless, sometimes you just need to have your leaves cleaned up. And if you don't have time to do it, you've got to pay a company. But the neighborhood that this guy lives in, there's an older guy who, like, just does it for everybody. And he 100% doesn't have to. People tell him he doesn't have to, but he just thinks that it's nice for the neighborhood if he helps pick up leaves. And everyone is super grateful for it because it obviously saves them time and money. And if someone's saving you time and money, you're not going to be angry at them for it. And he does use like a backpack blower just to make it faster because he'll do like two or three houses at a time. And no one really cares about the noise because once again, he's solving a problem that either they would have to do or, or they'd have to pay for. And if you were paying for it, then the guy would come out and use a blower because he's trying to go fast to go to his next job. And then there would just be multiple noisy backpacks going every day. And on top of it, the guy's just being nice. So no one cares. No one says anything about it. And before anyone's like, well, why doesn't he use a rake? Because it takes way longer. And the guy's older. He's not going to use a rake. And this blower is not loud enough to, like, hurt your ears, you know? It's not like there's a cannon going off repeatedly outside your door. It's just yard work. And so at 11 a.m., the person who sent this in to me starts hearing it, which seems like a reasonable time. Obviously, if he started doing this at 5 a.m., that might be a little bit annoying. I could get that. But if someone starts doing yard work at 11 a.m., I feel like that's past the time of the allowed complaining window. Like, that's just a reasonable time to do something outside on the weekend. And he's doing yard work. It's not like he's just playing music as loud as humanly possible for no reason. And so whatever, he knows who it is and what they're doing, so he just kind of like goes back to playing his video game, not really worried about it. But he starts hearing screaming, and it's like a woman screaming, what is that? What is that? And he looks out his window where the noise is, and he sees this Karen that he hasn't seen before, like yelling at the old man with the blower backpack on. And she's pointing at the backpack, and her facial expression and the way she's pointing at the backpack makes it seem like she just found some strange alien device, you know? She, she had just stumbled upon some ancient alien relic that had started outputting this strange odor and she was just so confused by it. And he wants to go see what's up because they're in his yard so it's kind of becoming his business and on top of it he doesn't know why this lady is yelling at the guy who's doing him a favor. Anyways, he gets outside and he opens the door and the first thing that he like really clearly hears is STOP THAT RACKET! Racket? Like what is this, 1811? Are you trying to ask someone to like stop playing with their phonograph? What, what are you asking them to do? I do say, cease this racket immediately! He goes over there though and is like, hey, is everything okay? What's going on? And the Karen turns to him and says, No, he's making so much noise! And it's ridiculous. I don't even know what he's doing. And so he tries to explain that like, well, he's getting our leaves. It's okay. He's supposed to be here. We know it makes noise. And she stomps her foot and goes, it's so early. Keep in mind, it's almost noon. So I wouldn't really call that early. Maybe like some people have a different definition of if 9 a.m. is early or not. But noon is pretty universally not early. And on top of it, it's past the time where he can, like, legally do it. I think there is certain quiet hours, so even if you don't like it, it's okay for him to do it. And so he says that he's not gonna stop, like, he's gonna just keep cleaning up, and it's okay. He's fine. It's okay for him to be here. And she yells that she doesn't like the sound. And his response is to just be like, well, it's my lawn, so I don't really mind if you don't like the sound, because it's not happening in your yard, so it's not your problem. Well, you're just gonna let him be this loud? And the old man is like, no one's letting me do anything. I'm choosing to do this. This guy isn't my boss. It's not like he's paying me. Just leave me alone so I can finish what I'm doing. It's almost like she had forgotten that the old man had a say in it too, you know? Like he just had lost his freedom in her mind, just condemned to constantly be blowing leaves. This was just the only thing he ever did. And she turns to him when he starts speaking up and is like, take the blower off. And he says, no, I'm not going to take the blower off. I'm using it. And it's mine. Like, you can't tell me what to do. 
And she reaches over and starts trying to pull the strap off. And so he steps back and is like, don't touch me because no one wants to be touched by someone, especially if they're aggressively doing it. Like, it's pretty reasonable to say, hey, don't grab me and try to take my possessions off me. And her response to being told to back off is to be like, well, I said take it off right now. Okay, it doesn't matter if you said take it off right now. You're not his boss. Strangers don't have to listen to your orders. It's not necessarily something that you have to do. If a stranger walks up to you and is like, give me your car, you're well within your rights to look at them and go, no, I'm I'm not going to give you my car. It's not like you're his boss or anything. So whatever, the homeowner at that point steps in and is like, I think you should leave. And she, at the point where she's getting kicked out now, goes back to the straps to rip the backpack off, except now she's doing it super aggressively. And so the old man, like, falls over, and she's trying to take it off. And at this point, she's just attacking him. And he's yelling for help, and the guy doesn't know what to do, so he just runs in and grabs his phone and is like, I'm calling the cops. And so he comes back out with his phone, uh, on the phone with the police, and she gets mad at him and is like, why are you calling the cops? And he's just like, are you kidding me? You just attacked an old man for blowing leaves at 1130. Like, what do you mean, why am I calling the cops? You're just attacking this dude. And she starts getting all mad at him, saying he didn't need to do that. They could have just resolved it. And she runs over to her house, gets in her car, and drives away. And he didn't even know where she had lived before. Like, this was their first interaction. So he was really confused when it wasn't, like, his next-door neighbor or something. Because you'd think if you're going to get that mad about the sound, you'd have to live really close. How are you going to get mad about a leaf blower, like, five houses down? Are you kidding me? Like, that's just a very unreasonable thing to think that you have any control over. Ah, the entire block has to remain silent because I don't want there to be noise right now. Regardless, he called the cops and he starts talking to the old man. And the old man's okay, but very shaken up. Like, he was just trying to blow some leaves. Next thing he knows, he's getting shoved to the ground and someone's trying to rip his leaf blower off of his back. And it takes a little bit for the cops to get there, but they get there and they take a statement. And he points to the house and he's like, that's where she was, but she drove away. And as soon as he says that, the officers are like, all right, well, we don't really have time to sit around here and wait all day for her to maybe come home, so we're gonna go. And he was a little bit confused by that because, like, this lady literally attacked an old man. I feel like that's a pretty good reason to wait, but whatever, they left. And so he decided to, like, let the neighborhood know about it just so they could be on the lookout. If he's ever out front blowing leaves in their yards, be on the lookout for someone that's gonna come try to attack him. And the entire neighborhood was incredibly pissed. Like, everybody would yell at her and be like, why did you attack that old man? Not like go to her house and yell at her, but you know, if she was ever like trying to cause an issue for somebody, they'd be like, yeah, aren't you the person that started screaming at the old guy that takes care of our leaves? Because this old man, like I said, was a saint. He's retired and he just volunteers his time to like pick up everyone's leaves so they don't have to hire a landscaping company. Pretty solid dude. No reason to get mad at him. And what's crazy is the entire neighborhood's mad at her. They don't like her. And she just would not apologize for it. Like it literally would have all gone away if she would have just said, you know what? I didn't realize the situation. I'm super sorry. I shouldn't have screamed at the man with the leaf blower. But every time someone would get mad at her, she would be like, well, it's the old man's fault. Yeah, it's the old man's fault that you decided to attack him and throw him to the ground because he had a leaf blower on. And when they would point that out to her, she'd be like, well, he just shouldn't have been too loud. I think everyone's going to lose their temper if something gets too loud. I didn't know that was a fact. I didn't realize that if something gets loud, you're allowed to just start punching people in the face. It's like that scene from the Kingsman movie where, like, they have that thing in their ear that makes him go crazy in that one church. I don't really get how you can blame this on him, but basically ever since that, she's cut back a bunch on her interaction with anyone in the neighborhood, which is probably best for everybody. She doesn't have to hear about how she was wrong for attacking the old man, and they don't have to hear that it's the old man's fault for being attacked because he just shouldn't have been that loud. I don't know. I don't know how you can get mad at someone for collecting leaves for you, but this lady managed to find a way. What's that saying from, like, Jurassic Park, life finds a way? It's the same thing with Karens, you know? How could anyone get mad at this? Karens will find a way. Alright, on screen now is a gift card code. For those of you that don't know, I give one of these away in every single video I post here on the channel as a way to just say thank you to you guys for subscribing and turning on those notifications. So if you haven't already, you definitely should. I post videos like this regularly and I literally give away money. 
And if you are someone that's already subscribed with notifications on, then thank you for being just an absolute incredible person. Some of the smartest, sophisticated people on the planet are subscribed to this channel, actually. So the next story I've got for you guys is hilarious. So this person works at a game store, probably the game store you guys are thinking of that buys used games. There's really only one, and uh, they really love red lights because they love stopping. Either way, there were certain consoles at this store that just were hard to keep in stock. Even years after all this crap, it's still not uncommon for them to sell out of the next-gen consoles. It's not like the workers love having to tell people, no, we don't have any. Like, they don't take any joy in that. It's just the reality of the thing's super in demand, so they don't have a ton. But one guy comes in, and just off-rip, you can tell that he's got the whole, like, I'm better than you attitude. Oh, I've, I've got him so much money, I don't need to be in the store. And he starts demanding a PS5. Like, you guys need to get me a PS5 now, that's the only reason I hear. The only way I'm gonna have a, a good customer experience is if you get me a PS5. And they're listening to this intense speech about how they need to make sure that he has the best customer experience and whatnot. And what's unfortunate is they were out of PS5s. The day before, they had had a few, but people had come in and bought them, so it's not like there's any way for him to just make one magically appear. So he tells the guy before he can continue his rant that, like, they don't have any. And as someone who's shopped at a store before, I feel like we all have, if a worker comes to you and goes, oh, we don't have any of this, yes, there might be a 2% chance they're lying, but at the same time, like, are you gonna sit there and argue with the guy about what does and doesn't exist in the store you don't work out? Well, apparently this guy decided that that was just the most logical approach because he looks at him and says, I know you have one. And the worker is really confused because it's like, yeah, but if I had one, I would sell it to you because it's my, it's my job to sell consoles. Like, clearly I don't have one because we would want to sell it to you. And so he tells him, no, sir, I'm sorry, but we really don't have another PS5. Like, there's no way for me to make one appear. And this old man starts getting angry with him and is like, cut the crap, I know you have some back there, I know it's store policy to keep a few extras in the back, just go back and get one of the secret consoles. And once again, the worker's like, secret consoles, dude, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? You're coming in trying to buy something that's been sold out for years now. It's a lot easier to find them in stock, but it's not easy, and you think that we just have this secret room full of all these consoles that have been highly in demand. We could have sold them for a huge profit, but we've just been hanging on to them secretly. I don't think any game store would do that. I don't think any business in general would do that. If someone told me their business plan was to hide half of their stock in the back and make people think it was out of stock and then sell it all from the back, I'd be like, that's a dumb idea. Why don't you just put it out and sell it normally? I don't know why this company would just decide randomly to hide their most expensive items and only the super secret people that are smart enough to ask get it. Like, I don't think that's how business works. Either way, when he tells the guy, like, yeah, still don't have a PS5, doesn't matter if you think there's a secret room in the back, we don't have one, not much I can do. He starts getting really angry, like face turning red, a little bit of spit coming out when he's talking. I know you have some extra. And it's a pretty dead day, it's not like there's a ton of people in the store, so his manager looks over and sees this guy, like, starting to have uh, the beginning stages of a stroke or something, because he's getting so mad at the fact that they don't have this console. So his manager comes over to just see what's going on, make sure this, like, situation doesn't escalate, as managers do, and he comes over and is like, hey, what's the problem? Your worker refuses to sell me a new console. It's like he wants your business to lose money. I don't know how you function with employees like this. Okay, so now you're just gonna try to get the guy fired too because he can't give you something that they don't have. Like, <laughs> what? And his manager is confused too because it's not like this worker is having a bunch of problems not selling people things. So he asks the guy like, well, what console? He replies PS5. Even the manager is now aware of the situation. So he tries to politely explain to this guy that those are super in demand. We don't have any. I'm so sorry. And his response to the manager saying, we also don't have a PS5, is to be like, you're in on this too. I knew there was a conspiracy for you guys to keep these consoles, but I didn't realize how up the flagpole it went. How up the flagpole it went. If the worker is hiding consoles, wouldn't it make sense the manager is too? And I know they're not hiding consoles, but I love that in his mind. Like the manager of the store is as up the flagpole as it gets. Might as well have just discovered, like, an Illuminati-level conspiracy. That's how he was acting. I cracked the code. Everyone's in on this together. 
Yeah, all the workers got together this morning and they said, there's one guy in particular who we all hate that we're just not going to give a console. Just that guy. Everyone else, you know, we have tons of PS5s. Let's just keep them in the back like a secret and only say no to this guy. So no one really understands what he's trying to imply by saying that there's some conspiracy to not give him the consoles. So he starts trying to nicely explain the manager no one's conspiring against you. There is no secret plan for us to, like, keep all the consoles from you. That's not what's going on. He's not having any of it, though. He's like, I know how this works. You guys are, are going to go above and beyond to convince me there's none here as a sales tactic. And now the worker talks up again, and he's like, what sales tactic? It's not like we really need to do a whole lot of sales pitches to get people to buy stuff when they're in the store looking for a console. And he starts going off about how they're going to pretend that they don't have one once again and then like fake find one right before he leaves so that way he's desperate to buy it. I don't think that the store has to do stuff like that and even if they did, wouldn't that be a dumb idea because now you're just pissed off and angry? In what business class do they teach you the best way to make a sale is to piss off the customer as much as possible? And so they kind of like, once again, for the eighth time now, tell them, we just don't have any consoles. And now they're stopping being nice. The customer service voice is dropping. They're just being like, we don't have any consoles. You got to go. And he starts trying to guilt trip them, saying that he's going to leave the store and they're going to miss out on their commission that they could have made by selling him a console. And that's even funnier to them because now they realize he really just has no clue how this works because they don't make per commission at all. I almost said permission. They don't make commission. It's not like th their store is out here giving them $50 for each next-gen console they sell. Trust me, I feel like if that was the case, they'd be grinding trying to sell them to you. If they were making commission on the consoles, why would they not let you buy one? Like, if anything, they would be trying to push people to buy consoles they don't even need because of the commission. If they got paid per console, they'd be out there grinding, dude. You'd see them on TikTok, like, buy a console now. They'd be doing dance videos trying to go viral, like those corporations that are trying to go viral on TikTok, and it's mad cringe. Anyways, he's getting increasingly angry and he's like, I'm going to give you guys to the count of three to find a next gen console and bring it out here or we're going to have bigger issues. And he starts counting down. And I've never understood why a grown up would do that to another grown up because I'm going to keep it a buck. Like when people snap their fingers at me or start counting, it triggers something in my brain that, that turns me back into like caveman mode where I'm just like, oh, we're, we're fighting now. Not literally. If you snap your fingers at me, I'm not going to fight you. If you count at me, I'm not going to, like, literally fight you. But that that's a pretty disrespectful thing, in my opinion. Like, if you're going to start counting down at another adult, demanding they do something before you get to one, that's just rude. You do that to, like, little kids when they're freaking out. You don't do that to a worker you know nothing about. And obviously, none of these grown men are going to start running all over the place trying to find a console that doesn't exist when he's counting down. And so he gets to the end of the countdown and they're still standing there and he looks at them and goes, where is it? Well, they didn't move the entire time you were counting down. So I'm, I'm going to guess not in their hands. They didn't move. Did you think they did the SpongeBob thing where they were like, want to see me run and grab the console? Want to see me do it again? Clearly, they were not in a rush to go get a console during this countdown and they didn't do it. And they'd retell him, we don't have any. We told you. And he starts screaming. He was already mad before, but now he's just like straight up raging. This is ridiculous. I can't believe that you guys are refusing to sell me one of these. They're not refusing to sell you anything. They just don't have them. You guys are losing my business. I can't believe that you're going to let a paying customer walk out the door. And the manager is like, sir, we have customers here all the time. I'm not going to be spoken to this way. You can leave. Now we're not going to sell you one even if we do have one. And when he hears that, he turns around and they happen to have like this little display set up with all these plush figures, like all the plushies. And he smacks it. So all the plushies go flying everywhere. The like display rack falls to the ground. And he turns back and looks at them angry and is like, that's what you get for not selling me a console. Oh, wow, man, I am shaking in my boots. You took your anger out on a plushy display. Oh, no, I, I am quivering. Like, dude, you picked the least intimidating thing to take your anger out on, even in general. Like, if you start punching stuff in a store to try to intimidate the workers, you're 100% in the wrong. But imagine trying to intimidate somebody by, like, beating up a plushie. So whatever, he leaves and they clean it up and uh, they were just talking about how insane it was. And what was funny is, like, 99.9% .9 of the time working with customers at this guy's job is his favorite part. 
Because usually it's just people that like video games, and he likes video games, and they talk about video games. But every now and then, the, the Karens just decide to pop up, or in this case, a Darren. I would love to know if there's any couples out there that got the Darren-Karen name combo, because you know they're unbeatable when it comes to yelling at managers. All right, and the last story I have for y'all today is just insanely funny, but not long. So the person who sent this in to me was going on a run on Saturday, and he usually just runs in his neighborhood and has absolutely no issues. But he turns the corner, and he sees, like, four grown men in just tank tops standing out in the road. Almost looks like the beginning of King of the Hill, you know, when all the dads are just kind of standing there drinking beer. Like, very much a similar vibe. And he sees them looking like they're talking to him, but he has headphones in. So he takes off his headphone and is like, huh, what? And one of them goes, is that your drone? And he looks up and he sees a drone, probably a good 150 feet up above him. And he's like, no, I'm running. How would he be flying the drone if he has nothing in his hands and is, like, running down the street? Do you think he's controlling it with his mind, you know, Elon Musk Neuralink style? And they start explaining to him that, like, they don't want the drone there and why they don't want the drone there because they feel like it's spying on him. And he's just standing there listening to them like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I, I get why you don't want a drone flying above your house for an extended period of time, but it's not my drone. So I'm really not sure what you would like me to do about it. It was almost like these four had been standing there complaining about it for a while. And so like the first person that walked up that wasn't in their group, they just decided to let them know every concern that they had about this drone. And I get it. It is weird if there's just a drone hovering above your house for an extended period of time. But it's not every stranger that walks by's drone, you know? Like, oh, you without the controller. Is this your drone? And so when he says, yeah, there's certainly a drone there. I don't know what to do about it. They're like, well, what should we do? He's not a drone whisperer. He's not an expert. And he says, I'm not sure. Maybe just like get it out of the sky. And he goes to keep running, but he's confused because a fifth guy magically appears from one of the garages and starts walking over with a bow and arrow. And so he doesn't run away just yet because obviously he's very curious to see what this guy's about to do with the bow and arrow and to see if he's about to go all like Robin Hood on the drone, you know, Legolas, just drone down. And so he walks underneath the drone, pulls out a lighter and lights the arrow on fire, which I mean, plus five cool points, but I'm not really sure if that's the best way to take out a drone. Think about it. I don't think it being on fire, if it hits the drone, does anything bonus, and you're shooting it up into a neighborhood. So if you miss and the flaming arrow comes down on top of somebody's roof and you can't get to it, are you going to go to jail for arson? I just feel like the flaming arrow might not be worth it, but whatever, he does it. And uh, he pulls it back, fires the arrow. And you would think that there's no way this guy's got the accuracy to hit the drone. But somehow, instead of using his luck to win the lottery, he used it all on this moment. Because the flaming arrow smacks into the drone. The drone starts spiraling down with the flames coming off of it. And everyone is like, yeah, they start cheering. The runner's just kind of standing there. Could you imagine the guy who was flying the drone? He's just like, oh, I'm trying to get some uh, B-roll shots of this neighborhood I'm making a documentary on. Next thing you see is just like a flaming ball coming towards you and then your drone turns off. Did I just get shot with a fire arrow? Like, that's what he's thinking. Either way, the drone hits the ground and... Uh, He's looking at it, and it's on fire, and he looks back up, and all five of the guys had vanished. It was like they wanted nothing to do with this. They just all went inside, like, okay, when the guy comes to find his drone, the guy with the flaming arrow can't be here. And once he realized that all the men had disappeared, he's like, well, if the drone guy shows up, I'm the only one here, so I'm going to get the blame. So he ran over to the drone and, like, stomped out the fire, which probably was not better for the drone. But it had already been impaled with a fire arrow, so it's not like stomping on it was going to make it any worse. And he ran away, too, because he's like, I'm not getting blamed for this. I had nothing to do with it. Either way, a little bit of a, I, I don't know, like, a little bit of a Karen move. But at the same time, don't hover drones above people's houses. That's weird. I'm not saying you deserve to have it shot with a fire arrow, but weird to spy on people. All right, so this story time was sent in to me by a guy named Marcus. And he had just gotten to college and was renting a room in a house, which is pretty standard. I feel like around every college, there's these houses that, for the most part, like, nine college students are going to live in for a year because it's cheap. 
And usually when I get a roommate story, it involves the roommate being just so dramatically disgusting they might as well slap a TLC logo in the bottom left hand corner and call it Hoarders. But this guy, who was this dude's roommate, he wasn't disgusting, he was just the other type of annoying where he wanted to have too much fun all the time. Like always throwing a party from the moment Marcus walked in. And we're not talking about a little party either. This guy, basically seven days a week, wanted to have enough people over that the cops would come over and shut them down because it was a noise complaint, you know, literally seven days a week there wasn't a day he wasn't trying to throw a party. Not even like he wanted to and then people stopped showing up. That's what was really crazy at first is this guy was throwing parties every day for, for the first like two weeks of school. And somehow every night like 50, 60 people would show up at their house. And Marcus got tired of this after a while because he's not a giant party animal. Even if you are a party animal, having a party at your house just makes it way more exhausting because you have to clean up the mess and you have to just deal with people while you're trying to do your homework. And after two Two weeks everyone's really annoyed because imagine you get off like your your last class of the day right it's a little bit later you go home you just want to go upstairs watch Netflix do some homework go to bed you show up at your house and you just see like 50 cars worth of people inside your home it got a little bit exhausting especially for the guys that work jobs after school too like all right you're at school all day you go to work you come home and someone puked in your bed like just not a very good vibe because college parties aren't very very calm and mature, especially if it's a bunch of people showing up at a stranger's house. They don't care about your house. They don't know you. They're gonna puke in your bed sheets, dog. I don't know who, but somebody will. If there's a hundred people at a party, someone is doing something to your house that you're not going to enjoy. And what made it even worse is it was not a big house. It was one of those smaller homes in like an older neighborhood near this college. So even if you're trying to do homework in a house this small with 50 people, it's basically impossible because the floor is like shaking from the amount of music being played. And just imagine the noise that 50 people make. Even if they're talking quietly, you put 50 people in a small house and get them talking, that noise is going to be able to like drown out a jet engine. And if you tried to just go up to your room and ignore it, people from the party would come up and knock on the door and be like, hey, can we use your room? And you're like, no. And whenever you would tell them no, they would act annoyed with you. And Marcus would always start to argue with them and be like, oh, I'm sorry, is me doing my homework in my house interrupting your party? That's so inconsiderate of me. And at first, Marcus was one of the only roommates that was super annoyed annoyed everybody else was like not thrilled with the situation but they would still partake in the partying from time to time but as more of them got jobs and like the school year just got going on weeks in it got really annoying to always have people over and I'm gonna call the party animal Brad because I just feel like that's a very party animal name and Brad was just hell-bent on the party never ending he would literally do it 24 7 if he could he wasn't at college for the whole college thing he was more there to have a good time his parents basically told him as long long as he had decent attendance they didn't really care about his grades as long as it was passing and he could do whatever he wanted so in his mind he's like sweet I'm just gonna throw parties all the time it doesn't really matter if my roommates are annoyed who cares and so he would like go to class during the day sleep in the class come home party just so he's marked present but Brad did not care about anyone being annoyed there had been a few times they mentioned like do you ever get tired of having people over all the time and he looked at them like they had three heads no why would I get tired of this and at first, you know, the people would get a little bit out of control, but it wasn't that bad. But as the parties went on, the quality of people at the parties started changing a little bit. And I'm not one to be like super crazy. Oh, I don't want to hang out with you because you're just uh, not my type of friend or whatever. Like, that's stupid. I don't get that. But that being said, we all know that there's some people that, like, respect things a little bit more, you know? Maybe if it's a friend that you've known for a while, they're a lot less likely to, like mess with your house versus if it's a stranger that you found on Craigslist there's a much higher chance of them maybe not caring about your house because they don't know you and over time like the people that Brad would be inviting over to party just got more strange and he literally started finding people to party with on Craigslist which is just that's that's how you know you've got a problem bro you're like listen I have to have a party today I don't want to do it alone let me hop on Craigslist real quick lucky you didn't invite a serial killer over on accident Whatever, though, he just starts inviting all these people over, and now, you know, some sketchy individuals are showing up because they're responding to party ads on Craigslist. And there was this one guy in particular 
brother named Dan that he would invite over, and Dan happened to live in a trailer park that was relatively nearby. And nothing wrong with that. I'm sure there's tons of cool people that live in trailer parks. I don't know. I've personally never lived in one. That's just where Dan lived. Except Dan was not one of these cool people that probably live in trailer parks. Dan was exactly like the stereotype to a T, which sucks because you, you don't want to meet someone and be like, oh, you're trailer park Dan. But just off meeting Dan, you were like, oh, you're trailer park Dan. He was constantly telling stories about how like he used to go steal his neighbor's car and you know he would take the catalytic converters off of them and sell them and how from time to time he would like get into trouble because he would drink so many monsters that his heart would have heart palpitations just a lot of stuff where you're like Dan all right man I don't know why you're telling me and bragging about robbing your neighbors and stealing things off people's cars but okay and at first everyone kind of thought he was joking about the like stealing stuff from his neighbor's cars thing and like taking catalytic converters. But over time, the more he would come over, he was just like always talking about it. So they kind of realized, oh, he's serious. And so all of the roommates sit Brad down one day and are like, listen, we don't mind that, you know, you're having parties because they realize there's no reason to tell him they cared because he's not going to stop. But the Dan guy, the Dan guy kind of makes us uncomfortable because <laughs> like he's just giving the vibe that we're going to come home to all of our catalytic converters gone off of our cars they would also there had been a few times where like dan would wander off from where everybody in the party was and be like going through their stuff in their room someone had caught him going through their stuff in their room and they're like you know he's bragging about robbing from his neighbors and then i find him going through my stuff uh i've just like it's kind of making me feel uncomfortable and i get that if it's your house you don't want someone you don't know who's bragging about robbing people going through your stuff you just don't want someone you don't know going through your stuff period all right, guys, I'm going to interrupt the video for just one second on screen now as a gift card. For those of you that don't know, I give one of these away in every video as a way to say thank you to you guys for subscribing and turning on those notifications. So if you haven't already, you should do that. If you already do, you're a legend. And uh, while I got your attention, press the like button if you're enjoying the video so far. Thanks. Brad gets all pissed, though, and is like, Dan would never do that. I love Dan. He would never, ever steal from anyone. Well, apparently Brad was kind of half right on that one. He would never steal from anyone at the house. That much was technically true, but uh, all of a sudden, there started to be a lot of reports from this neighborhood about how car parts were going missing. Not just any car part, catalytic converters. And those get stolen a lot. It's not like it's uncommon. But there was a uh, little bit of a red flag thrown up because it was like none, no catalytic converters get stolen. Dan, the guy who says he does it and has experience doing it shows up. All of a the sudden there's a bunch. I'm not saying that Dan 100% did it, but that is a pretty bizarre coincidence. Anyways, it keeps happening, and just by happenstance, like, one day, there's some, some officers walking around that neighborhood, because it was by the college, and they happen to look, like, back behind the house that Brad had, right? And they see this shed, and the door's open, so it's not like they need a warrant or anything to just look in it, and sure enough, there's a bunch of car parts in the shed, so... They go over and look, and it's Brad's shed that he didn't use. He was letting Dan use it, just full of catalytic converters. And so, because it's visible from the road, they, like, walk up. I don't know what the laws are on that. I'm pretty sure the rule is, like, if they can just see it, then there's not much they have to do to, like, get a warrant and come back. So they come and knock on the door, and it just so happens to be Marcus, the guy that sent this in to me, who's there at the time when they come knock. And they're kind of like, hey, what's going on with all that stuff in the shed? That's kind of weird. And he's like, um, I don't know. I don't use the shed, to be honest. I just rent a room here. I have nothing to do with this house. Uh, it's Brad, the guy whose name is on the lease. I, I think his parents own it or something. But I'm just renting a room. So I don't really know a whole lot about the history of the property. Like, I'm not a flip or flop agent. I, I don't know why there's a shed full of car parts in the back. And the cop is like, all right, well, do you know when Brad will be back? And almost like comedic timing, he walks up and tries to walk past them into the house. And obviously, they're like, who's this? And Marcus doesn't say anything, but Brad goes, hey, I'm Brad. And the cops are like, well, can we talk to you for a second? And he's like, ah, sure. So they start talking to him on the porch, 
and Marcus goes up to his room and opens the window because his window was above the porch, which, yes, is eavesdropping, but I can't even blame him, dude. If this conversation was going on outside my window and I 100% could listen, I'm not going to say I wouldn't, all right? So whatever, they start talking to him, and he's listening, and they're like, what's up with all these catalytic converters in the shed? And Brad's excuse is the classic, well, they're not mine. And the cop's like, yeah, but they're in your shed at your house, though. So you kind of have to know where they're coming from or what's going on. And Brad starts trying to deflect. He's like, oh, it's not my house. It's my parents' house. And they're like, well, we can call your parents and ask if they know why all these car parts are in the shed. Or you can just tell us what's up with all these car parts in the shed. And then they start explaining that if he doesn't explain how they got there, it looks really bad that there's all this potentially stolen stuff in his shed behind his house that his name's the lease on. And once again, he's like, well, it's not mine. I don't really know if that excuse is going to fly, though, bro. Like, if they decide for whatever reason to charge you with this, he didn't do it. But if they did, you're going to get in front of the court and be like, oh, by the way, it wasn't mine. It was this one dude's. And they're like, what dude? I'm not going to tell you, but it was another dude's. I don't know. They probably won't believe you. So <laughs> the cops kind of explain that it doesn't matter if he says that it's not his. And he's like, but technically they're not mine. Once again, doesn't change anything. The cop's not like, oh, you didn't call double dibs? Well, in that case, we'll just leave. Keep the stolen stuff. And so they keep pressing him. And finally, he relents. And he's like, all right, my friend Dan has a recycling company. And he keeps those there. And that is probably what Dan told Brad, right? Like he was bragging to everyone else about how he steals catalytic converters. But if you're going to be storing it in his shed, you're not going to watch up to him and go, hey, can I store all this stolen stuff in your shed? Anyways, he's telling the cops the story about Dan, and they stop him and say Dan's last name. And Brad's like, yeah, that guy. And the cops are like, yeah, well, he's literally been arrested multiple times for stealing catalytic converters. So we're going to assume these are stolen. Can we go take a closer look? And Brad realizes now he's in super deep crap. And he's like, yeah, OK, um, sure, you can go look. Putting two and two together that Dan's just been using that shed to store all the stuff he's been stealing from the neighborhood. So they go look and Brad calls his parents before the cops can. So that way he can make up a story about what happened. And Marcus is upstairs listening. And I don't think Brad realized that like he could hear the phone call conversation. And he starts saying that. His roommates had forced him to start hanging out with Dan. He wanted nothing to do with the guy. He knew he was a sketchy character, but, you know, sometimes his roommates would just really peer pressure him, and he's embarrassed that he got peer pressured, but he wanted nothing to do with this, and his parents should just forgive him. Keep in mind, that's just not what happened. His roommates had sat him down and been like, yo, dude, something's off about that guy. We don't know what it is, but it's definitely something. And he said, take a long walk off a short pier. Dan is the best. But of course, they're going to believe Brad's story because it's their kid. They're clearly, like, delusional enough to think buying their kid a house was a good idea. Letting him live in it is a good idea. So the second he's like, oh no, I didn't mean to get in contact with Dan, the big scary catalytic converter man. Uh, they're like, oh, my, my poor son Brad. My, my poor son Brad. But whatever, that night they decide they're going to have a house meeting and everyone who wasn't there is like, dude, we told you that Dan was bad news. Like, man, if only you would have listened to us, all this could have been avoided. He was stealing stuff from the neighborhood. There's my stuff missing from my room. Like one of them had found some of the stuff that had gone missing from their room in the shed, which bro, Dan, come on. That's just ice cold. You're going to steal from them and then keep it in their backyard. Like stealing is already ice cold enough, but to steal something and then store it in his backyard under his nose is just some next level damage. But of course, Brad is like, I know, who could have ever seen this coming? Like, Dan was such a good guy. Uh, literally everybody. Everybody saw it coming and warned you, except for you. Dan was probably the only person who didn't see it coming, like you being smart enough to figure it out. I think Ray Charles himself probably saw it coming. That's how obvious it would have been. And then whatever, the next part is really nuts. He admits that he told his parents that it was all their fault, like his roommate's fault. And they're not thrilled about that. They're like, dude, why would you tell your parents that we had something to do with this? We had nothing to do with you becoming friends with Dan, hanging out with Dan, Dan stealing anything. Like none of this had anything to do with us. And he's like, yeah, well, they would have cut me off 
often evicted me if I said that I had done it because this is my third strike. Third strike, bro. What were the other two? You just have like a, a catalytic converter stealing empire or something? Paul Walker himself doing like a stolen car ring a la Fast and Furious? Like what in the world are your other two strikes that you have where if you told your parents about this one, they would have been like, again, Brad? Again? So whatever. They're just kind of like, all right, well, it is what it is. That's what you told your parents. As long as we're not in trouble or anything, it's okay. Like the cops aren't mad at us. And he pulls out these envelopes and hands them to the roommates and they open them and the guy to Marcus's left reacts before he can even read it. And he's like, you're evicting us? What? Yeah, I guess Brad's parents had decided that they needed to be evicted, which from their perspective where they think these guys are like inviting people over, storing stuff that's stolen in the backyard, makes sense. But they're more mad at Brad because Brad had really sold them out and then his parents were like, we're gonna evict them. And instead of trying to stand up for them, no, they had nothing to do with this, just yeah, all right, I'll give him the letters tonight at the house meeting. He literally sold them out for like a, a basically nothing to his parents and blamed them and then evicted them on like one day notice. So whatever, they're getting evicted and they're not fighting it or anything just because they don't want to live here anymore in the first place. If anything, Marcus was really relieved. He's like, great, I don't have to live in this party house anymore. So all of the uh, roommates that are like good influences, they get kicked out. And there was no way they were going to get out because they had been in a year lease. So it was kind of like a blessing in this sky situation. And Brad, after that, wanting more roommates to make the house cheaper, make it more affordable, like paying for a house by yourself, stinky. Renting out all the rooms and having it paid for, not stinky. Regardless, Brad and his infinite wisdom decided to replace them with Dan. He let Dan move into the house. Even after all the stolen parts were in the shed, all this stuff, he moves Dan in with him. And uh, I, I don't really know who signed off on that or what, if his parents were not smart enough to realize it was the same person he was talking about before. Also, how is Dan just hanging out? Like, did the cops just come, take all those parts and be like, oh, Dan, you little rascal, like tussle his hair a little bit? You silly guy, you just stop stealing those catalytic converters, okay, pal? Obviously, the house, though, became more of a crapshoot. Their partying continued, but now without, like, his other roommates pushing him to go to school, he just stopped going to school, too, which was one of the only rules that his parents actually had, is that, like, you have to go to class. And so it's just like falling apart. The cops are there all the time because someone's always calling because they did something. He's never in school. And finally, finally, the police somehow get in touch with Brad's parents. I don't know if it was because they're like, look, we've been to this house nine times in the last month. Him and Dan are just always up to something and like, we just got to do something about it or what. But as soon as his parents were contacted, they started looking into his attendance records and stuff and they can only guess this. Like, I don't know this for a fact, but the only thing they really cared about was him going to class. He stops going to class, gets in trouble all the time. And one day, Marcus is walking down the street because his house was further down the road and he sees that Brad's house has been completely redone. The siding, everything, it looks like it got remodeled. And right in front is a nice for sale sign. So I bet you his parents were like, dude, what is going on? Probably came to see the house, find it trashed, they had really destroyed it. Like there was windows broken, you know, they had started to take like tarps and just cover a lot of the, the holes in the wall that they had put. It was looking rough and it did not look like that when they moved in. It was small, but it was a nice house. So imagine you're sitting there, your kid's like renting your house from you and you find out that they've been hiding a bunch of stolen car parts in the back and the house is trashed. Oh, and I'm sure they probably realized too that the other roommates were not the problem. They're like, wait, isn't this the Dan guy that all your roommates were forcing you to hang out with? Yeah, 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 but like they're not forcing me to do that anymore. And another group of like college students ended up buying the house or probably one of them did and that guy would throw parties in the house from time to time and it was always really weird whenever they would go because like imagine walking into a house that you've lived in and people have partied in it all the time but you don't know anyone who lives there or owns it now but it is a party and sometimes people would show up and be like hey is this Brad's house and like the new owners would have to be like nope we don't know Brad, but we certainly do not party like him. So sorry, but there's nothing going on tonight. And people would like argue with them. Oh, we know this is Brad's house. It's just not Brad's house anymore. 
What's going on guys? Uh, as you can tell from the title, today's story is gonna be a little bit different. Basically one time I was talking trash on Xbox to this kid I went to school with and his mom showed up and tried to convince my mom to ban video games from my house. You know, just a typical Tuesday. I'm not gonna lie, this story is when I realized that my trash talking abilities low-key had superpowers and I should probably pursue a career in internet trash talking. It ended up working out though. <laughs> Regardless guys, it should be a pretty entertaining video, so uh, as I've said, press the like button and without further ado, Let's get right into it. So uh, back in my eighth grade year of high school I had just really gotten into playing Call of Duty online and at the time I think Black Ops 1 was like the newest Call of Duty. Yes, I'm a little bit old I know that but uh, I really like to play Call of Duty and at the time like I didn't have a bunch of online friends I really just played from people from school like a normal person, you know I hadn't yet uh, forgotten the rule which is don't talk to strangers on the internet I'm surprised I never got kidnapped, to be honest. As a kid, I really deserved it. Like, I was talking to grown men on the internet that I didn't know, telling them where I lived so I could get monitors sent to my house. It really is a miracle I am not, like, dead in the bottom of a ditch somewhere. Regardless, though, I would just play Call of Duty with, like, some of my friends from school, and it was a pretty good time. However, like, this is right when gaming started to become super, super popular, like, in school and everybody started playing video games. I'm old enough to remember when it was weird to admit that you had an Xbox, okay? And I still was a proud gamer back then. But, uh, all of a sudden, everybody and their mom started, like, getting Xboxes and playing Call of Duty. So, like, this tight-knit group of kids that I went to school with that we used to game with suddenly just became, like, everyone and their mom playing Call of Duty together. And, uh, there was one kid in particular that just, for whatever reason, did not like like me. Like, don't get me wrong, I get I can be pretty annoying sometimes. Don't get it twisted, I'm not claiming that I'm perfect by any means. But this kid just really didn't have a reason not to like me. He just didn't like me. To the point where, like, if I would join the Xbox Live Party to play Xbox and he was in there, he would just constantly talk trash about how bad I was and how annoying my voice was and how crappy my mic was. Like, he would just basically try to get me to leave the second I would try to come hang out with my friends. And for the most part, I like to think that I'm a pretty chill dude. I'm not just gonna, like, come out the cut and insult you for no reason. But if every time I'm joining the Xbox Live Party, the first thing out of your mouth is, Ugh, way to go. I guess all of our good games are done for the day. Then, like, dog, you're kind of asking for some beef. I can't help it. But for the most part, I'm pretty sure this kid knew that, like, I was willing to talk trash back because he would basically leave me alone in, like, the Xbox parties. And anyways... One day, I joined the party to play with my friends, and like, in a COD lobby, you could only have six people. And it's me, a couple other kids, a kid named Frank, and then the kid that I don't get along with. So there's three other kids involved. And Frank was like, this super sweet kid who didn't have a lot of friends, he wasn't very popular, but he was super fun to play video games with. And, you know, I, I just, I really liked Frank. He was a good guy, I liked him a lot. That being said, uh, I don't know what was, like, in the kid who I didn't get along with, you know, soup this morning. I don't know if his grandma peed in it or what, but clearly something had been in his cornflakes that uh, affected his behavior. I'm gonna name the douchey kid something horrible that only people who really hate their kid would name him, like Benjamin. Um, so I'm gonna nickname him Benji for the rest of the video, and if you're named Benji, listen, it's not my fault that your parents hate you. And Benjamin starts talking trash almost immediately to Frank. And I was made for trash talking, alright? It really doesn't get under my skin that hard. It's super hard to tilt me while talking trash. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong, video games can make me mad, but trash talking, not so much. Um, but Frank, like I said, is a pretty sensitive kid, so we're just sitting in this party, and I don't know if the kid, like, was trying to look cool or what, but he just starts tearing into Frank as soon as we start playing. Like, we're playing Search and Destroy, and there's a 1v4... Frank kills three people by himself and dies to the last guy. And, you know, Benji just decides to go into the mic and be like, Oh my god, you're so useless. No wonder everyone at school hates you, you garbage Call of Duty player. Which, I mean, listen, everybody talks trash to their friends on the internet sometimes, but, like, we didn't know this kid that well. I would play with Frank more often, and this kid was not around a lot. So it was just out of nowhere and definitely a little too mean to say somebody to, like, you don't know very well. Just imagine, dude, it's your first time, like, playing soccer with some kid, he misses the ball, you just walk up to him. Oh my god, they might as well chop your leg off, you blind monkey. I would rather have Helen Keller as a teammate, you garbage kid. Ah, just kidding, you know we get along. It's like, dog, I, I don't know you, it's kind of whack. So, Frank gets really quiet, and like, I can kind of tell that it bugged him, but... Whatever, you know, we end up winning that game of Search and Destroy, and the entire time, this kid Benji is talking trash to, like, me and Frank exclusively. He's going after me because apparently my skins on my guns are ugly, which, I mean, uh, alright, bro, yeah, you really got me. The developers coded the design wrong, ooh. 
And then he's just going in on Frank. Frank was a little bit of a chunkier kid, and he's saying, like, obviously your thumbs are too greasy with Dorito dust to actually control it right. And, like, low-key, Frank was not playing that bad. And obviously, like I said, he's kind of a sensitive guy. So after the game, Frank is like, yo, I'm not going to play. I'll stay in the party, but you guys can get someone better because clearly, you know, I'm just doing a bad job. And the mean kid, Benji, is like, oh, thank God I don't have to play with this loser, dude. My cool points were going down by the minute. And that finally is the point where Frank has enough. And he's like, guys, I'm going to get off. I feel like crap. I'm sorry. I'll play later. And like, he leaves the party. And I've been trying to be cool all day. I'm trying to avoid the beef. But if you're going to make this kid that like very obviously isn't bad at Call of Duty and is a good person upset and leave because you can't keep your mouth shut, I got a problem. So I message Frank on Xbox and I'm like, look, if you want me to go in on this kid right now, I'll do it. And he's like, yeah, that'd be sick. I'm not going to lie. So uh, before anyone in the comments is like, oh, you just decided to be mean for no reason. Uh, Frank told me to. And everybody knows if someone named Frank tells you to do something, you can't say no. So Frank joins back into the party and I start trash talking. You know, he fails a clutch on Call of Duty. And I'm like, Jesus, you suck, dude. You called Frank Helen Keller, but you're really out here walking around like you drank drain cleaner, you garbage kid. And like, you know. Just talking trash, which is what, what I do, and uh, no one ever really had, like, talked trash back to this kid before because he's flabbergasted. He doesn't know what to say. I always avoided it because I was just trying to, like, keep the Xbox party cool, you know? It's not fun to listen to your friends fighting on Xbox, but he made Frank upset, you know? I was pissed off at this point. I'm not in a good mood, whatever. So I start talking trash, and he starts to get, like, emotional, you know? You know when you start screaming and like your voice is cracking because you're so emotional you're like illogically screaming he is screaming into his microphone about how i'm a loser and i'm never gonna do anything he is so pissed off and all i had to do was say that he failed a clutch at call of duty so like this kid's got anger issues and trust me i get mad at video games but i really didn't say anything that bad and he is just losing his mind screaming into the microphone so Benji is screaming into the microphone and I hear like the anger in his voice so I do what anyone does and after he's done screaming about how much I suck I, <laughs> I get really close to the mic and I go okay and and like that's all I say back to his screaming and that's when he just loses it I, I hear stuff getting thrown he had a connect mic too I don't understand who can talk trash with a connect mic sorry that I can hear your whole goddamn house having prayer on Sunday bro Anyways, we're hearing him slowly destroy his room, and that's when it happens. We hear a sound that nobody likes to hear on Xbox. Uh, it's a mom's voice on the microphone, and she's like, what's going on? And obviously, he's super upset, and he starts saying that uh, I made him upset, and like I was talking trash to him and bullying him on Xbox, and how I, he, I'm ruining his day, and so I'm like, ah, oh, shit. So sure enough, we hear the mom be like, well, you, do you want me to say something? And he doesn't respond, so... Uh, she like walks to the room and it's a connect mic so we can hear all this going on and she's like Which one of you guys was talking trash to my son, you know, and uh It's dead silent in the party because you know, uh, that's <laughs> Nobody wants to snitch and nobody wants to say anything, you know So thankfully my brother in arms stay silent. Nobody snitches right away and that's when she goes Fine, well, if you want me to just take this to the school to handle bullying, then I can write down all your gamer tags and we'll figure this out. And, like, you know, she doesn't say gamer tags because, like, moms don't know how to do that. She says names, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, it was a gamer tag. That's what it was. I can't say it wrong, okay? I'm not a mom. I can't call an Xbox a Nintendo. I just can't. Anyway, she makes, like, Benji pull up the party, and she starts writing down the names. And my gamer tag at the time was pretty embarrassing. I'll just say, like, a variation of it. It was something along the lines of, like, Steelers Kid 1999. It wasn't very good. So she says my name, you know? Uh, and I just happen to be, like, one of the last people in the party. And when she gets to my name, one of the other kids in the party goes, Wait! It's Ryan Agnew. It's Ryan Agnew. There, there, I said it. It's Ryan Agnew. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ryan. Ryan, I didn't mean to. It's Ryan Agnew. I, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't want to snitch, dude, but I can't get in trouble, dude. My parents are going to take away my Xbox if there's any problems. It's Ryan Agnew. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, shit, I just got snitched on. And I don't blame my friends because, you know, when you're young, like eighth grade, and a mom is screaming at you, you're just kind of desperate to get rid of the situation. And getting in trouble is not fun. Losing your Xbox is not fun. I'm not really pressed. I'm just saying I'll go down for the boys, okay? Like, I might not do 20 years in prison, but if I have to have a soccer mom mad at me, I'll take one for the team. 
Anyways, the soccer mom is all pressed, and she's like, Oh, well, Ryan, who do you think you are to be bullying my son? And I, I just stay silent because, like, I'm not playing games. She's like, Well, we'll just see what your parents think when I come tell them. And I'm like, Wow, that's kind of weird that, you know, you, you would come to my parents. I thought you were just going to tell the school. That's I can explain to the dean trash-talking on the internet, you know? I'm, I'm not opposed to doing that, but... I don't know if my boomer parents are really going to understand, but, oh, well, this lady doesn't have my address. I'm not worried. Or so I think. There's no way this lady's going to show up at my house. She doesn't know where I live. She just knows my name. I don't know how this lady does it. But about 20 minutes later of still playing Xbox, there's a knock on my door. And uh, I don't go answer it because I'm a kid at the time. I don't answer the door. What do you want me to do? Oh, you want someone to buy cable? Sorry, I'm 12. But then I hear I get called down, and I go down, and there's, like, a very angry woman standing next to my mom with her hands on her hips. And she's like, are you Ryan? And I'm like, yeah, you know? And my mom looks at me, and she's like, why have you been bullying kids on Xbox? I didn't know that you were talking to people. Do we need to take it away? And I'm like, I wasn't bullying a kid on Xbox, you know? And uh, the angry lady, the carrot, is like, well, then how do you explain my son being upset? Nothing gets him upset. And I look at the lady, and at this point, I've just had enough. And uh, I go, well, your kid's an asshole. So that's why, you know? Nobody likes being around him. And I go off. I go off on her kid in front of the mom because I don't care. What is? What are you going to do? You're at my house? Oh, you were mean to my son on Xbox. Yeah, and I'll do it again. Some kids deserve to get made fun of sometimes. I can't help it. Maybe if your son wasn't getting appeased like an angry little German man in 1942, he'd be a better person, but he's not. So every now and then, somebody's got to slap him in his metaphorical face so he realizes that the world doesn't revolve around him. I still firmly believe that, by the way, man. If a kid's a jerk, someone's got to beat him up a little bit. It's just a fact. I know that's unpopular, all right? I know there's comments being written, oh, that's not true. I used to be a jerk, and then I got the crap kicked out of me, and I realized being nice is the move. So sometimes, you just need your ego checked. That's okay. Uh, the mom, though, does not take me calling her son mean names to her face very well and is like, this is why we need to ban violent video games. I can't believe that games like this are teaching our kids how to be violent bullies. And I'm writing a, my state senator about how video games need to be banned because they're corrupting the youth. And she's like trying to get my mom on board to write a letter with her, bruh. And my mom's like agreeing with her. She's like, you're right. I haven't seen the sight of the kids since before they started playing violent video games. And I'm like, whoa, 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 ladies, don't get me wrong. Call of Duty's kind of violent, but Call of Duty didn't teach me how to make fun of people. Not once in the Call of Duty tutorial are they like, yes, and if he has glasses, call him Four Eyes Freddy. Like, that, that just doesn't happen. Violent video games don't make you a bad person. In fact, I think the video games that have made me, like, the worst person, you know, definitely Minecraft. I've done some psychopathic stuff in Minecraft. Anyways, there's a Karen and my mom agreeing that apparently it's my fault that kids are like evil and video games are corrupting the youth and I, I don't I don't understand how this started, okay? I was just making fun of a kid on Xbox and now apparently I've got moms writing letters to senators. I have that power over people. So whatever, like I'm just sitting there and my mom and this mom are like going back and forth about how bad video games are and then my mom looks at me and she's like, you should have been nicer, obviously he comes from a good family and I'm like, you don't even know this kid, dude. Y you're acting like he wasn't just making another kid cry on Xbox 20 minutes before I made him cry. Whatever, dude. Uh, the moms are like just kind of standing there talking about how terrible kids are now. So I'm like, can I go? They say yes. I don't get in very much trouble because I think my mom was like, well, you live and you learn and now we're going to make the world a better place or whatever crap moms believe. I don't know, man. The live, laugh, love. So after a bit, you know, that kid's mom leaves and my mom comes in and she's basically like, well, you and her son get to talk to the school on Monday about being nicer to each other online. And I'm like, what? And uh, my mom proceeds to inform me that she had figured out where we live because her husband is like some whatever at my middle school, some office whatever. The, I don't know, dude. He worked in the office at middle school. I wasn't going to remember this dude's job title. And basically, I wasn't going to get in any trouble at school as long as me and her son gave a presentation to my grade about how we need to be nicer to each other online and how violent video games aren't always a good thing. I don't know why my mom wanted me to lie to everybody, but d what was I supposed to do? So, sure enough, the next day, we get called into, like, this backup auditorium. It wasn't the main gym. It was, like, this theater thing that we had, 
and uh, we go in, you know, and the kid that I don't like, that I beef with all year, is standing there with his mom and his dad, and uh, they, like, see me, and they're basically like, you guys have to be nice and talk about the benefits of making friends online, and, like, you guys should be friends after this and all this stuff. And listen, I'm just saying, I've definitely got the upper hand on this dude. Keep in mind, I'm the reason that this happened. He was a crying little baby who told on his mommy, and his mommy came to my house, so I've got the upper hand, you know? And, like, he just won't make eye contact with me, which, I'm not gonna lie, pretty awkward. You're about to have to give a presentation on why bullying is bad because your mommy went and yelled at the kids on Xbox. That's yikes. Regardless, this presentation starts, and, like, the kid's mom is presenting this stuff that doesn't even make sense. She's like, this kid used to be a good kid, and then he started playing video games and committed armed robbery. It's like, I'm pretty sure there's a couple steps in there that might be missing, you know? Like, uh... I don't know, the fact that he was 8 before he started playing video games and maybe he just grew up to be a criminal? Not really sure how that's video games fault, but whatever. Soccer moms can delude themselves into thinking video games need to get banned because, I don't know, Martin crashed on his Xbox or whatever. After his mom presents about why video games have to be banned, uh, they make me and my friend get up there and, like, do this awkward speech into the microphone about how we used to not like each other, and then we were nice on Xbox, and now we're friends, and they, like, make us hug, but I don't like this kid, so it's a very awkward forced hug, and, like, I just, I'm not a giant hugger of dudes anyways, you know? Like, don't get me wrong, girls are soft, they're, they're easy, you know, they smell good, like, hugging girls is, is nice, but dudes kind of smell bad, and it's weird if you don't know them. Like, I don't know this kid very well, I don't, I don't want to hug him, but... They make us, like, hug each other, and then they send everybody back to class, and, uh, later that day, you know, I, I still made fun of people on Xbox, it didn't change anything, but I'm sure that soccer mom still is telling people all the time how she changed everyone's life with her speech in middle school about how, you know, video games are bad. But, uh, yeah, moral of the story is, uh, if you're a parent out there and your kid is going crazy over video games, you might just be a bad parent, it might not be Xbox's fault, and, uh, yeah, be careful who you talk trash to on the internet because their mom might show up at your house and make you hug your worst enemy in front of your middle school and that's just life. Anyways, guys, this has been an incredibly long video, so uh, sorry about that. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to press the like button. Let me know in the comments section down below what you thought of the video. Subscribe if you're new and turn on those notifications. Today's notification shout out, ladies and gentlemen, goes to... Logan Power, big thank you for having your notifications on. I do really appreciate it, and, uh, yeah, get yourself the merch. Use, uh, code SCRUBBY at the G Fuel checkout, and don't get anyone pregnant. If you do, make sure they're hot. I'll see you guys next time with another video. I'm out. Peace.